Chapter One of Zafloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Zafloya by Charlotte Docker. Chapter One. The historian who would wish his lessons to sink deep into the heart thereby essaying to render mankind virtuous and more happy, must not content himself with simply detailing a series of events. He must ascertain causes and follow progressively their effects. He must draw deductions from incidents as they arise and ever revert to the actuating principle. About the latter end of the fifteenth century, on the birth night of the young victoria de loredani most of the youthful nobility of any rank in venice were assembled at the palazzo of her parents to do honor to the festival the hearts of all appeared in unison with the hilarity of the scene even the lovely and haughty victoria smiled with an unchecked vivacity for no fair venetian had presumed to vie with her either in beauty of person or splendor of decoration another circumstance contributed to elevate her spirits and render her triumph complete leonardo her brother ever haughty and turbulent in his manners had acknowledged that she outshone every female present at this time the marquess de loredani had been married seventeen years to larina de cornari a female of unexampled beauty and of rare and singular endowments if she possessed a foible it arose from vanity from too great a thirst of admiration and confidence in herself at the period of her marriage with the marquis she was scarcely fifteen and he himself not more than twenty it was a marriage contracted without the concurrence without even the knowledge of respective friends resolved on in the delirium of passion, concluded in the madness of youth. Yet, unlike the too frequent result, disgust and repentance did not follow this impetuous union, for chance and circumstances happily combined to render it propitious. Time had not yet perfected the character of Larina. She saw beside her an husband whose ardent love appeared to suffer no diminution no temptations crossed her path it required then no effort to be virtuous and as in revolving years reason approved the choice of a passion at the time undiscriminating she gradually adored as an husband him she had thoughtlessly selected as a lover two children within two years after their marriage had been its only fruits from this circumstance lavish and imprudent was the fondness bestowed by the parents upon their idolized offspring boundless and weak was the indulgence forever shown to them the youthful parents little comprehended the extent of the mischief they were doing to see their wayward children happy their infantine and lovely faces undisfigured by tears or vexation was a pleasure too great to be resigned from the distant reflection of future evil possible to accrue from the indulgence the consequence was that victoria though at the age of fifteen beautiful and accomplished as an angel was proud haughty and self-sufficient of a wild ardent and irrepressible spirit indifferent to reproof careless of censure of an implacable revengeful and cruel nature and bent upon gaining the ascendancy in whatever she engaged the young leonardo who was a year older than his sister having been as much the victim of an injurious fondness as herself possessed with all the bolder shades of her character a warm impassioned soul yielding easily to the seductions of the wild and beautiful accessible of temptation and unable to resist in any shape the first impulses of his heart this disposition though it perhaps might never lead him into vice would prevent him from repelling its inroads with the iron shield of energy he was violent and revengeful yet capable of sacrificing himself to a sentiment of gratitude 
he had a quick impatient sense of honor feelings noble though impetuous and a pride encouraged infinitely by the marquesa of birth and family dignity which sooner than by an act of meanness have disgraced he would have perished thus it could not be denied that in his ill-regulated character were some bright tints such were the children whom early education had tended equally to corrupt and such were the children whom to preserve from future depravity required the most vigilant care aided by such brilliant examples of virtue and decorum as should induce the desire of emulation thus would have been counteracted the evils engendered by the want of steady attention to the propensities of childhood yet with all these causes for reflection and deep regret causes which did not strike the broad beam of conviction upon the eyes of the infatuated parents yet were they happy the whole city of venice contained no pair so happy la rina di loredani still in the meridian of beauty and still adored by an husband though not with the fantastic delirium of a boy yet with an enthusiastic and approved affection the most beneficent the noblest and the best of human beings was the marquis admired by all yet living alone for her whom his boyish heart had worshipped his unsuspicious and generous nature gloried in the attractions of his wife to see her followed and admired yielded to his heart a pleasure exquisite and refined to hers a sentiment less noble because it centred in self-gratification and consideration of self ever debased the heart at this juncture it may not be amiss for a few moments to digress in stating that at the period which commences this history the venetians were a proud strict and fastidious people in no country was the pride of nobility carried to a greater extent their manners also received a deep and gloomy tincture from the nature of their government which in its character was jealous and suspicious dooming sometimes to a public sometimes to a private death on mere surmise or apprehension of design against the state and always by secret trial its most distinguished members this power was exercised by il consiglio de diesi or council of ten by ordering nobles to be hung by the feet between the pillars of st mark or else dispatching them more privately that the order might not suffer in the opinion of the people by plunging their bodies in the orfano or otherwise the venetians were fond of their mistresses and jealous of their wives to a degree uniting the spanish and italian character in its most sublimated state of passion to avenge an injury sustained or supposed to be so to achieve a favorite point to gratify a desire otherwise unobtainable poison or the dagger were constantly resorted to sanguinary and violent by nature climate habit and education the hatred of the venetians once excited became implacable and endured through life having thus briefly reverted to the character of a nation where the principal scenes of the following history are laid we proceed with matter more immediately connected with it it was in the midst of the gay reveling in the palazzo di loredani that a stranger arriving at the gates requested admittance to the marquis on being told that one acquainted with his name desired to see him the marquis ordered immediately that the person should be admitted when the doors of the saloon being thrown open a graceful figure entered respectfully bowing and presented to loredani a letter from the baron wormsberg a german nobleman and most intimate friend of his wherein he requested of the marquis that he would exercise his hospitality in favor of count ardolf the bearer a german likewise of high rank fortune and unblemished character no sooner had the marquis de loredani perused the letter than with conciliating politeness he extended his hand to the count and led him immediately to the upper end of the saloon where larina her daughter and the rest of the company had assembled that the stranger on his entrance might not be disconcerted or pained by fancied observation 
he introduced him first to the marquesa and then to the company in general there was that in the air and striking appearance of the count which created at once a sensation of awe and admiration his figure was noble and commanding and in his features shone a dignity and fascination which while it irresistibly attracted the regards of all flattered and delighted if his could be attracted in return yet once attracted those powerful regards overpowered by their beauty and their brilliancy those on whom they turned such in his personal semblance was count ardolf and as such drew speedily around him a bright circle of which he became the focus every one forgetting in the ease and gracefulness of his manners the recentness of his introduction while his presence diffused around a spirit a vivacity and an interest of which before the assembly had seemed unconscious victoria as the young divinity of the festival was presented to him by her beautiful and scarce less blooming mother the eyes of the count dwelt momentarily upon her charms he complimented her with politeness but not with warmth and turned immediately to the marquesa with an air so expressive of admiration that an insignificant observer might have remarked the difference of his regards at a late hour the company separated and count ardolf was conducted to a splendid apartment in the palazzo of the marquess end of chapter one chapter two of zafloya this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Zafloya by Charlotte Docker. Chapter 2. Before we proceed, some account must be given of Count Ardolf as to the bent of his principles and character, as to his introduction amid the ill-fated family of Loredani may be ascribed the origin of those misfortunes which subsequently overwhelmed them by birth he was german being left early in life from the death of an only surviving parent to his own disposal he quitted his native country and visited france and england in both places instigated at once by inclinations naturally vicious and the contamination of bad example he plunged into such a stream of depravity as rendered him a few years callous to every sentiment of honor and delicacy but the species of crime the dreadful and diabolical triumph which gratified his worthless heart the most was to destroy not the fair fame of an innocent unsullied female not to deceive and abandon a trusting yielding maid no he loved to take higher and more destructive aim his was the savage delight to intercept the happiness of wedded love to wean from an adoring husband the regards of a pure and faithful wife to blast with his baleful breath the happiness of a young and rising family to seduce the best the noblest affections of the heart and to glory and to exult in the wide-spreading havoc he had caused endowed with a form cast in nature's finest mould blessed or rather cursed with abilities to astonish and enslave possessed of every grace and every charm that could render a man the most dangerous or the most perfect of his sex he employed these rare and fascinating qualities as a demon would put on the semblance of an angel to mislead and to betray yet even of perpetual conquest the heart of man will grow weary ardolf as the fury of passion or excitement of vanity became gratified and assuaged sunk into inanity and despising all he had acquired disdaining those females whose blandishments while they had momentarily enchanted his senses had been incapable of touching his heart he quitted paris the hotbed of his vices and profligacy in disgust and hoped by change of scene to give a zest to those feelings which excessive and unlimited gratification had blunted and almost destroyed yet in change of scene 
he had as yet failed of finding what he sought with an anxious and impatient curiosity a woman who should be capable of inspiring his heart with continued sensation for the proud ardolf denied in his mind the possibility of the existence of such a woman he analyzed and investigated with too contemptuous and prejudiced an eye not to find in the sex an infinity of folly weakness and inconsistency thus it was that having triumphed over them he disdained his conquest and disdained himself to have been attracted by them such was the sceptical the cruel the dangerous ardolf at the period of his arrival in venice for which place the baron wormsberg a friend and distant relative of his family seeing him only such as he appeared to be for ardolf had deigned to revisit for a short period his native land gave him to the marquis di loredani an introductory letter little suspecting the depravity of his heart he recommended him in strong terms to the kindness and hospitality of that nobleman building that recommendation upon the strength of an honorable friendship formerly subsisting between them to venice ardolf had only come in search of novelty and amusement to find if possible fresh scope for the gratification of his seductive and destroying talents little expecting however that he should meet with aught to attract or to retain him there we now hasten to the more circumstantial part of our history he had not been long an envious and ungrateful guest in the house of loredani ere he beheld with evil eye the happiness which reigned among them his soul burned to disfigure the beautiful fabric of a family's happiness and to scatter around him misery and devastation but to achieve this on whom did the malignant timid fix his regards not on the young the ardent and self-confident victoria but on her lovely and attractive mother on the wife of his hospitable unsuspecting host of the man who daily and hourly showered down civilities and attentions on him it was his honor and his happiness that he sought to blight it was his offspring whom he sought to destroy and to disgrace it was his wife whom he sought to seduce such was the gratitude of man to man and such still it continues to be but it so happened that susceptible as was larina to admiration and more particularly so from a man of the high accomplishments and endowments of count ardolf she still loved her husband with an undiminished love and considered him as the god of his sex the attention and the admiration she excited were certainly a source of gratification to her but then she excused herself with the belief that it was as much on his account as on her own and hence was a most powerful barrier opposed to the machinations of the wily ardolf but unfortunately opposition and difficulty were what he had long and ardently sought it strung his dangerous energies anew and while he gazed on the glowing charms of the devoted wife and beheld with darkened eye their faithful vassalage to her husband he vowed even in the center of his guilty heart that he would conquer or perish in the attempt he had now been nearly three months under the roof of the marquis when a profound melancholy partly occasioned by a view of happiness he had not yet destroyed and partly by the gradual increase of sensations to which he had till now been a stranger appeared to take entire possession of him whether it was the beautiful and unobtrusive virtues of larina or whether it was that her high and protected situation by enhancing the danger and boldness of his attempt added fuel to his passion cannot be ascertained certain it was women more beautiful than the marquesa had been tempted obtained and forsaken by him it could not therefore all seducing as she was be her person only that enslaved him and for the beauties of mind further than they added glory to the destruction he caused he had little devotion how then happened it that on frequent occasions rushing from her presence in a delirium of rage and passion he discovered and avowed to his proud heart 
the ascendancy she had gained over its hitherto frigid insensibility sometimes in imagination he would reduce her in an instant to the level of these unfortunates he had betrayed and abandoned but even so she was still larina and he felt that over her he could gain no triumph thus in the maddening passion which hourly consumed him did he experience some slight retribution for the misery he had so often caused to others meantime larina on remarking his increasing melancholy had experienced sensations in her bosom which she wished not to investigate she could not help perceiving for so the insidious ardolf had desired that it was a melancholy not independent of herself his stolen yet purposely betrayed ardent glances directed towards her his deep sighs the tumultuousness of his frame if by accident he touched her hand or even any part of her dress all all failed not to be observed by the marquesa and to make its unfortunate impression yet had she never even in thought strayed from her husband for so gradual so unsuspected are the first approaches of a guilty passion to the heart that she would have started on being told she felt more for ardolf than the interest of friendship it was one evening that straying pensively down an avenue in the garden she suddenly encountered him not however accidentally on his side who was forming unconsciously to herself a portion of her thoughts he appeared before her pale haggard and with an expression of wretchedness on his countenance deeper than any he had yet worn involuntarily she stopped and looking with kindness in his face asked in a soothing voice if he were ill an inquiry into the cause of his complaint was all he had anxiously desired but had not yet ventured to expect thrown for once however off his guard no longer master of his violent emotions he threw himself at her feet and acknowledged in hurried accents the passion with which she had filled up his heart confounded bewildered and overcome the trembling larina knew not how to fly yet to remain an instant after an avowal so base would she felt be infamous and participating in its guilt she made an agitated attempt to disengage herself from the count who on his knees grasped wildly between his hands one of hers but in admitting to her thoughts even for an instant any other man than her husband in listening for an instant to an acknowledgment of the passion with which she had inspired him the unhappy larina had advanced one step in the path of vice and to recede required an energy and resolution almost incompatible with the weakness of which she had been already guilty at length inspired with sudden resolution touched as it were by a keen sense of the impropriety of her situation she snatched her hand from the deluding ardolf and flying from his presence sought in the solitude of her chamber vent to her emotions there sunk in shame and absorbed in retrospection she dared not analyze the feelings excited in her bosom a thousand times did she wish that count ardolf had never entered the palazzo loredani but the reigning the only foible of her nature whispered to her the brilliant triumph of captivating such a heart as his whose every smile whose every look seemed a condescension from the superiority of his nature oh self-love dangerous and resistless flatterer thou immolatest at thy shrine more victims than all the artifices of man earnestly did larina desire to be virtuous earnestly did she pray for fortitude to preserve her from the power of temptation but she had not strength to fly from it and in that alone her safety would have consisted her mind became torn with conflicting sentiments her reason her gratitude the secret and powerful ties of early habit taught her to adore her husband but the insidious ardolf daily led her senses wandering and corrupted the purity of her heart in his company she became thoughtful and embarrassed in his absence restless and unhappy 
the cruel Ardolf perceived his advantage and pursued it. Like a keen bloodhound, he hunted the wretched victim of his pursuit, even to the brink of destruction. No friendly hand extended to save her. No guardian angel hovered nigh, and ere she knew the extent of her danger, she was far beyond the reach of preservation. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Zafloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Zafloya by Charlotte Docker. Chapter 3. That it is but too often an ungenerous principle in human nature first most ardently to desire the possession of a certain object, and despise it when obtained, cannot be disowned. In the present instance, however, there was an exception to this principle. A real passion had absorbed, for the first time, the heart of the seducer Ardolf. To have estranged from a husband the honor of his wife, to have gained over her sacred virtue a dreadful ascendancy, did not satisfy him. He resolved to possess her wholly, to blast the doting husband with conviction of his dishonor, to plunge his offspring in eternal ruin and disgrace, and to despoil them of the protection and tender services of a mother. For the achievement of this purpose, he found it necessary to degrade completely, in her own eyes, the miserable and deluded Larina. Then, Profiting by her agony and despair, he represented to her that it was in fact adding to her guilt, in a most flagrant and abominable degree, to remain under the roof of him she conceived herself to have so deeply injured. Was it not adding treachery to dishonor? And was it not, in reality, the crime of deceiving? Under such circumstances, far beyond that of acknowledging her guilt, by an immediate and honorable flight. If the treasure is gone, pursued the sophisticating Ardolf, the casket can but little avail. And could you then, Larina, live a life of deception, deluding your husband in the idea of fondly possessing a treasure that is no longer his? Oh, no, no, cried the wretched wife. Leave me, O oh, cruel Ardolf, fly forever from me. Here will I remain and die, and may the tortures I now endure expiate, in the sight of a merciful God, the most infamous of crimes. But Ardolf, the eloquent friend, whose seductive blandishments had so far destroyed the delicate fabric of connubial happiness, was not to be diverted from the most material part of his task for slight is the perseverance required to achieve that which is already more than half accomplished. He vowed, and he even believed at the moment, that his vow was sincere, that while life endured he would adore her who, for his sake, had forfeited so much. My children, oh my children, deeply sighed the frantic Larina. May those children, exclaimed Ardolf, calling upon outraged heaven to attest the prayer, may those children witness, nay, perpetrate my destruction, should ever my heart become cold towards thee. Let us forbear to dwell on this scene of weakness on the one hand, and depravity on the other. Complete as he could wish was the triumph of the seducer. He bore his victim from the scenes of her past honor and her happiness, he bore her from her home, from the arms of her husband, from the embraces of her children, and far from Venice, the place of her nativity. To paint the horror of Loredani when he discovered the perfidy of those whom his noble heart had cherished and relied on, the wife he had fondly adored, the guest he had received and trusted, would, if expression could do justice to it, be superfluous. He beheld himself at once the wretched, the desolate, and the only guardian of his forsaken children, 
forsaken by her who had given them birth. From the wildness of despair he emerged and strung himself to virtuous resolution, determined, while his heart would hold from breaking, to live for his children, and to supply to them, as far as the love and protection of a father could, the fallen but once virtuous mother they had lost. Thus did the Marquess court to his aid those divine energies of which good minds are ever susceptible. But another trial awaited him still. Scarcely had he acquired fortitude to leave the gloomy solitude of his chamber, ere fresh wounds were inflicted upon his lacerated heart, by the horrid tidings that Leonardo, his son, the pride and heir of his house, had, soon as the flight of his mother became known, rushed from his home, and never since returned. Well did the proud, though agonized father, trace in this action of his boy his noble, tenacious, and impetuous spirit. Well did he trace, exult, and participate in the glorious feelings whose ebullition could not be restrained. And while he deplored the rashness of such conduct, he adored the sentiment that had impelled it. Yet fondly he hoped that the young enthusiast, when the indignant fervor of the moment should have subsided, would return to be pressed in the arms of his widowed parent, and to mingle his tears with his. He entertained the idea that, under the first painful impression of shame and grief, he had perhaps secreted himself at the house of a friend. But when every friend had been questioned, and day after day had elapsed, and still he came not, the expectant, heart-sick, and disappointed father, with bitter reluctance, resigned all hope, and pressing his solitary daughter in his arms, saw concentred in her all that must attach him to existence and preserve him from despair. Victoria, thus the idol, the hope, and only solace of the heartbroken Marquess, was become the deity to which the house looked up. Her word was law throughout, and to dispute the smallest of her wishes would have been deemed amounting to sacrilege. Ever of a bold and towering spirit, haughty, fond of sway, it was with difficulty that her partial mother could occasionally administer a slight reproof. But now, with an unlimited scope for the growth of these dangerous propensities, they bade fair soon to overtop the power of restriction. Vainly did the Marquess hope that time, by maturing her reason and improving her ideas, would correct the wrong bias of her character. For strict education alone can correct the faults in our nature. They will not correct themselves. If improper tendencies are engendered by early neglect, education may still work a reform, for we are in a great measure the creatures of education, rather than of organization. The former can almost always surmount the defects of the latter. Thus, though Victoria in childhood gave proof of what is termed, somewhat injudiciously, a corrupt nature, yet a firm and decided course of education would so far have changed her bent that those propensities, which by neglect became vices, might have been ameliorated into virtues. For example, haughtiness might have been softened into noble pride, cruelty into courage, implacability into firmness. But by being suffered to grow entirely wild, they overrun the fair garden of the mind, and prevented proper principles from taking root. What then must be thought of the unfortunate and guilty mother, who, making light of the sacred charge devolving on her, the welfare of her children, as depending on the just formation of their minds, not only neglects that sacred charge, but seals the flat of their future destruction by setting them in her own conduct an example of moral depravity, depriving them of the world's respect and rendering them thereby indifferent to their own. With saddened eyes the Marquess traced occasionally the progress of his daughter's character, but he endeavored to disguise from himself the suspicion that her heart was evil. 
To add to his unhappiness, the society of Victoria was generally shunned, not in reality on account of the disgrace brought upon her by her mother's conduct, but on account of her own violent and overbearing disposition, which rendered her obnoxious to the young nobility of Venice. The haughty girl, however, attributed the neglect she experienced to the former cause, and as such, conceiving herself deprived of the world's consideration, became daily more indifferent regarding it. Thus do vicious minds lay hold of every excuse for the pursuance of evil. One evening, about a year having elapsed since the departure of Lorena, as she sat in sullen silence by her sorrowing parent, he turned affectionately towards her and said, Wherefore, Victoria, dost thou debar thyself of the amusements befitting thine age and situation, to sit in cheerless solitude with me? Why dost thou not invite to thee thy friends and acquaintances, and visit them in return? Victoria haughtily returned, Because they would neither come to me, nor suffer me to go to them. And why so? eagerly inquired the Marquess. Because my mother has disgraced us, gloomily replied the unfeeling Victoria. Never had the name of his unfortunate wife been uttered by the Marquess since her ignominious flight. Never had he reverted to, or even breathed a reproach upon the baseness of her conduct. The cruel Victoria had roughly touched a string that reverberated to agony. The wretched father struck his forehead, and, springing from his seat, cast a look of anguish on his daughter, and rushed from the apartment. But the recollection she had awakened, the feelings of bitterness she had renewed, rent his bosom with renovated torture. Never, never had the memory of the misguided Larina's ingratitude left his torn mind. In secret he had brooded over his misery. In secret, where no eye could reproach him for his weakness, he had deplored and fondly loved, but never, in the presence of a human being, had he appeared to remember that he had once possessed a wife. Pride preserved him from public regret, but his lacerated heart paid for it when alone. Unable to bear longer in solitude the keenness of those sensations excited by his daughter, he laughed as the cool breezes of night came on, his secluded chamber. He sought by motion to disturb the chain of thought that formed heavy in his mind, and to fly, if possible, from himself. He had wandered about some time when, in an unfrequented part of the city, he beheld a man walking swiftly before him. He was enveloped in a cloak, but the outlines of his figure were such as to send through the frame of the Marquess sensations of tingling horror, followed by a rage so frantic as almost to deprive him of sense. He thought that in the stranger he beheld Ardolf, the machinating villain who had blasted his every hope and happiness. Unknowing what he did, unaware of the violence and rapidity of his own emotions, he dented after the person, and tearing aside his cloak, discovered indeed the wretch he had imagined. "'Draw, monster, devil, and incendiary!' exclaimed the frantic husband, at the same time snatching his stiletto from his bosom. "'I have no sword,' coolly returned the Count. "'But I have, like yourself, a stiletto that shall be at your service.' The Marquess heard no more. He struck, and struck again, with desperate fury at the body of this antagonist. But his aim was rendered unsure, by his thirst for vengeance, by the raging and uncontrolled passions of his soul. The Count, calm and self-collected, parried with hellish dexterity his indiscriminate attempts. But receiving at length the point of his adversary's stiletto in his shoulder, he suffered an impulse of rage to nerve his hand, and, retreating for an instant, then furiously advanced and plunged his dagger to the hilt, in the breast of the unfortunate Loredani. Thus did he become the murderer of the husband, as he had been already the seducer of his wife, and his guilt, at the far of heaven, assumed a dye seven times deeper than before. The instant that the Marquess fell, 
Ardolf hurried from the spot, first taking care to conceal his stiletto and to wrap his cloak closely around him. To seek assistance for the being he had inhumanly sacrificed entered not his ignoble mind. There, then, weltering in his blood, might the Marquess have remained, but for the arrival of some passengers, who, on ascertaining his rank and residence, conveyed him to the Palazzo Loredani. Thither a surgeon, being immediately summoned, dressed his wound, and to the feeble yet earnest inquiries of the Marquess felt compelled to pronounce it mortal. "'Tell me the utmost,' in a firm though low voice, he said, "'that it is possible for me to exist. "'No longer than tomorrow, I fear,' the surgeon slowly replied. "'Tis enough,' said the Marquess. "'Let my daughter be sent to me.' "'My lord, you must not talk,' observed the professional attendant. Loredani looked upon him with an anguished smile. "'If I have so few hours to live,' he said, "'what have I to guard against? "'Let me see my daughter.' "'My lord, your death will be hastened.' The Marquess feebly waved his hand. Victoria was called. She entered the room with slow and trembling steps. She gazed upon the death-marked features of her father with horror and regret. Horror at the situation in which she saw him, and regret at the thought of having given him, a few hours before, a pang so deep. Of this emotion was Victoria susceptible, Therefore, at this moment, her heart was not utterly depraved. She approached the bedside of her father, her naturally stubborn heart now deeply and profoundly affected. The dying Marquess stretched forth his parched and trembling hand. She took it, and pressing it to her bosom, sank upon her knees beside him. "'Oh, my child, my Victoria,' he faintly began, "'I am snatched from thee at a time and season when least thou canst afford to lose me. Yet, ere I die, let me, O oh my love, perform my duty to heaven and to thee. Let me implore thee to suffer my dying counsels to sink deep into thy heart. My Victoria, correct, if thou canst, the errors of thy disposition. Think upon what we are. Think on life, how unsure, how unstable in its possession, Think that, in the midst of buoyant health, elate in youthful pride, surrounded by riches, and every gratification they can procure, that still, even for a moment, we cannot ensure it. Some dreadful, unforeseen event, some accident arises, and puts us off. Let not, therefore, the riches thou wilt in all probability be mistress of, render thee proud or self-confident." Let them not cause thee to forget we are but the creatures of a day, existing we know not how, and reserved for we know not what. Let not the independence of thy fortune render thee unfeeling or inaccessible, nor think that the accidental circumstances of birth and riches render it unnecessary for thee to abide by the strictest rules of virtue. Remember that in proportion to the elevation of thy rank, thy inferiors will look up to thee, and, therefore, it becomes a moral obligation on thee to keep a guard over thy conduct, so that no possible evil may be derived from thy example. For thou wilt be hereafter responsible for whatever vices are imitated from thee, and for whatever contamination thou mayest cause in the society of which thou art a member." Be not deluded with the ignoble idea that it is less incumbent on thee to be virtuous than those below thee, for in proportion as thou hast power and scope for the commission of evil and the gratification of self, so in proportion is thy merit in forbearance and a steady rectitude of conduct. How glorious is it to live with dignity and decorum! Footnote Cicero and footnote to reign in the fiery wilderness of the passions, to place happiness in the highest perfection of which our nature is capable, and to remember that we live to become worthy of a higher state than that which we at present move in. Overcome with pain and weakness, the Marquess suddenly ceased, nor had his counsel been delivered but in a faltering voice, 
broken every now and then from excess of anguish. The exertion which, from a principle of duty, he forced himself to make, struck forcibly to the heart of Victoria. The time was past midnight. A pale lamp emitted its faint rays over the spacious chamber, and shewed the pallid features of her father, of that father whose love for her, even in death, taught him to despise his own agony. The pause he had made was solemn and affecting. The scene impressed her imagination, and his words her mind, while the silence, the gloomy silence that reigned around, was only interrupted by her sobs. The wan hand of the Marquess hung over the bed. Victoria held it to her heart. His dim eyes were fixed upon her with an expression of love and bitter regret. "'Oh, my Victoria, thou wilt be unprotected,' he faintly said, and a deep sigh rose from his heavy heart as dreadful recollections passed through his brain. Suddenly a noise was heard, the door of the apartment flew open, and in rushed, no, it was no delusion, the figure of Larina. "'Heaven, do I behold a right!' feebly cried Loredani, endeavouring to raise himself in his bed. "'Or is death so near that already dim shadows, the semblance of former friends, hover before my eyes? "'Oh, my God! Oh, Loredani, my injured husband! Bless me, I implore! Oh, you cannot! Yet forgive, oh, forgive me, ere you die! Curse me not with your last breath!' So saying, the frantic Lorena threw herself prostrate on the ground by the side of the bed where lay her dying husband, cut off by her guilt and misconduct in the flower of his life. Loredani succeeded for an instant in raising his head upon his hand. A heavenly and celestial expression irradiated his features. He gazed upon the prostrate wretch beside him with the look of a pitying angel. Then, motioning to Victoria, he said, "'Retire, my child, for a moment.' When she was withdrawn, Larina said he, in a low, solemn voice, "'Arise.' She raised herself upon her knees, but covered her face with her hands. Larina said he again, in the voice of a man who, conscious he has not long to live, desires to say nothing idly. "'Larina, look upon me.' There was in his manner which impelled obedience, and the eyes of his guilty wife met his. Larina, it is yet in thy power to repair, in some measure, the evil thou hast done. When I am laid in the grave, seek out, if possible, thy son, that son who fled his home on the discovery of thy perfidy. Seek him, and if it should please heaven that thou shouldst prove successful, retire with him and thy daughter, Victoria, far from Venice, for Venice, methinks, is no longer a place for thee. Endeavor to expiate, by a life of penitence, the great crimes thou hast been guilty of, for dreadfully as thou hast marred the happiness and the honor of thy children, perhaps it is not destroyed. Retire, then, to where thou art unknown, and hereafter in the world they may claim consideration and respect. But, O oh, Larina, tremble, if thou returnest to guilt and infamy. Eternal destruction, then, betides both thee and them. There is no redemption. Never will the impression of this night fade from the mind of Victoria, if thou wilt yet have courage and resolution to abandon thy guilty career, and to instill into her mind, by thy future example, principles of virtue and honor. Lorena, unfortunate and once loved wife, thou wilt make thyself answerable by thy conduct, not only for the life and future actions of thy daughter, but for the fiat which will go forth respecting her, when she renders up her great account. Ponder then well upon the mighty charge that, by appearing before me at this awful moment, that bringest upon thyself, yes, on thy example, then who couldst desert mine innocent and lovely offspring? On thy example wilt the life and conduct of thy daughter now be formed. Oh, spare me, spare me, cried the wretched Larina, in accents of despair. 
I swear. Let my Victoria enter, said the Marquess, gasping for breath. I have, I have not a moment to live. Larina rose and bade Victoria enter. As she approached, Quick, my child, cried Loredani, and embrace thy mother, Larina. Now swear to protect and cherish thy daughter, to preserve her from evil and from the contamination of bad example. I swear, I swear, articulated Larina, in a voice drowned by sobs, and pressed convulsively her daughter to her bosom. Victoria, swear, murmured the Marquess, that thou wilt forget the errors and imitate the future virtues and example of thy mother. I swear, father, in a solemn voice answered Victoria. O oh, God, I thank thee, thank thee, gasped the dying Loredani. Kiss me, my vict my thy hand, Lorena, I forgive thee. O oh, God, my God, I die content. Thus perished in the flower of his days the noble Loredani, the victim of a man's ingratitude and of a woman's depravity. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Zafloya》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Zafloya by Charlotte Docker. Chapter Four. After the fatal rencontre of the ill-starred Marquess with Ardolf, the latter hurried, as has been already observed, from the spot. Having had sufficient time to escape from the scene of action, and being of course completely unsuspected, he reached by by and circuitous ways his own house, which, having had occasion to return to Venice, he had hired for a short time only, at some distance from the populous city, under a feigned name, hoping for the little while he had to remain completely to elude discovery from the injured Loredani. To return, however, when he entered the room where the apostate wife Larina was sitting, she was struck with an appearance of sternness in his countenance and an unusual seriousness of manner. Approaching him and tenderly taking his hand, for deep was the sway the traitor had acquired over her he had betrayed, she asked if aught had occurred to which she might attribute his altered look. Pressing the hand which held his, and looking steadily in her face, he said, Larina, I have this night committed that which my heart condemns, but which the necessity of the case enforced. Say only, before I tell thee all, that thou wilt not hate me for what involuntarily I have done. Hate thee? passionately exclaimed the deluded wife. I could not hate thee, Ardolf, if thou hadst committed murder. Murder, gloomily returned Ardolf. I hope not, Larina, but I have wounded, I fear mortally, thy husband. A piercing shriek was the only answer of the horror-struck Larina. Her avenging crimes flew in her face. They flashed like lightning through her brain. She rushed from the presence of Ardolf and flew, as the resistless impulse of her frantic remorse dictated, to the well-known mansion of her martyred husband. Ardolf, who merely imagined that she had flown from him, impelled by the overflowing anguish of the moment, suspected not, till some hours had elapsed, whither she had gone. When at length, however, he surmised and ascertained the truth, his rage and apprehensions knew no bounds, for the passion with which the wretched Larina had first inspired him, that fatal passion, which in its consequences and progress were the cause of such immediate and such widespreading evils, had not as yet subsided. Opposition to, or difficulty, could only tend, in the breast of such a character as Ardolf, to give it strength and violence. Sooner at this period would he have endured death than her loss, and he determined, therefore, whatever the chance of being suspected, whatever the risk of being discovered, to respect no sanctuary which could detain her from him, nor permit her even to exist independently of himself. 
For this purpose he completely disguised his person, and, wandering near to Palazzo Loredani, now the mausoleum only of its once happy master, resolved that from that spot he would never depart, but with her whom he knew to be enclosed within its walls. It was on the eve of the second day after the death of Loredani, and Lorena, in the bitterness of remorseful anguish, was weeping the consequences of her unhappy conduct, that a letter was put into her hands. Upon opening it, she found it to run as follows. Your present residence is no place for you, having forfeited, by a preference most gratefully recognized, all title to act as the wife of the deceased Loredani. I would recommend it to you to depart from the place where you now are with all possible expedition. The haughty relatives of the Marquess will soon fill the house. You will be considered as the boldest and most infamous of women, and treated with all the ignominy that revenge and illiberality can dictate. Ardolf. Larina, whose mind was still cutely smarting under the wounds inflicted by the last words of her husband, and whose heart was deeply and sensibly impressed with a conviction of her unworthiness, wrote, without hesitation, the following answer. Ardolf, dare my guilty heart admit the horrible acknowledgment that I love you still? You, whom my bewildered reason shows me at once a seducer and a murderer, O oh, wretch that can cherish such sentiments! For what am I reserved? But mark my determination. It is to see you no more. With Victoria, the innocent sufferer for her mother's crimes, it is my intention to quit immediately the roof under which I am. I shall retire for a time into a remote province. Then, when the remembrance of my infamy has ceased, I shall again endeavor to mix with society, not for my own sake, but for the sake of that daughter I have so cruelly wronged. Ask not, therefore, to see me, for the request will be vain. I dare not load with such a weight of guilt my blackened soul. Forever farewell. Having dispatched these few lines by the messenger, who still waited, the wretched, half-repentant Lorena expected, with an agitation and horror of mind she vainly attempted to quell, some further notice from the unworthy Ardolf. Scarcely dared she acknowledge to herself the base, the lurking hope, that he would not so easily resign her. With trembling frame, then, and mind of anarchy, did she compel herself to prepare for a speedy necessary departure from the roof of her husband, where she felt with impunity she must not long remain. An hour, however, had not elapsed since the departure of her letter before the same messenger returned with an answer, an answer which, to the eternal shame of Lorena, be it said, conveyed to her breast a sensation of smothered, unacknowledged delight, equal at least to the irrepressible feelings of shame with which it was accompanied. It ran thus— you would retire from Venice with your daughter. Mark me, Lorena, with me there is no trifling. Leave at midnight your present abode, and bring with you Victoria. On the canal, opposite your window, I shall await you. You must go with me to Monte Bello, the villa which I hired on my arrival here, as a retreat during my necessary stay. The situation is retired and distant from the city." There we may remain free from suspicion, for it is the opinion of every one that the Marquess met his death by the hands of bravos. I have only this to add, where there, if you still continue to desire it, I will myself accompany you to any seclusion you may point out, and leave you there for ever unmolested. Let this, however, be fully understood between us. I swear by everything that is sacred and holy— whether you accede or not to my present proposition, you depart not unaccompanied by me from the city of Venice. Through the world will I pursue you, Lorena, forever cross your path, haunt you eternally, if for a moment you dare hesitate or think to escape. Ardolf. From her variously agitated heart, 
Larina heaved a deep and tremulous sigh. Essaying to believe herself irrecoverably fixed in the resoluteness of virtue, and without daring farther to investigate the real workings of her mind, she wrote as follows. Confident, most cruel, and invincible of mankind. Confident that I shall live and die in the performance of my promise to— I dare not write the name, for my conscious beating heart unnerves my fingers. I accede to your proposition, and trust, since I must, to your honor for the performance of your promise. Thus far being arranged, the weak and misguided Larina again commenced her preparations, but ah, with renewed alacrity, for though undefined perhaps by herself, her sensations were those produced by a conviction of still being loved, and still being seen once more by him whom, of all men, she should have shunned and abhorred. Still, such is the picture, too often, of a guilty human heart. At midnight, Larina, accompanied by Victoria, left the Palazzo Loredani. The determined Ardolf was punctual to his appointment. He received them with a proud seriousness, and, conducting them to a gondola which he had in waiting, they speedily arrived at Monte Bello. It is not necessary to enlarge upon this incidental part of our history. Suffice it that, arrived at his villa, the seductive Ardolf called to his aid all those dangerous and seductive blandishments which already had been the cause of so much guilt and mischief, and successfully, too successfully, he called them. The wretched Larina yielded at first to the delay of a few hours under the roof of the unprincipled betrayer, and well he knew how to improve this short delay. For what man, having once corrupted the heart and principles of the woman he deludes, has ever found it difficult to maintain his victory, if he thought it worth his while? Most literally, indeed, did Ardolf keep his conditional promise that Larina should have free liberty to depart if she still continued to wish it. Unhappy wretch, she wished it not, for, blinded by the fascinations of her lover, she found it impossible to live but in his presence. Gradually and imperceptibly, their intercourse, now doubly criminal, became dearer and more strongly cemented than ever. Yet was the wretched farce of journeying in various directions, and even to considerable distances, under the pretext of discovering some suitable situation for the young Victoria and her deluded mother, steadily persevered in. For did not Ardolf know that change of scene was conducive to the plans he had in view, of restraining from compunctious reflection the mind of Lorena, and by so ordering that in his society she should experience no moment of melancholy, make her view with horror the idea of abandoning him, and secure her entirely to himself. The plans of Ardolf, ever well arranged, rarely failed of success. Infatuated by his seductions, Larina sought, eagerly sought, to evade reflection, and as a wretch writhing with pain flies to the relief of opium, so did Larina, from the pangs of conscience, to the soothing and intoxicating presence of him who destroyed her. For could she ever endure the secret, horrible conviction of her guilt, that she had rushed from the deathbed of her husband, from where his sainted spirit still lingered, to the very arms of his murderer, that she had forfeited her solemn vow, which his soul had tarried to hear sworn? Could she, even with all the aid of sophistry, attempt to seek in her own mind a palliation of this? She had no resource then but in Ardolf. In his eyes she idolatrously beheld an excuse for her crimes, and in his fascinating voice was recorded a temptation she imagined no heart could have resisted. Gradual and terrible are the approaches of vice. The only absolute original imperfection of Larina was vanity and love of admiration. This error, trifling when in a dormant state, but dangerous when improperly called forth, of what a catalogue of dreadful evils 
did it not become the cause. What awful mischiefs had not already ensued? Should not this lesson, then, be conveyed to the mind, that the propensity of our natures to evil should be vigilantly checked, and that the guard which should be constantly kept over the wanderings of the heart should never be suffered to slumber on its past? End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Sefloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa. Sefloya by Charlotte Dacre. Chapter Five. A year had now elapsed since the death of Laura Donny. The melancholy events which had characterized that period had become fainter and fainter in the mind of Lorena. The journeys of inquiry had long since ceased, and on the subject of her departure from the society of Ardolf, the perjured wife no more expatiated. They did not reside in the city of Venice, but still at Montebello, some few miles distant, for the circumstances, still unforgotten, with which their names were connected, would have caused them to be viewed with disdain and indignation by the higher classes of society. They remained, therefore, at their villa, and thither contrived to attract most of the dissolute and many of the thoughtless inhabitants of Venice. For the aggregate of the world will run even into the very dens of profligacy for amusement, as in a few individuals alone is it vested to be the censors of vice." Montebello resounded to the voice of mirth and folly. Reflection appeared to be banished, and those events which should have been engraved in characters of blood upon the hearts of its inmates appeared rapidly sinking into oblivion, or to be remembered only with indifference. It happened that among the gay Venetians who frequented their society was one called Il Conte Barenza. He was a man of peculiar sentiments, an extraordinary character. He came not to Montebello in search of amusement, nor merely from indolence. He came from an investigating spirit to analyze its inhabitants and to discover, if possible, from the result of his own observation, whether the mischief they had caused and the conduct they pursued arose from a selfish depravity of heart or was induced by the force of inevitable circumstances. He came to investigate character, and to increase his knowledge of the human heart. He found, however, or fancied that he found, but little to interest the consideration of the liberal philosopher in the relative situations of Ardolf and Lorena. He concluded in his mind that they had voluntarily rushed into evil, and had possessed the power to have withdrawn themselves in time from the dangerous vortex. He therefore viewed them with contempt and dislike, unmixed with the slightest portion of pity. He beheld wretches who had studied alone their own gratification, wholly unmindful of the mischiefs they might cause in its achievement. Under this impression, he regarded with eyes of no common interest the young Victoria. Pride alone forbade his soliciting her hand, for never yet had Baranza beheld a female whose character he imagined so formed to constitute his happiness. Nay, so ardent in his admiration was the misguided philosopher, misguided in this instance, that had no dishonor in his idea been attached to the unfortunate girl, he would have made her his wife upon speculation, and relied upon the power he believed himself to possess over the human mind for modeling her afterwards so as perfectly to assimilate to his wishes. Her wild and imperious character he would have essayed to render noble, firm, and dignified. Her fierte he would have softened and her boldness checked. Barenza knew not, so unconscious is the heart of man of the springs of his own movements, that it was the graceful, elegant form and the animated countenance of Victoria that led him to form her strongly marked character, the best and most flattering estimate. She was at this period about seventeen. The age of Barenza was five and thirty. 
His person was majestic, and his countenance, though serious, possessed a sweetness of expression that riveted and delighted the eye. But it was not this so much that engaged the attentions and allured the fancy of the young Victoria. No, it was the flattering remark that herself exclusively attracted his regards, regards which the natural haughtiness and apparent coldness of his character rendered peculiarly gratifying to her vain mind. It was for this she sought this society and courted his notice, till Berenza, wound almost to a pitch of enthusiasm, scarcely lived but in the hope of calling her his. Attachments his philosophic mind had none, excepting to a brother some years younger than himself, who was at this time absent from Italy, to divert the melancholy of an almost hopeless passion. His thoughts and wishes, therefore, centered in Victoria with undivided ardor. It may naturally be supposed that the character of Victoria, by nature more prone to evil than to good, and requiring at once the strong curb of wisdom and example to regulate it, had not since the death of her father obtained much opportunity of improvement. She saw exemplified in the conduct of her mother the flagrant violation of a most sacred oath. She saw every principle of delicacy and of virtue apparently contemned, and although the improper bias of her mind led her infinitely to prefer the gay though horrible state of degradation in which she lived to the retirement and seclusion so strongly insisted on by the dying Marchese, yet she had reflection and discrimination enough fully to perceive and condemn the flagitious disregard those dying commands had received. But Victoria was a girl of no common feelings. Her ideas wildly wandered, and to every circumstance and situation she gave rather the vivid coloring of her own heated imagination than that of truth. Barenza had awakened in her breast feelings and passions which had till now remained dormant, mighty, and strong, like the slumbering lion, even in their inactivity. Slight, indeed, was the spur which they required to rouse them. She had ever contemplated the seductive and, in appearance, delightful union of her mother with Ardolf, with such sentiments as were at the time inexplicable to herself. But when Berenza singled her out, when he addressed her in the language of love, she then discovered that her sentiments were those of envy, of an ardent, consuming desire to be situated like that unhappy mother, like her to receive the attentions, listen to the tenderness, and sink beneath the ardent glances of a lover. Such, such were the baleful effects of parental vice upon the mind of a daughter, a mind that required the strongest power of precept and virtuous conduct to correct it. At length, then, with secret exultation, she exclaimed, at length, I, too, have found a lover. I shall now be as happy as my mother, at least if Berenza should love me as Count Ardolf loves her. But it happened that the heart of Berenza had acquired a real passion, while that of Victoria was susceptible only of novel and seducing sensations, of anticipations of future pleasure. Berenza loved. Victoria was only roused and flattered. Upon consideration, but not certainly impartial consideration, the enamored philosopher concluded that it would not be an act of baseness or guilt to withdraw Victoria from her present dangerous and ineligible situation, to acknowledge his passion to her, and induce her, if possible, to abandon the contaminated roof under which she resided. The pride of the Venetian, however, must have been stronger than his love, for it rejected the idea of making her his wife while he determined to leave no means untried to cause her to become his mistress. Pursuant to this idea, he sought the earliest opportunity of obtaining a private interview with Victoria. An opportunity early presented itself, and, having declared to his delighted auditress the ardent love with which she had inspired him, he delicately but frankly proposed to her the plan upon which he had for some time past suffered himself to dwell enraptured. 
the boldly organized mind, the wild and unrestrained sentiments of Victoria, prevented her from being offended at the proposition of Berenza. Had she for an instant conceived that his strict ideas deemed her incapable of being legally his, she must, with all her desire for a lover, have spurned him indignantly from her. But pride here acted as a preservative of pride, and her vanity easily led her to believe that Berenza thought marriage a degrading and unnecessary tie to love like his. Under this impression, she gave him her hand. Berenza seized it with ardor, as earnest of consent, and seating himself at the feet of his mistress, who smiled with high and unusual joy, he entered more fully into his arrangements, and the means by which he proposed she should quit Montebello unsuspected. Victoria listened with lively emotions, pleasure flushed triumphant her animated cheek, and shone in her wild eyes with an almost painful brilliancy. Her heart glowed with the love of enterprise. She felt capable of deeds which, though in their conception, they dilated and seduced her soul. She could neither comprehend nor identify, but she felt inspired for action, and the enthusiasm which burnt in her bosom lighted up every feature with lambent and ethereal fire. Suddenly, in the very midst of her felicitations, while Berenza, still at her feet, was pouring in her intoxicated ears his various plans for their future happiness, in rushed rage and horror depicted in her countenance the half-frantic Lorena. Wretch! she exclaimed, seizing violently the arm of Victoria. Wretch! Is it Thus you recompense my indulgence toward you, the fond, the foolish confidence which your mother has ever placed in you? And you, Signor Berenza, monster of depravity, is it thus you recompense the hospitality of Count Ardolf in seeking to seduce our only happiness, the innocent Victoria? Signora, replied Berenza with a disdainful smile. You are indeed well qualified to arraign those who trample on the rights of hospitality. The eyes of the conscience-struck Lorena sought for an instant the ground. Her countenance became suffused with a guilty flush. Her heart beat with violence, and scarcely could she support her trembling frame. Berenza, with dignified calmness, took the hand of Victoria. I do not, he continued, in a firm, deliberate voice. I do not plead guilty to the charge of attempting to seduce your daughter. I wish, he added in a severe accent, to save her from seduction. Pardon me if I say that under this roof, I conceive it inevitably awaits her. Victoria, cried Lorena, recovering from her agitation, but awed by the manner of Berenza from applying to him. Victoria, I command you to leave the room, Yes, for the first time in my life, I command you never more to hold converse with Il Conte Berenza. Berenza fixed his proud and inquiring eyes upon the countenance of Victoria. Whether she caught a spark of the fire which emanated from them, or thus for the first time asserted the bold and independent sentiments of her bosom, is immaterial. But withdrawing proudly her hand from Berenza, as though she needed not his aid, and advancing a few steps towards her mother, she thus replied, That you never, Signora, commanded me till now is true. That you command me now, when it is too late, is equally so. I determined to quit this roof, which is no protection to me, for that of Il Conte Berenza, which I trust will be. Oh, Victoria, Victoria, art thou mad? exclaimed Lorena, clasping her hands and now beginning to feel the terrible commencement of those retributive pangs so justly ordained as the punishment of those parents who corrupt their children. Art thou mad, my child, or wouldst thou voluntarily plunge me in eternal disgrace? Plunge you in disgrace, contemptuously returned Victoria. Oh, my child, my child, cried the distracted mother, sinking under the overpowering excess of remorseful anguish. Wouldst thou indeed abandon me? 
You abandoned me, my brother and my father, sternly replied the torturing Victoria. Oh, daughter, oh, Victoria, groaned Lorena. This from thee. Mother, eternally hast thou disgraced us, she replied. For me, no one has ever thought me worthy of love but El Conte Berenza. Let me, then, accept his love and be happy. Why, I ask you, should considerations of your happiness sway me in opposition to my own? When you loved Count Ardolf, you know, mother, that you fled with him, regardless of the misery you gave my father. Do you not remember, too? Cease, scorpion, cease, for God's sake, shrieked Lorena in agony. Let me, then, depart with El Conte Barenza. Remember, it is your fault, pursued the pitiless girl, that ever I saw him. Had you but kept the oath, the oath, mother, that you swore at the deathbed of my father. The images conjured up by the forked tongue of a reproaching child were too much even for the guilty Lorena to endure, and in a convulsion of irrepressible anguish she sunk upon the floor. Lorenza, who had at first listened with delight and surprise to the independence of spirit, as he considered it, evinced by the undaunted Victoria, now became visibly shocked at her persevering and remorseless cruelty to a mother whose personal tenderness for her at least merited some little gratitude. Scarcely willing to analyze if his love for her had not already somewhat diminished by the display of a trait so offensive to a delicate and feeling mind as filial ingratitude and unkindness, he approached and raised Lorena from the floor. When she became in a degree recovered, he assisted her with respectful forbearance to her chamber, and whispering to Victoria in a rather serious voice to be tender towards her mother, retired and left them together. But the slight shade of reserve which marked the countenance of Berenza as he waved his hand to Victoria in parting had not failed to make even more than its due impression on her. Her vivid imagination easily led her to trace the occasion of his altered air. She saw that her cruel recriminations of her mother had excited his disgust. Alarmed at the remotest idea of becoming indifferent to him, she instantly determined on regaining his esteem. Approaching her weeping mother, therefore, with a conciliating air, she endeavored to soothe her into composure. But having awakened the remorse of the conscious Lorena, she no sooner beheld in the artful Victoria a disposition to softness than she resolved to take immediate advantage of it to withdraw her, if possible, from the vortex of guilt and libertinism into which she saw her plunging. A keener pang assailed the heart of the mother as she acknowledged in dreadful conviction the fatal effects of her own example. To alleviate, therefore, the tortures of her mind, to save her loaded conscience from its such an addition of guilt, she sought with energy to preserve her daughter. To every persuasion, however, even to every supplication to give up her distracting resolution without reserve, the wild, impassioned Victoria was wholly deaf. The utmost that Lorena could obtain was a reluctant promise to see El Conte Berenza no more for that day. Even this would not have been granted had not the deeply meaning Victoria imagined that by debarring her lover from seeing her for a few hours, he would begin so far to feel the loss of her society as wholly to forget, in his uneasiness, the cause he had for displeasure against her. Lorena, after some hours of more poignant wretchedness than she had almost ever experienced, separated at length for the night from her daughter. She flew instantly to Ardolf and imparted to him this new and unexpected cause, to her, of unhappiness. So keen, indeed, were her compunctious feelings that with bitter tears she vowed she would quit him on the morrow and retire at once, with Victoria, to some seclusion, where experience now convinced her she ought long since to have been. Ardolf listened without interruption. When Lorena paused, he looked at her with tender seriousness and said, that a union like ours, Lorena, 
cemented by ties and by circumstances, which, however they may be considered by the prejudiced and misjudging, nothing should have the power of annulling. But such an union should be either innovated or destroyed by the impudent caprice of a forward girl, admits not of a thought. Listen to what I have to propose, and let Victoria, as she ought, reap the fruits of her audacity. It would be easy for me to forbid Il Conte Berenza to remain here another hour. It would be easy to imprison Victoria in her chamber and prevent them from seeing each other. But we shall have recourse to no compulsory measures, on the contrary, to such only as shall be at once simple, cool, and effective. It is most probable that Il Conte Berenza has never had occasion to correspond with your daughter. He is therefore ignorant of her handwriting. Do you then draw up a few lines, supposed to the following effect? Dear Berenza, Owing to the unhappiness manifested by my mother, I have agreed to deny myself, for a little time, the pleasure of seeing you. I therefore entreat of you to return to Venice, and when the effect produced by present circumstances shall in some degree have worn off, I will gladly write to you to return. Let these, or a few similar lines, be conveyed at once to Berenza, and you will find the effect produced will be an immediate and voluntary absence from hence. The instant he departs for Venice, Victoria shall quit this abode. Without me, do you mean, Ardolf? We will both escort her hence, Lorena, and she shall be too securely lodged, ever more to interrupt our happiness. And now, that an idea strikes me, he hastily added, perceiving that Lorena was on the point of speaking and determined to drown her objections. I have an admirable seclusion for her. In our excursions last year, Lorena, we made at one time a short stay, as you doubtless call to mind, with your cousin, the Signora di Medina. She resides, I think, near Treviso. Nothing can be more retired, more fitted for Victoria than her abode. The Signora di Medina was singularly polite and courteous towards me, smiling as he spoke. Come, come, my Lorena, no objections, but on this matter we will talk further. Meantime, should even Baranza, finding that he is not recalled by his mistress, venture hither, we can receive him with marked coolness. When he no longer perceives the lodestar of his attraction, he will naturally conceive that we have purposely withdrawn her, and having certainly no claim to an explanation, he will speedily and in chagrin desert us. Thus, he added in a gayer tone, shall we be rid of every source of trouble and uneasiness, and thus, my beloved, you perceive there is no immediate necessity for separating the soul from the body. To tear yourself from me, to whom you are more even than soul. No, we must not bend to circumstances. We must make them subservient to us. No human being, nor any consideration on earth, he added, in an emphatic voice, must now, Lorena, separate thee and me. But come, resuming the gaiety of his manner, to business. Lorena mechanically took up a pen, and as Ardolf dictated, traced something similar to what has already been given. The letter finished, it was conveyed to Berenza by a female servant of Lorena's, who was ordered not to wait for any answer. The feelings of Berenza, as he read characters which he never for a moment doubted had been traced by the hand of Victoria, were such as to the line of conduct they instigated him to adopt, highly favorable to the views of Count Ardolf. But Berenza was not displeased by the perusal. Nay, it is uncertain if he had not even a contrary sentiment, for he believed that Victoria's declining to see him for a short time was merely an atonement offered by her for her recent misconduct to an insulted and wounded mother. As such, therefore, he felt with genuine goodness disposed to concede to her idea and believing that his departure might assist to establish that harmony which his presence had interrupted, and which it was absolutely requisite 
to the ultimate achievement of his own wishes should be restored. He determined to lose no time but to quit Montebello at once, for the purpose of being enabled to return to it hereafter with better prospects of success. He experienced, too, something like a sensation of pleasure that Victoria should evince remorse for the pain she had inflicted upon a doting parent, and perceiving, in addition, that a prompt departure would avoid some unpleasant and perhaps very serious explanation with Count Ardolf, he called instantly, under the impression of these ideas, for his servant, and ordered him to get ready for returning to Venice. He had, indeed, a slight inclination to leave a line for Victoria, but upon reflection, thinking it might only tend to irritate Lorena against him, he determined to dispense even with this, and all being very soon prepared for his short journey, with a bright Italian sky sparkling over his head, and the moon to light him on his way, Il Conte Barenza bade adieu to Monte Bello. End of chapter 5《ハプシックス・オブ・ゼフロイア》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa.《ゼフロイア》by Charlotte Dacre。Chapter Six. On the following morning, Lorena entered the bedchamber of her daughter. And after some slight conversation, informed her in a tone of affected surprise of the departure of Berenza. The intelligence, for an instant, gave to the haughty bosom of Victoria a pang of acute mortification. But this emotion was speedily succeeded by one of violent and uncontrolled rage. Looking fiercely at her mother, she said, Il Conte Berenza went not willingly from hence. At whose instigation was he driven to depart? Not at the instigation of any one, Victoria, mildly but falteringly replied Lorena. Victoria withdrew her keen eyes from the countenance of her mother, and in a musing but stern voice said, If Il Count Berenza departed voluntarily, he will rest passive and take no measures to see me. But if he was impelled hence, then he will write to me and inform me of the truth. Thus, even at all events, will the mystery be cleared up. And in the meantime, cruel girl, said Lorena, who had been accurately tutored by Ardolf, and in the meantime, we, to amuse ourselves, will plan an excursion somewhere. From the air of innocence so well assumed by Lorena, the unbending Victoria almost believed it real. She relaxed into a smile, and half soothed, half angry, she suffered her mother to take her hand. When are we to depart, and whither are we to go? She haughtily inquired, We shall depart, if you do not object, my love, almost immediately, mildly returned Lorena, and it is the wish of Count Ardolf that we should first pay a visit to the Signora di Medina at her delightful retreat, Il Bosco, near Treviso. What? To that forbidding, formal old creature? sullenly muttered Victoria. Come, my love, she is a relation, you know. There, however, we need only remain a few days, and afterwards our little tour shall be prescribed by Victoria. Victoria deigned a haughty smile. Her mother tenderly pressed the hand she still held, and rising said, Adieu for the present, my love. Prepare as I am going to do for our departure. Not unpleasing was this request to Victoria, for her wounded pride now again usurping the place of regret and love. Surely, thought she, had Berenza really loved me, he would not so coolly, so suddenly have departed without leaving even a line. No, perhaps he began to imagine that by persevering in the plan he had intended, he might become involved in some embarrassment or inconvenience. Therefore, if even his departure was not voluntary, no doubt he readily embraced the slightest hint to disentangle himself from his engagement with me. Can he then be worthy of regret? And yet, I may wrong him, perhaps. Some combined artifice, some circumstances of which I am not aware. But I will not reflect. Let time, for only time, can convince me. With an unsettled mind and a heart ill at ease, Victoria began to arrange a few things for her departure. 
she was not suffered by the Count or Lorena to remain long in solitude, but nursed too often of dangerous reflection. They entered her chamber together, and in a gay, unembarrassed tone, Ardolf inquired if she was ready. "'I am,' was the laconic answer of Victoria. "'Then so are we,' said he, and took her hand to lead her from the room. With coolness, but without anger, the proud girl withdrew her hand and followed them in silence from the apartment. Ardolf, who resolved that no danger should arise from delay, had caused everything to be prepared. They embarked, therefore, immediately for Treviso, on the terra firma, and Victoria, though she little dreamt it at the time, bade a long adieu to Venice. Every attempt at conversation was for some time baffled by the sullen taciturnity of Victoria, but by degrees, perhaps from a feeling of shame at the idea of being thought to regret a man who, after all, might have voluntarily abandoned her, her sullenness relaxed, and she determined to assume a cheerfulness that she was far from feeling. This change delighted Lorena. So powerfully, indeed, did it affect her misguided heart that she even began to repent the precipitancy of her conduct and to feel some pangs at the idea of immuring in a disgusting solitude a young creature who, but for the mischievous tendency of her own example, might have been rendered to society of value and an ornament. Ardolf read in her eyes the increasing softness of her heart and that her purpose wavered, she even ventured to cast towards him a look expressive of her feelings. But he, whose aim it was to remove every barrier to his continued possession of Lorena, instantly by a stern look of the most unshaken resolution, convinced her every attempt would be vain to alter his purpose. Lorena sighed, for the eyes of Ardolf had told her there was nothing to hope. She sunk into painful thought, and it now became the task of Victoria to rally her mother and to shew vain girl, how far she could conquer her feelings and become mistress of herself. Her every endeavor, however, but added to the compunction of mind experienced by the unhappy Lorena. As they had departed from Venice at a late hour, it was dusk when they reached Treviso and arrived at El Bosco, which was so named from its situation in the midst of a wood. Its gloomy appearance, however, did not depress Victoria, who was by this time absolutely in spirits. The mother's heart was writhed. She knew it was the intention of Ardolf, after her relation should be instructed as to the conduct it was his wish she should pursue towards Victoria, laying infinite stress upon the levity and freedom of her principles, to abandon her solely to the guardianship of this person, with whom even Lorena herself had never been much in the habit of associating. She therefore ardently longed to alter the severe resolution of the unyielding Ardolf, but the effort she knew would be vain. With him she could achieve nothing, when not under the immediate apprehension of losing her. Divested of that, he became stern, unrelenting, and inaccessible, which was indeed his natural character. To have obtained from him a remission of the sentence, she should have begun earlier, before even her departure from Montebello. Now, having gone so far, to suppose he would retract was supposing impossibilities. In vain she anxiously examined his countenance. She saw there nothing but a complacent, cool expression, the result of a settled purpose in the mind. The Signora di Medina welcomed Count Ardolf with all the warmth she could command. Lorena anxiously examined her countenance to see if she could augur aught of kindness or gentleness to reconcile her to her guardianship of her daughter. But in the frigid features of this forbidding female, nothing was discernible but the austere pride of ungracious virtue with an awkward attempt at condescending kindness, which shewed how much it cost her to assume. Acquainted with the unhappy misconduct of Lorena, and likewise that it had lost her her place in society, she, with the arrogated superiority of little minds ever triumphing in the falls of others, contented herself with a solemn curtsey towards her, while on Victoria she scarcely deigned to glance. The Signora di Medina, as has already been observed, was distantly related to Lorena. She was not more repulsive in person than in character. A long yellow visage, small gray eyes, and a stiff, unbending, meager figure constituted the former. 
She was proud, fastidious, and possessed of a mercenary soul. From her youth, alarmed at the idea of conventual seclusion, yet being portionless, as the daughters of the Italian nobility frequently are, she preferred residing an occasional dependent in such noble families as would permit her lengthened visits, where she would act alternately the overseer, the companion, the governess, or the servant. By these and other winding paths, by flattery, peculation, and hypocrisy, she had actually amassed, as the friendless period of age approached, sufficient to make it pass with comfort, though not with affluence, and to recompense herself for the contempt she had in her early life experienced, becoming, as far as she could, the torment and scourge of all who were miserable enough to be subject to her control. No man, even in the best of her days, had ever glanced toward her with an eye of admiration, much less attempted to solicit her in marriage, and for this reason her bitterness against all females who could attract or dare to yield to the regards of the other sex knew no bounds, and they could hope from her no mercy. Such was the Signora di Medina, whose self-interest would not permit her to quarrel with Lorena, because, though she had never much associated with her, she had often proved herself a generous friend towards her. Still, her wretched affectation and rancorous envy would not suffer her to display much warmth. No such reason, however, operated in her conduct to Ardolf. Of him she was desirous to make a friend, and hence her mercenary homage was directed towards him, and she paid him chiefest court. He had not, therefore, entirely jested when he had remarked to Lorena the courtesy of the signora toward him on a former visit. Nothing, however, could excite in him a desire to prolong his stay beyond what was necessary under her roof. He, therefore, presuming upon her uncommon deference towards him, requested an early supper that Victoria might then retire, and he might be enabled to enter at once upon the grand object of their visit." Supper was at length announced, and the unsuspecting Victoria, detesting the very looks of the old signora, which had already succeeded in damping her spirits, requested to be shown her chamber as soon as it was concluded. Beneath her stern and scrutinizing regard, her haughty mind felt a sentiment of impatient disgust, and an oppression never known before to the buoyant carelessness of her disposition. On bidding her mother good night, she felt impelled, from the very uneasiness she experienced, to throw her arms around her neck, with unusual affection, and whispered to her that she hoped they would not long remain under so gloomy and ungenial a roof. Scarcely could the anguished mother reply. Her heart smote her for her deception, and conscience whispered to her truths that brought the blood into her cheeks. She, however, pressed the hand of Victoria, and faltered out good night, while the reflection that it might be, perhaps for the last time, filled her bosom with acute pain, and her eyes with tears. Victoria left the room, almost reproaching herself for having ever pained a heart of such fond sensibility as her mother's. She was scarcely gone, ere the impatient Ardolf, turning towards the Signora di Medina, entered abruptly upon the business he was most desirous of accomplishing. "'Will you, Signora?' he began. "'Allow me to say a few words to you.' The Signora stiffly bowed, endeavoring to smile graciously, but succeeding only in a ghastly distortion of feature. The well-bred Ardolf, however, took it for a smile of acquiescence, and thus proceeded." Your courtesy and politeness to me, Signora, and above all the high opinion I entertain of your character, induce me to place in you a confidence I could not certainly repose in any other female. I am to inform you, then, that the young girl who has just left the apartment I am desirous to commit for a certain period to your care, naturally evilly disposed, of almighty and audacious temper, she has been nearly by flattery and indulgence destroyed. Her ideas are entirely corrupted, and child as you may think her, for she is scarcely eighteen, there have not been wanting those of the other sex who have sought to undermine her principles. Here the signora heaved a loud, tremulous sigh, and turning up her eyes to heaven, made the sign of the cross. 
the Count, with external gravity and secret contempt, proceeded, What I would therefore presume to request of you is that you will condescend to keep over this proud and forward girl so strict a watch as scarcely to suffer her ever from your sight. But do not, do not treat her severely, dear cousin, interrupted Lorena in a faltering voice. The immaculate signora replied only by a cool, half-scornful look, and scarcely seemed proud of the appellation which Lorena had given her, though once it was the chief boast of her little mind. She now thought herself superior to the fallen wife of Loredani. I should have you, signora, continued Ardolf, endeavoring to call back her attention to himself. I would have you confine her, if it be necessary, to the solitude of her chamber for a short time. Oh, Ardolf, cried Lorena, unable to command her feelings. You are too cruel. There can be no occasion for such harshness. Another look from the unbending signora chilled her into silence, who then turned again with the utmost deference towards the count. Lorena, you are no judge, coldly observed Ardolf. The signora will only act as circumstances may require. To her conduct and discretion you may safely commit your daughter, when by a due course, he pursued, looking towards the signora, of restraint and privation, of every incitement to evil, a change for the better shall be perceptible in her disposition. We will withdraw her hence, and you, Lorena, may again receive her. Meantime, Signora di Medina, it is my intention to depart early tomorrow morning from this place, leaving Victoria still asleep. When she arises, astonished at not seeing us, she will inquire of you respecting us. You will then gently disclose to her the truth and her own destination for the present. By degrees you will, I doubt not, reconcile her to what she will perceive to be inevitable. Deign to act in this affair, Signora, with that zeal and punctuality which your piety will teach you to exert for the salvation of a soul, and with that prudence which has hitherto appeared so eminently to distinguish your own conduct in life, in which case, allow me to add, you shall not find me ungrateful." Again, a smile which appeared hideous because it seemed unnatural to the hard features it dilated was the return of the last significant remark of the Count's. He had skillfully touched the spring, the only spring upon which any feeling or any principle of the Signora hung. Interest. She found, as she had all along imagined, that it was her interest to court and to oblige the Count. She therefore determined to yield to whatever he could require— fondly promising herself in return some splendid remuneration. Be assured, my lord count, she said in a grating, discordant voice, intended to be gentle and conciliating. I will observe your wishes to the uttermost. And as for you, Signora Lorena, looking towards her with a pitying air, for all I intend to observe my lord count's wishes, you shall not have any reason to complain of the treatment your daughter will receive." At these words, the grateful Lorena flew towards her, and seizing her hand, which she fervently pressed, she said, "'Oh, you have no child, my dear signora, yet pity the feelings of another, and be kind to mine. She has never, no never, been opposed, nor treated with harshness.' Hastily, and with a look almost amounting to horror, the pure and dignified signora withdrew her hand as from the touch of pollution, then rising and retreating three steps, stretching out her arm at full length to prevent the nearer approach of so sinful and impure a being, she said, I will do the duty of a good Catholic towards your child. I shall study the preservation of her soul, and more her spiritual interest than her temporal vanities. The conscious and abashed Lorena turned aside with shame, even from the shoe of virtue in its most ungraceful form, pride and affectation. There appears no occasion for further discourse, observed Ardolf coldly. We shall rely upon the proper tenor of your conduct towards Victoria, when we think that time and reflection have shown her her faults and taught her to amend them. We will visit you again. If we find her sufficiently improved in her character, we shall receive her once more. Meantime, Cousin Di Medina, good night. Have the goodness to direct that we may be awakened early for the purpose of commencing our journey homeward before sunrise. 
and that you may bear us in mind till our return, deign to accept this ring as a small token of the respect we cherish towards you. So saying, Ardolf took from his finger a magnificent ring, which he placed on one of the signoras, whose half-closed eyes had more than once been riveted upon it. Then, gallantly bowing on her withered hand, he withdrew, leaving her in admiration at his singular politeness, and her own dexterity, as she thought, in having turned him already to such good account. Pursuant to his determination, long ere the sun had risen, Ardolf, with his weeping and remorseful companion, were far from the villa El Bosco. Perceiving, however, that Lorena was not yet reconciled to the prompt and severe measures he had so obstinately pursued, he forbore for the present to touch upon the subject, though his heart exulted to think that what he had willed he executed, and that nothing could now intervene to deprive him of a woman whom his pride equally at least with his love, made him so desirous of retaining. Had no obstacles existed to his possession of her, and even to his retaining her afterwards, the depraved and cruel Ardolf had either never sought or long since have disdained her. But his passion and his pride, kept in continual alarms, gave a renewed vividness to feelings which, but for such excitements, would have sunk into apathy or disgust. Such was the vitiated mind of Ardolf, that he could taste no delight that possessed not the poignant zest of having caused misery or destruction to others. Innocent and easily acquired pleasures suited not his profligate soul. Beauty to him was but a slight attraction, if not surrounded with difficulty and shielded either by the doting fondness of a husband or cherished as the glory of an admiring family. Such had been the situation when he first beheld her, of the unfortunate and degraded Lorena, of her whom he beheld himself, as he proudly thought, in the future undisturbed possession of, even till she should outlive, if such could be, his present love and admiration of her. If such could be, oh then, Lorena, in bitterness of heart, mightest thou curse the hour when first thou wert seen by the cruel and insensible Ardolf. These feelings so base, yet not unparalleled in the nature of man, were actuated in the mind of Ardolf, gave an elation to his spirits, which dispensed itself in a brilliant animation over his fine features and ever-fascinating manners. Without alluding to the cause of Lorena's grief, he contrived, by the most gentle and tender blandishments, gradually to dispel it. Such a seducing influence did he still possess over her ruined mind, that there were moments when she literally forgot there was a being in the world but himself. When she listened to his attractive converse and gazed on the dignified beauty of his form, she felt rising in her breast a sentiment of that vanity which had already proved her destruction. She even conceived towards him, such was her infatuation, an increase of love and gratitude when she reflected that it was the unbounded ardor of his attachment to her, which had induced him to act with such severity towards any one who had sought to embitter it. Thus, even the sacrifice of her child, sacrificed at the shrine of her errors and her crimes, by him who had been the cause of all, she began to contemplate with emotions of less poignant regret. Scarcely could she grieve in earnest at anything which bound closer to her the object of her idolatrous love. It seemed as if every occurrence which should have made her view him with sentiments of horror, but increased the delusion of her soul. Each moment that carried her further from the child she had abandoned, effaced more and more her image from her mind. Her ideas became more strongly riveted upon him, whose artifices had rendered her an infamous wife and a cruel mother, while himself was the exclusive charm of her unhappy existence. Let us leave, then, for a time, this guilty pair to enjoy the society of each other, and return to the deserted Victoria. When she awakened and looked round the large and desolate chamber, which the ill light afforded by a lamp on the preceding night had prevented her from viewing, the first feeling of her mind was renewed disgust against the owner of the mansion, and an impatient hope that the Count and her mother would not prolong their stay under a roof so hateful. Finding, however, that no one attended to call her, and imagining she must have slept many hours, the morning appeared to be far advanced. She arose and, dressing herself hastily, descended from her chamber and entered the garden. 
Here she had not been long, before she beheld, advancing towards her, a short, muscular-looking girl, habited in the costume of a peasant. She approached Victoria and informed her that the Signora di Medina desired her company at breakfast. With a haughty, supercilious air and a smile of decision on her features, Victoria glanced over the figure of the humble girl, and without deigning a reply, preceded her into the house. Entering the apartment where breakfast was laid, she saw there seated alone, at the table, the old signora, in unbending state. Without even offering to her the customary salutations of the morning, the haughty Victoria inquired impatiently if Count Ardolf and her mother still slept. "'I think it improbable,' coolly returned the signora. "'Why are they not here, then?' pursued the offended girl in a quick tone. "'Because,' answered the signora with malicious and ill-disguised exultation, "'they must by this time, I imagine, be gone some way on their journey from hence.' "'Gone?' almost shrieked Victoria. "'Did you say gone?' "'I said so.' With unaltered countenance, carelessly returned the signora. Is there anything so dreadful, young lady, in being compelled to remain with me for a while? Come, be charitable, she tauntingly proceeded. I have been very long solitary, and you will be noble company for me, I think. The rage of Victoria knew no bounds. She gazed wildly round the apartment. The whole truth rushed through her mind at once, the base, the unpardonable artifice that had been used. She struck her head violently with her clenched hand and passionately exclaiming, I am deceived and entrapped, rushed from the room before the signora was aware of her intention, and reaching the apartment where she had slept, she secured the door. There, casting herself upon the floor, her passion vented itself in a violent paroxysm of tears, but becoming suddenly ashamed of yielding, as she thought it, to a weakness so ignoble, and angry with herself that the ill-treatment of any one should have power to excite in her either grief or lamentation, she checked a rising gush, while rage and the most deadly hatred against those who had thus dared to dupe and to betray her took possession of her swelling heart. An ardent desire of revenge followed, and thus from the conduct, misjudging and inexcusable, that had been pursued towards her, did every violent and evil propensity of her nature become increased and aggravated. No sooner had Victoria called to her aid the loftier and more dangerous passions than she became to appearance calm, and though now and then, when reflecting upon the deception of her mother and cold, deliberate artifice of Ardolf, her eyes shot fire and the pulsation of her heart increased, yet in her general aspect there were no longer traces of grief, but, on the contrary, a superior and dignified expression which would have done honor to a nobler motive. Her head no longer drooped, and rising hastily from the floor, on which, after her first paroxysm, she had remained sitting. With firm and measured step, she traversed the apartment to and fro. In the course of her cooler reflection, it occurred to her that Alcon's Barenza must have been impelled by artifice, and not his own desire, to quit Montebello. This idea soothed the sovereign pride of her bosom. She felt that her charms had not been slighted, and at some future period she did not yet despair of convincing him that the separation was neither on her side voluntary. But then she recurred to her present situation. Was it intended she should remain forever a prisoner in this gloomy abode? Again she yielded for a moment to the influence of circumstance, and her heart became chilled at the idea. Yet she determined to observe minutely, to make no enquiries, to betray no vexation, but to act precisely as events might shew necessary. Soothed and calmed by these mental arrangements, and by the victory which reason, as she conceived, had obtained over her weaker feelings, she resolved, as evening drew on, to quit the solitude of her chamber, and breathe for a short space the air of the garden. For the whole of the day she had not tasted food, and though she heeded not the calls of hunger, she became sensible of the privation. The cold and unfeeling signora, happy to have a human being, and above all, an ardent and high-spirited creature to tyrannize over, resolved that no refreshment should be offered her till she herself came and with proper apologies for her conduct, requested it. 
but of this Victoria formed not the remotest intention, and it is probable that rather than have done so, she would have fallen a victim to the pangs of hunger. Fortunately for her, however, though infinitely to the regret of the tantalizing signora, she was not put to this trial, having walked for a while in the garden and refreshed her wearied faculties with the dewy fragrance of the atmosphere. She entered the house and proceeded, though unintentionally, to the very apartment where supper was prepared. There, quietly seating herself opposite to the old signora, she partook, without ceremony, of what was before her. She even made some attempt at conversation, but foiled in her proposed plan of ungenerous mortification, the signora di Medina was too vexed to make any reply. She had hoped to have found her inmate stubborn, refractory, and violent, giving fine scope thereby to her favorite art of tormenting. How grieved and disappointed, then, was she to find the fury of the morning sunk into calm, and, as it appeared, patient submission. Victoria, perceiving the signora, determined upon sullen silence, requested permission to withdraw for the night, in a tone of the utmost politeness. The only answer she obtained was a stiff inclination of the head. More determined than ever at this, that she should not have the gratification of provoking her, she coolly rose, and wishing her, with a profound curtsy, good night, left the room. When she was gone, this worthy and pious Catholic began to reflect that by means like these, Victoria would escape from all the arrangements she had been making to punish and mortify her. This will never do, she cried, while ruminating how best she might vex and harass the mind of her unfortunate guest. She has become reconciled to her situation without any attempt on my side to render her so. But she shall not escape thus. I will break that proud spirit and make her submit afterwards. Such were the reflections of the charitable devotee. And with these thoughts at work in her brain for the comfort and happiness of others, she said a long prayer, during which she frequently struck her breast and retired to repose. Victoria, after sitting for an hour at the window, with the mind still persevering in the resolution to be firm, sought likewise her bed, and soon forgot the vexations of the day in slumber. On the following morning she awakened at an early hour, and, after having dressed herself, she prepared to pass from her chamber into the garden. Trying her door, she found it was fastened on the outside, and discovering soon that every attempt on her part to shake it must be ineffectual, she opened the window and stationed herself beside it. In about half an hour the door was unlocked, and the young muscular girl, already mentioned, entered the room with a bowl of milk and a slice of coarse bread. These she laid upon the table and was retiring. "'Come back!' imperiously cried Victoria." The girl sullenly turned half round. "'I choose to walk in the garden,' she pursued. "'The signora will not permit it,' gruffly returned the girl. "'Will not permit?' repeated Victoria. "'No,' laconically answered the girl, again laying her hand upon the lock of the door. "'Why do you leave these things behind you?' cried Victoria, smothering the rage she felt rising in her breast. "'It is your breakfast,' replied the girl." quitting the room and locking the door after her. "'So, then I am made a prisoner,' muttered Victoria, and her cheeks assumed a crimson dye as she endeavored faintly to smile at the impotent malice of the signora. "'How have I incurred this? Not surely by my conduct of yesterday. But the malevolent disposition of the tyrant devotee became evident to the haughty girl, and she deemed her a being too insignificant to excite a moment's pain. This cannot last forever, thought she, and when the wretch is weary of confining me, she will, for variety, set me at liberty. Meantime, I must amuse myself the best I can. She searched her trunk, which, on the night of her arrival, had been brought into this chamber. Here she found some drawing materials. The surrounding scenery, beautifully romantic, furnished ample employment for her pencil, and with mixed sensations contending in her bosom, she seated herself by an open window and endeavored by occupation to banish reflection. This unworthy procedure and system of torment on the part of the signora continued in full force for some days, till want of exercise and inferior food began, though the proud Victoria disdained complaint to have a visible effect upon her health. 
At this, the signora, who was informed of the circumstance by the young girl who attended her, began to be slightly alarmed, and to apprehend likewise that she might overstep, by such measures, the limits that had been prescribed her, and render herself amenable for any ill consequence that might arise, such, for example, as the sickness of Victoria, which, by distressing and aggrieving Lorena, might bring her into disfavor with the Count. Perhaps, as he appeared so tenderly to love Lorena, even excite his anger against her for such unauthorized severity. For though Ardolph had said she might, if necessary, confine Victoria to her chamber, he had not bid her do so without cause, much less deprive her of her accustomed food, and give her only a scanty portion even of the worst. Under these considerations, therefore, she determined to relax a little, and Victoria, from being confined the whole of the day, and visited only twice in the course of it by Catau, her attendant, with a small quantity of bad bread and milk, was suffered, accompanied, however, by Gavin, to walk an hour in the garden, morning and evening. To attempt to describe the indignant feelings of Victoria at this treatment, or the struggle it cost her, amounting almost to frenzy, to subdue the expression of the violent rage that fermented in her bosom, would be indeed vain. Yet she bore all, and was determined sooner to die, than betray the smallest symptom of vexation or impatience. But desire of revenge, deep and implacable, was nurtured in her heart's core, and gave to her character an additional shade of harshness and ferocity. Thus she became like the untamable hyena, that confinement renders only more fierce. A few days after this comparative liberty had been allowed her, the signora by Catal requested her presence in the drawing-room. In strict pursuance of the conduct she had prescribed herself, she instantly obeyed and regretted only that her pallid cheek and sunken eyes were evidence of suffering beyond her power to conceal, and regratify, as she feared, the malignity of her tyrant. She entered the apartment, however, with an air neither of sullen reserve nor acknowledged resentment, but placid, cool, and unembarrassed. Thus, too, did she learn the most refined artifice, which by practice became imbued into the mass of her other evil qualities. The signora, somewhat discomfited by the unexpected demeanor of Victoria, having previously arranged her hard features for the intended expression of severe reprimand, knew not for the moment how to receive her. At length, she said, Be seated, child. With secret scorn and hate, Victoria obeyed. It is not my intention solemnly and in a labored accent began the signora to revert at present to your violent and improper conduct when first you became an inmate under this roof nor upon account of what is past to punish you further i merely wish to evince to you that softness humility and obedience are indispensable requisites here and that nothing can be tolerated that shews an overbearing haughty or ferocious spirit you are by this time, I trust, properly convinced of your error. The heart of Victoria rose in her bosom. It swelled with indignation to reply, but again she conquered her emotions, and the only evidence of them was a momentary rush of the blood into her cheeks. The signor proceeded. Under this impression, I deem it no longer necessary to confine you. You will not, however, be suffered to go beyond the walls of this mansion. The garden, at all events, must be the extent of your wanderings, and your only society, Catau, and at mealtimes, myself. How the pride of Victoria battled for vent! Society for Catau! But still she spoke not. I shall likewise expect that you peruse such religious books as I put in your hands, and which I humbly hope will tend to amend the stubbornness of your proud heart. Moreover, that you abjure the vanities of dress, and meekly comply with every requisition that, as a good and pious Catholic, anxious for the salvation of your soul, I shall think my duty to make of you. The signora now paused for breath. Victoria still remained silent, as not seeming to suppose an answer was required. The signora then resumed, how much ought you to thank heaven, proud child, that has caused you to be placed under my care, that has rescued you from the abode of vice and abomination, and placed you beneath the roof of purity and virtue? Count Ardolf even tells me, unhappy girl, that young as you are, you have already suffered your corrupt imagination to wander after man. Oh, Santa Maria, 
that ever I should live to speak the word, continued the devotee, turning up her eyes and making the sign of the cross. Teach me to bear with patience, admitting to my present one of passions and propensities so vile, and whose mother has already trespassed before her, beyond redemption, in the paths of sin. You may retire, child, she said, changing her tone of rhapsody into one of haughty severity. Retire and seek Katow. She is a meet companion for the contaminated offspring of one who is immersed many fathoms deep in guilt and shame. This last bitter, illiberal, and uncalled-for reproach tingled with burning heat through every vein of the insulted Victoria. Oh, mother, cruel mother, she faintly murmured and hastened from the room. End of chapter 6《Chapter Six》Chapter Seven of Sefloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa. Sefloya by Charlotte Dacre. Chapter Seven. It would be endless to dwell on the varied and unworthy artifices which the pious Signora di Medina had recourse to for the torment and annoyance of her unhappy charge. Suffice it to say that in time their effect became blunted and despised, and the whole thoughts of Victoria turned to the possibility of escaping from such vulgar tyranny. For long she revolved in her mind even the remotest probability, but in vain. She could never penetrate farther than the allotted garden, and knew not even the precise path or door that might lead beyond it. Even were that difficulty obviated, she was ignorant of the means of getting to Venice. Whither, could she but once escape, she was determined to hasten. Under these circumstances, the image of Catal presented itself to her mind. Confined as she was almost wholly to the society of this untaught girl, she had leisure to remark in her certain traits of docility and good nature. Ill concealed beneath the sullen sternness, she had evidently been commanded to assume. Catau was a peasant of Switzerland, short and thick in her person, hard favored, of rude and vacant features, ignorant and inured to labor. She had been selected by the Signora to attend and watch Victoria, first to mortify her by the careless clumsiness of her manner and the inferiority of her station, and secondly, from an idea that Victoria would despise her too much to endeavor to corrupt or make a friend of her. Should she even make the attempt, the Signora presumed the extreme stupidity of Catau would render it abortive. But here, for once, the infallible Signora, as she believed herself, was mistaken in her fancied penetration. Catau was not only not so stupid as she was supposed, but was possessed of a certain shrewdness and power of combining ideas, which, hid beneath an habitual silence and placidity of disposition, had drawn upon her the mistaken imputation of heaviness and insensibility. Catau could think, and, what was more, she could feel. Yes, infinitely beyond those who so proudly sat in judgment upon her character. To return, however, to Victoria, no sooner had the remotest glimmerings of a possible attempt beamed upon her mind than instantly she determined by every means in her power to attach Catau to her interests. Time and experience had already made her so far acquainted with the malevolent and tormenting spirit of the Signora di Medina that she well knew one great step towards the scheme in embryo was not by any means to appear reconciled to the society of Catau, but on the contrary, to seem to shun and despise her, for it was sufficient for this worthy Catholic to be aware of the particular circumstance that could yield a moment's satisfaction to anyone, instantly to reverse it, and continued with unwearied perseverance in that line of conduct which appeared to give most pain and uneasiness. Therefore, 
when she seemed to dislike being accompanied by Katow in the garden, which she often did purposely, the Signora, with a distorted smile of fancy triumph, would tell Katow to take her arm and lead her thither, thinking by that to inflict on the proud heart of her charge the deepest mortification. But here again the Signora was fallible, for no sooner was Victoria out of her sight than she smiled on Katow with an air that said, There is no other way of preserving your attendance. This smile would penetrate the heart of her humble companion, and she would feel so gratified and affected that, perhaps, at those moments, Victoria might have made an attempt not destitute of success. Such, however, was not her plan. She had not yet sufficiently arranged it, and she resolved to do nothing from crude, undigested ideas. She was but now in the infancy of her attempt, sounding the disposition of Catal, and her mailed heart was not to be thrown off its guard by any effusions of softness or feeling attributable to the effect of the moment alone. It so happened that one evening they perambulated to a part of the garden which was yet unknown to Victoria. It was a beautiful close avenue, the sides and roof of which were interwoven branches of vine and honeysuckle. The entrance was almost concealed by a thick shrubbery which it required no slight ingenuity to penetrate, and from the serpentine direction of the path it appeared wholly impossible to ascertain its extent. Still, having made their way through, they proceeded. Victoria, with a vague and indefinable feeling of hope and fear, and Catel merely with that vacant curiosity incident to vulgar minds. At length, after walking for near half an hour, they only reached the extent of the garden, bounded by the high circular wall, which had so often, since the comparative liberty she had enjoyed, filled the mind of Victoria, in contemplating it with a despondency almost hopeless. The winding path they had traversed had alone deceived her as to the imagined distance, and as she gloomily surveyed the strong and lofty enclosure, she almost doubted if any outlet whatever existed. Surely, thought she, there is only an entrance to the garden from the house, and no outlet from the garden itself. While thus she ruminated, Walking slowly along by the side of the wall, she became convinced, as she proceeded, that the precise part of the garden in which she now found herself she had never seen before. At length a small wooden door, formed in the wall and secured by two rusty bolts and a heavy iron lock, presented itself to her eager view. She instantly called to Catal to approach, and— pointing to the door, inquired of her if she knew whither it led. Catal readily applied an eye to the keyhole. It leads into the wood, Signora, which surrounds this house, but unless we were outside, it cannot tell the exact spot. The first part of her reply fixed the breathless attention of Victoria. Into the wood, repeated she mentally, and applied her eye likewise to the keyhole. And is there no way, Catal? said she, of opening this door? None that I know of, Signora, replied Catau. And even if there was, you know, Signora, she added in a hesitating voice. You know that I understand you, Catau, answered Victoria. But you know there could be nothing wrong in rambling now and then about the wood. And supposing the Signora has forbid it, how could it ever come known? Why, that is true, replied Catau thoughtfully. I must own, it is a hard thing to be so confined. Holy Jesu, Signora, we could never open this door. Oh, Catau, said Victoria in a gentle voice. Nothing is impossible to those who are willing. You could easily procure the key under some pretense or another, and think then how delightful it would be for us to be quite out of reach of the horrible Signora. Ho, ho, cried Catal with quickness, as if suddenly awaking from a reverie. I have a thought. To make any inquiries about the key belonging to the store, Signora, would only make us suspected. I now remember that when before you came, 
The signora used to send me to Ambrosio, the gardener, that I have seen hanging up under the little shed where he keeps his tools, a large bunch of rusty keys. I think, signora, I could lay my hand blindfold upon the very spot where they hang. Well, cried Victoria, her natural impatience breaking forth through her assumed gentleness and forbearance. Well, hasten then, fetch them, and let us try them all immediately. No, signora, answered Catal with genuine mildness. That will not do. The evening is drawing in. The signora has already begun to miss us. By this hour, Ambrosio, too, has most likely returned home, and may be in the very place I speak of. Tomorrow, when he shall be in a distant part of the garden, I will watch the moment when no one is near, and slip through his little cottage to the spot. For I must pass through Ambrosio's residence, signora, to get at it, shall then whip down the keys as quick as lightning. And if you will promise, Signora, if you will promise not to betray me, nor to stay out too long, I would do all I can to oblige you. I do not think, she continued, this door has been opened for a long time. Perhaps the very key that belongs to it may be in this bunch. Victoria was fearful to appear too eager, and ardently as she longed to penetrate beyond the unvaried precincts prescribed by the signora, she acquiesced with apparent readiness to the arrangements of Catau, and reluctantly agreed to bend her steps homeward. The whole of the night was passed in giving way alternately to trembling hope and the deepest despair. The perpetual ferment of her brain, and above all, the violent restraint she imposed upon her feelings and natural disposition, scarcely ever suffering herself to be provoked for an instant from the cool and systematic conduct she prescribed herself, had begun long since to have a visible effect upon her personal appearance. She had become thin and pallid, but still her eyes burnt with an ardent though melancholy flame that bespoke the trammeled, unsubdued ferocity of her soul. About noon the following day, Katow, who had been absent since she had risen, for she occupied the same apartment as Victoria, rushed suddenly into the room and first carefully securing the door drew from her pocket a huge bunch of rusty keys at this sight victoria's eyes sparkled and the orient tint revisited momentarily her pallid cheek she devoured them with eager look and in fancy applied them in turn to the lock of the door it was however as yet too early to venture forth for they might be tempted to remain longer absent than would be prudent, and suspicion might be excited. They therefore agreed to defer till evening their destined trial. Now, in all this act of conduct of the simple Catau, there was absolutely not the smallest intention of aiding or abetting Victoria to escape. She would, on the contrary, have shuddered at the idea, but though in obedience to the orders of the Signora, she had, in the commencement, treated her with sullen coldness, yet in a little time, as is natural for a young, uncorrupted mind, she had become weary of this assumed character, and returned to the kind, gentle, and respectful conduct, more consonant to her feelings. Besides which, the involuntary awe with which superior rank inspired her was not to be done away, for superior rank if accompanied with any dignity, makes resistless impression on the vulgar mind. Victoria, who beheld with pleasure this gradual change of conduct, divested herself as much as possible of her natural hauteur, and, having a point to carry, she behaved towards Catal with the utmost condescension, now and then bestowing on her such trifles as were still within her power, for of the greatest part of her little possessions, clothes, and etc., the signora had deprived her, under the pretense of curing her of a sinful vanity detrimental to the good of her soul. Under the pretense of curing her of a sinful vanity detrimental to the good of her soul. But what Victoria could, she did, and the trifles which, with grace, she pressed upon Catau, 
were acceptable and had their desired effect, for vulgar minds are almost always mercenary. Therefore, as far as she could, in return, she enlarged the slender sphere of victorious comforts and her solitary, unvaried amusements. Thus, in procuring for her the keys, she had it merely in contemplation to obtain for her, if possible, a few moments of satisfaction. Early in the evening, they descended to the garden and hastened to the avenue already described. Strong anxiety winged the feet of Victoria, and soon she reached the door which had already excited in her mind ideas so various and confused. Snatching the keys from Katow, who had toiled after her, she applied them in turn, with trembling impatience, to the lock. One at length appeared to suit the best. She essayed to turn it, but in vain. It was reserved for the sinewy hand of Katow to triumph over the united strength of rust and iron. She wrenched the key with violence. It turned in the lock. She applied her force to the bolts alternately with her hand and a stone which she had picked up. The door at length yielded to her perseverance and flew open. Happy and joyous sight for the imprisoned Victoria! She darted like a wild bird, newly escaped from its wiry tenement, into the beautiful and romantic wood that presented itself to her ravished view. The cautious and less ardent Katow closed the door after them and followed. Victoria looked wistfully around. She beheld no boundaries, nothing to retard her should she effect her escape. For a moment she ruminated. Then calling Katow towards her, she said in a careless tone, Katow, canst thou tell now in which direction lies the city of Venice? Venice, signora, answered Katow, pausing and gazing around. Venice lies there, pointing with her finger. Then, said Victoria, clapping her hands while her cheeks crimsoned with rage, Montebello, pointing contemptuously toward the left, must be on that side. Reflections too bitter and too strong to be endured rushed through her mind. She turned abruptly away, and with a look that seemed to say, Accursed be the quarter where I was deceived and duped, and accursed every breeze that is wafted thence. But far, far different sensations actuated her when she cast her eyes forwards. There, thought she, is Venice itself, and there dwells Berenza. Distance, like death, always magnifies to the imagination the charms of those who were beloved, together with the deception that had been used to separate her from him, induced her to think of him with a tenderness that, but for those circumstances, perhaps she had never felt in so powerful a degree. Ah, uh, Dear Berenza, she mentally continued, might I but hope to see thee once more. She turned towards Katow, anxious to rally her thoughts, and taking her arm, she walked on with her in silence. A thousand unconnected ideas still floated in her mind. Time passed unheeded, till Katow, respectfully reminding her that it would be expedient to return, roused her from her visions of the future, and she readily acquiesced in the propriety of the movement. End of chapter 7、Chapter、Eight of Zafloya This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Zafloya by Charlotte Docker. Chapter 8. It may be naturally presumed that the mind of Victoria remained bent upon escape. Not a day passed that she did not induce Cato to extend their walks farther and farther from the outlet, an outlet the Signora little thought they would ever discover, much less dream of attempting. Every day, too, did she contrive to make silent, though accurate observations as to the direct course it would be most proper for her to pursue. 
at length unable to bear continued procrastination she determined to put in execution the plan that had been so long arranging in her brain accordingly on the following evening when the unsuspicious cato had been lured by her kind and condescending manner to accompany her far infinitely farther than they had ever yet ventured she suddenly stopped short and thus addressed the astonished girl cato i will never more return to il bosco my term of slavery is over now i shall bend my course whither i please to the east the west the north or the south listen therefore to what i have to propose exchange instantly your apparel for mine and by your prompt acquiescence merit this diamond ring which has been concealed from the old signora and which i will in that case immediately bestow upon you you can easily as we have hitherto done return into the house unperceived and array yourself in some of your usual attire should you be questioned as to my escape swear what will be true that you was not privy to it should you be questioned as to whither i am gone swear what is true that you cannot tell if even after all of this the signora should think fit to discharge you i do not see that you will have anything to regret and with regard to any advantage you might think you lost this ring which is extremely valuable will more than indemnify you now these are the specific terms which i propose to you if you refuse them i am equally determined to fly and if nothing but violence will avail to oppose my strength to yours my strength it is true may not equal yours but you may find to your cost cato she added with meaning in her eyes that victory may not always depend upon that alone cato trembled like a leaf in the gale the firmness and decision with which she had been addressed left her not the power of reply victoria marking her consternation began calmly to take off her robe and in that gentle tone she knew so well how to assume thus went on i see cato that you have the good sense to feel the propriety of my resolution and the kindness to wish to assist me in it come my good girl prepare to undress oh signora uttered out cato at length involuntarily taking at the same time the first step to divest herself of her attire oh signora what are you about to do to leave a tyrant answered victoria with quickness her eyes darting fire and i wish you cato speedily the same good fortune come hasten your movements she proceeded handing her the robe she had now taken off poor cato mechanically proceeded to do as she was ordered hurried in her naturally slow conceptions yet in the naive goodness and simplicity of her heart seeing something in the conduct of victoria which she could not blame for who more than the poor drudge cato had reason to hate the tyrannical and never satisfied signora she went on but not so quickly as victoria desired to exchange with her gradually every necessary external part of her dress to render the disguise complete though the imperious unaltered victoria had acquired by assumed gentleness the love of the humble cato yet had she still the power of inspiring her with awe conscious of that and knowing that her weak mind must in the present case be taken by surprise and subdued by the force of language she had preferred this mode to that of attempting sudden flight such an act would have roused her drowsy faculties and once impelled it was possible she might have excelled in her swiftness of foot which would have delayed perhaps destroyed her entire project besides it was infinitely more politic to make cato a friend than by apparent ingratitude and want of confidence render her perhaps an enemy the transformation was at length completed when victoria presenting cato with the promised ring slightly pressed her hand and said my good my honest cato if you possibly can return to the house unseen 
and enter the chamber we have usually occupied. Secure the door. Should the signora see nothing of us for the night, she will conclude that, supperless, we have tired to bed, and will not have the foolish good nature to disturb us, perfectly satisfied to have saved a meal. We are never in the habits of seeing her till late in the day. I shall then be safe from the reach of tyranny. At least, I hope so. And should we ever meet again, you will have no cause to repent the day you have acted. Adieu, my kind girl, for time flies. Adieu. Return homewards, and do not attempt to follow me. Oh, Signora, Signora, sobbed Cato, while the tears streamed copiously over cheek resembling the full-blown damask rose. If you really love me, Cato, said the calm Victoria, who felt not a shadow of regret at leaving her faithful companion, if you really love me, detain me no longer, but turn at once and let me behold you on your return. Cato, with a violent burst of tears and sobs, seized the hand of Victoria and impressed on it a kiss forcible in proportion to the affection it was meant to convey. She then turned hastily away, and, without power to speak a word, proceeded towards the house with a speed almost sufficient to satisfy the impatience of Victoria. She remained, however, upon the spot, thinking every moment an age till the poor girl was out of sight, who, unconsciously, however, turned frequently round to obtain a last look of her she so much regretted to leave. At these periods, Victoria, though with a feeling of vexation and anger, would hastily wave her hand, as if to say, I see thee, but pray thee go on. At length, some trees intervening, excluded entirely from her view the object she desired to lose sight of, then, hastily turning from the spot, she bent her steps forward, fondly congratulating herself that every step she took brought her nearer and nearer to Venice. The sun had set about an hour. Victoria, who had walked, or rather ran, with the utmost celerity, from the moment that she beheld Cato no longer, had hoped in a short time to have penetrated the wood. She, however, found herself mistaken, for the wood was of extensive dimensions, and ignorant of its windings, she had not taken the shortest way to emerge from it. Though she continued her speed with unabated eagerness, night, to her confusion, began to draw in, and still she was wandering in its mazes. As it grew darker, the necessity of abstaining from her journey became evident. And whither can I seek for shelter tonight? she mentally ejaculated, casting her eyes around. A small white shed, embosomed at a distance among the trees, caught her view. She felt an emotion of gladness, and was hastening towards it, but suddenly recollecting that when her flight should be discovered, it was not improbable but the very road she had taken might be searched, and then, in such case, this shed being liable to the observations of others, as well as herself, might undergo some scrutiny. She determined instantly to avoid, as much as possible, the habitations of man, and to pursue the path that appeared the most unfrequented. Sooner than incur the smallest risk of being traced, the firm-minded Victoria decided on passing the night in common with the race of animal nature, beneath no other canopy than the star-sprinkled heavens. In pursuance of this resolve, she turned from the path that led, as she now perceived, to various scattered seclusions of humble life, and, beneath the umbrageous shade of a self-formed bower, composed of jessamine and the luxurious vine, overhanging and intertwining from a wild hedge on one side of the forest, she cast herself for repose. Here, thought she, may not I enjoy a few hours of more refreshing rest than hitherto I have obtained on more luxuriant beds. I am safe, too, in doing so, for the Signora will not even hear of my escape till noon to-morrow." Thus reflecting, sleep stole gradually over her senses. Fatigued by the unusual exertions of the day, for some hours she enjoyed undisturbed repose. 
nor till the sunbeams playing through the tender branches upon her closed eyelids and the carol of the birds exhilarated by the divine rays of the morning burst melodiously forth did she awaken she no sooner opened her eyes than starting upon her feet she again commenced her journey with the utmost speed a few naples biscuits which she had the day before thought of securing served her for breakfast and she ate them as she proceeded her chief desire was now to leave behind her the wood for this she increased her speed and after two hours walking found herself in a kind of path that she hoped would give her some unerring clue to proceed by eager with this idea she swiftly measured its winding way it terminated at length in a lonely canal bordered on each side by poplars and acacias and victoria beholding this cast herself almost hopeless close to its edge oh she cried how deeply must i have wandered on this melancholy canal no gondola most likely ever passes to retrace my steps would be certain destruction to my hopes here then may i as well remain and die she had thrown herself upon her face and despondently leaned her forehead upon her clasped hands the soft gale sighed among the trace no human being seemed nigh to interrupt the solitude the melody of the birds among the lofty poplars and the spreading acacias alone broke the heavenly silence of the scene and victoria indifferent to these wild beauties so hostile to her wishes remained prostrate and in despair at length a low distant sound struck upon her ear she started did it not resemble the remote noise of oars dipping at measured intervals in the canal no no it was but the breeze agitating the leaves of the trees and again she reclined her head presently the sound returned but with increased effect it was accompanied most joyous conviction by a rough voice singing a song common among the gondolieri in an instant victoria was upon her feet she bent eagerly over the canal and described a gondola most leisurely approaching and containing only a single rower who was coasting coolly along the edge of the lake oh thought victoria on that careless being depends my fate how slowly he approaches while i burn with impatience without increasing an iota in speed by degrees the gondola came near victoria eagerly hailed it whither go you friend she asked to venice victoria's heart leaped wilt thou permit me she asked to enter thy gondola canst thou pay my pretty one asked the gondolier in return victoria was silent all she had possessed her ring she had given to cato the gondolier was silent likewise and her hopes began again to fade at length she cast her eyes upon the countenance of the gondolier though coarse and brawny she perceived that he was a young man alas she said i have no money friend but i have a lover in venice and if thou wilt convey me thither the blessed virgin will ever send thee luck the gondolier in turn cast his eyes upon victoria he beheld beneath her peasant's hat that she was beautiful he conceived her from her garb to be a peasant in reality and readily believed that she had no money the gondolier himself had a mistress that he loved but on account of his poverty her parents refused the match and he saw her by stealth alone he conceived a fellow feeling then for victoria and towing his gondola close to the edge of the lake he stretched forth his hand to her which she joyfully seized and vaulted into the gondola who can describe the sensations of victoria she could not speak a thousand gay anticipations reveled in her mind and their enjoyment was too sweet to be unnecessarily interrupted the gondolier however thinking he had at least a right to her conversation for his kindness did not long permit her to indulge but how my pretty one he began could ever you think of meeting a gondola where i found you perched 
It is not once in a century that any of us pass hereabouts, except indeed at an odd time or so. Why, if it had not been a cavalier that I took up this blessed morning, he, for the heats began, to carry him to a pretty villa that he has close almost to the borders of the canal, and between you and I carried a pretty signora along with him, his reason, no doubt, for setting off at such an hour, so private, you know. Well, if it had not been for that, I say, which is no business either of mine or yours, I was well enough paid, the devil a gondola you might have caught that way these six days. So you see, my pretty rogue, how lucky you are, and to get such luck for nothing, too. Victoria, who had long ceased to attend to the long-winded dissertation of the gondolier, catching only his last words, most cordially assented to them, at the same time expressing her gratitude for his good nature. To this the gondolier made no other reply than a broad, significant grin, winking at the same time one eye, alluding, as Victoria supposed, to the lover she had told him of, and then began again with the song he had been singing before she hailed him. Soon, to her infinite joy, Victoria beheld the towers and domes of stately Venice rising proudly from the Adriatic, encircled round by its green arms. It was the time of the carnival. Multitudes of gay and splendid gondolas appeared upon the lake as they drew near. They were now upon the point of landing at St. Mark's. Victoria turned to thank the gondolier for his kindness. He nodded and smiled and helped her out of the gondola, whispering in her ear that he should never at any time object to do so pretty a girl a service. Once more at liberty and at her own disposal, secure too in her disguise, Victoria, without trepidation, mixed with the gay crowd of St. Mark's Place in the faint hope, perhaps, of discovering among them one to whom her heart involuntarily pointed. Fatigued at length by exertion and want of food, for she had tasted nothing but a few biscuits since the preceding evening, and evening again was now far advanced, she quitted St. Mark's Place to seek a spot less thronged and confused. As she proceeded a sudden faintness, the consequence of exhaustion overcame her so far that, to prevent falling in the street, she hastened beneath a lofty portico and seated herself upon one of its steps. Leaning her swimming head upon her hand, she remained for some moments unable to move. Her heart palpitated, and she began to fear that mind might not always prove omnipotent over matter. By degrees, however, the faintness went off. She raised her head. The gay appearance of the streets and the canals, every window illuminated, and the splendid apparel of the masks, ill and overpowered as she felt, yielded her a sensation of the highest delight. She could remember only that she had escaped from a dreary solitude and the most abominable tyranny, and every feeling of sickness vanished at the idea. As still she continued sitting, her symmetrical figure habited in her homely garb, and those strong marked features shaded by a large and simple hat, amid the gay and hurrying crowd that still continued to pass, a group of masqueraders caught her attention. Among them was one of a tall and noble figure, far surmounting the rest. He wore a domino of blue silk wrapped carelessly round him, so that his left shoulder with part of his vest was displayed, which sparkled with jewels. On his head he wore a Spanish hat of black velvet, surmounted by a lofty plume of snow-white feathers, confined in it by a diamond loop. Upon this attractive figure her eyes fixed, as he passed with a sort of confused recollection of having before seen it. The hasty glimpse she had caught, however, was insufficient to ascertain where, and involuntarily she started up to have a better view of his person. As she did so, he turned round. True, he was masked, but conviction flashed upon her senses. Sudden and irresistible was the impulse. She flew towards him, and laying her hand upon his arm, exclaimed, Berenza! Yes, oh yes! In a low but eager voice answered the mask, pressing her hand upon his arm. 
mark me but retire victoria drew back the mask rejoined the group he had a moment separated from and was soon lost in the crowd bitter was the vexation and disappointment of victoria by happy accident was thus discovered and in the same moment lost him on whom her chief hopes depended but still the splendid illusion of the scene remained the mind of victoria was supremely elastic and she consoled herself with the reflection that she was still in venice and at liberty she continued mechanically moving along till at length she found herself in a more retired part of the city where resided some of the inferior inhabitants from this place she hastened but everywhere the brilliancy of the scene began now to fade the night was considerably advanced the gay crowd visibly diminishing had entered their houses to carouse and the splendid light decreasing assumed the appearance of a twilight gilded by the last rays of the setting sun the adventurous victoria now began to perceive the possibility there existed of passing another night without shelter the reflection was unwelcome to her feelings but she preferred it to the remotest risk of discovery by seeking out any of her former acquaintances or dependents again therefore seating herself beneath a portico she leaned her head upon her hand and gave way to reflections of a gloomy tendency she was hungry and fatigued and these circumstances added to the depression of her spirits suddenly a voice sounded in her ear follow me she raised her head but perceived no one again therefore she covered her eyes with her hand and endeavoured to resume her train of thought rise said the same voice again she started and instinctively arose the portico at which she had seated herself was the first in the street a tall figure darted as it were from behind her it appeared enveloped in a dark cloak and retreating swiftly to such a distance as to render its actual presence dubious beckoned in an inclining attitude to victoria glad even of so mysterious perhaps dangerous a mandate she hastened to obey as fast as her enfeebled limb would allow the stranger perceiving that she did so again retreated but still continuing to invite victoria still pursued at length in a deserted part he stopped victoria approached he encircled her waist and drawing aside his cloak she discovered the spangled habit and the figure of baranza hush he hastily exclaimed perceiving she was about to express her joy then again withdrawing himself he proceeded towards a small door in the street at which he gave three distinct knocks it opened cautiously he put forth his hand and beckoned victoria she drew near he seized her arm and conducted her into the house the door closed they had not walked many paces through a dark narrow entry before berenza stopped and taking a handkerchief from his pocket bound it lightly over the eyes of victoria saying to her in a low voice fear not this shall not be for long victoria only smiled and did not answer at length they ascended some stairs and appeared to enter an apartment the conte pressed the hand of victoria and bade her take the bandage from her eyes she did so and instantly uttered an exclamation of pleasure and surprise for a sumptuous and brilliantly illuminated chamber struck upon her dazzled sight the walls were covered with large resplendent mirrors that variously reflected her simply attired but graceful figure berenza appeared for a moment to enjoy her surprise then fervently pressing her in his arms he said here my lovely and beloved victoria will be sole mistress she will no more fly from the man who more than life adores her fly repeated victoria i never fled from thee berenza didst thou not my love much then requires explanation but not at this juncture you look pallid and fatigued rest here a while till some slight refreshment is procured so saying he gently seated victoria upon a superb sofa and for a few moments left her to herself the most pleasing ideals 
now took possession of her mind, as in a recumbent posture she awaited the return of Berenza. Her fatigues, her difficulties, even her imprisonment, all was forgotten in her present prospect of long-desired happiness. "'Now, then, cruel and ungenerous mother,' she exclaimed, "'thou canst no longer deprive me of a happiness similar to that which thou so selfishly enjoyest, a happiness which, but for thee, my awakened fancy had never conceived, nor my soul coveted. Ah, mother, mother, thou didst deceive and betray me, but I shall still live to thank thee for teaching me the path to love and joy. As she concluded this wild expression of her misguided sentiments, Berenza entered. He had heard what she had uttered, and, pleased as he undoubtedly was, that chance had thrown in his way the girl he had admired and loved, yet his delicate and refined mind experienced a sensation of regret at the avowed freedom of her principles. Yet still more severe were his reflections against the authors of this mischief, the parent, whose example and conduct had corrupted the sentiments of her daughter, and the wretch whose seductions had corrupted the parent, but mentally he promised himself to restrain and correct the improper bias of Victoria's character. For Berenza, though a refined voluptuary, possessed a noble, virtuous, and philosophic soul. He seated himself by the side of Victoria and gently took her hand. It was dry and feverish. "'You have undergone considerable exertion this day,' he said, gazing on her countenance. "'Have you not, my sweet Victoria?' Victoria smiled, and great was the dismay of Berenza when he learned that for upwards of twenty-four hours she had not tasted food. He instantly forbade her to utter another word till the nature was recruited, and the moment a collation he had ordered made its appearance, he tenderly pressed her to eat. Nor, till he thought her sufficiently refreshed, would he reply to the most pressing of her eager interrogatories respecting the real cause of his precipitate departure from Monte Bello. At length, when he explained to her this circumstance, and his conviction at the time of having acted expressly consonant to her own wishes, nothing could exceed the rage she evinced at the deception which had been practiced, and unwilling as was Berenza to countenance or encourage the undue violence of her disposition, he could scarcely avoid participating in the expression of her sentiments. The gross unworthiness of the parental duplicity had surprised and disgusted him, and if for a moment before he had been disposed to lament the effect of her daughter's flight upon the mind of Lorena, he now felt that compassionating sentiment give way to one of pleasure that Victoria had escaped, and escaped to him. It appeared, too, in the course of his explanation to Victoria, that, surprised at not receiving from her the smallest intelligence for a length of time, though, according to the intimation in the note, he was taught to expect he might shortly hear from her, he had, impatient at the delay, presented himself uncalled at Montebello. There had he learned that by her own desire his fair mistress had taken her departure from thence, and had expressly required that he should be kept in ignorance of her retreat. For that reflection having convinced her of the impropriety of encouraging his attentions, she had determined to endeavor at least to overcome it, and therefore conceived that absence was the most likely, nay, the only mode of forwarding so desirable a point. I confess, pursued Conte Berenza, from the knowledge I possessed of your character, I thought such sudden variation of sentiment almost incompatible with it, but having no alternative, for I felt I had no right to request an explanation from your mother or the Count, you, according to the law of things appertaining rather to them than me, and urged by the cool looks I received, I took my departure, secretly hoping that time would bring me some satisfactory elucidation of a circumstance that I could not help considering as somewhat mysterious. Ere their mutual explanations had ceased, the night was far advanced. 
the history of victoria's sufferings at the signora de modena's the mode of her escape her difficulties her precautions to avoid being traced all all must be detailed and expiated on air she would think of retiring Berenza at length ventured to recur to the necessity there was for her taking some rest unwillingly at his delicate solicitation she agreed to do so when summoning some female attendants he ordered them to show her to the chamber which had been hastily prepared for her no sooner had victoria reached her apartment than she requested her attendants to withdraw for she was desirous of indulging alone the influx of her ideas delight and pleasure had such complete possession of her that scarce could her trembling hands perform the office of disrobing herself long too after she had entered her elegant bed which rose in the form of a dome bordered with deep gold fringe did her buoyant spirits drive sleep from her pillow at length however her ardent imagination became overpowered she fell asleep and brilliant fantasies gambled before her in the dreams of the night berenza too retired to repose but his reasoning mind though in such recent attainment of a desired good was placid and unruffled the images which occupied it were devoid of the romantic trappings of fancy he beheld victoria such as she really was unembellished unornamented his keen eye that perceived her beauties discerned likewise her defects he appreciated her character he beheld at once her pride her stubbornness her violence her fierte can i asked himself be rationally happy with a being imperfect as she now is no unless less i can modify the strong features of her character into the nobler virtues i feel that all her other attractions will be insufficient to fill up my craving heart pursuing these reflections berenza fell asleep victoria beneath his roof voluntarily in his power he had leisure to retire and amplify on those errors which while she seemed unattainable struck him in a point of view infinitely less momentous such is the nature of man end of chapter eight chapter nine of zafloya this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah zafloya by charlotte docker chapter nine the sun had risen far above the horizon when victoria awakened she hastily arose and perceived that the peasant's garb had been exchanged for habiliments more resembling those she had till now been accustomed to wear this she with justice attributed to the delicate attention of berenza dressing herself she summoned attendants and was informed that il conte berenza had been long awaiting breakfast for her and desired them to conduct her to the apartment where he was she found him sitting upon a sofa with breakfast things before him on her entrance he rose and conducted her to sit beside him his demeanor towards her was rather that of a sincere and a tender friend than of an ardent lover for the mind of berenza ever aiming at perfection felt that ere he could aver himself the latter he must himself new model the object during breakfast he conversed upon indifferent subjects but more sedulously and more anxious than ever did he scrutinize her as though in her air and in her eyes he would read every movement of her soul yet true it was that berenza was a voluptuary but a philosophical delicate and refined voluptuary it was not the perfection of body only that he required but the perfection also of mind victoria perceived that embarrassment clouded the manners of the conte she sought by every means to draw him from his apparent abstraction and again taking his hand she said berenza why are you not cheerful you were wont to tell me that i should constitute your happiness if once i became yours 
now then that fortune has united us you appear less happy than when you despaired of gaining me nay indeed dear berenza almost indifferent to her you so professed to love berenza rose during the speech of victoria a new idea had taken possession of his mind it was the tormenting the useless reflection that perhaps he was not particularly distinguished by the confidence of victoria that perhaps she had flown to him merely as a refuge from discomfort and oppression and that had another addressed her she would equally have flown to him this suggestion struck a pang to the heart of the refining philosopher suppressing his emotion however and taking the hand of victoria he only said you have often my love known me abstracted and thoughtful without any particular reason occurring at the moment heed me not and i shall speedily be myself again then i will withdraw to my chamber my lord said victoria secretly piqued and disgusted that her presence should not be a talisman against every species of uneasiness do so my love consider yourself here as mistress and all i have at your disposal make such arrangements as you may think fit without hesitation employ yourself a few hours apart from me we will meet at dinner and in the evening repair to the laguna where my victoria will be the fairest victoria withdrew but her air was indignant and berenza observing it sighed as he gazed after her mentally exclaiming victoria how imperfect thou art fool that i was he continued i never possessed either the heart or the mind of this girl circumstances only have impelled her towards men oh could i but penetrate her thoughts could i but discover her actual feelings my mind would be at rest were i only convinced of her love i could easily new model her character because the precepts and the wishes of those we love sink deep into the heart but no matter i will be the friend the brother the protector of the girl who has thrown herself into my arms i will love her too but never no never willingly take advantage of a fortuitous circumstance i will be convinced of her affection her absolute her exclusive affection and till i am thoroughly convinced i will be her friend and not her lover such was the determination of the reasoning philosopher whose delicate and fastidious mind made its own food and took forever a pleasure in repining upon itself at dinner they again met and when the heat of the day was succeeded by the cooling breezes of evening berenza led his fair charge to st mark's place along which multitudes of gay venetians were flocking to get into their gondolas the conte assisted victoria into his which was splendid and gaily accoutred happy was the vain victoria to find herself thus in the midst of the gay world the laguna was covered with an innumerable quantity of gondolas soft music sounded from every side and sweet female voices sometimes accompanied the strains the scene elevated her spirits she blessed the moment when she had escaped from the tyranny of a discontented bigot she cast her eyes around and she perceived that she had excited that attention and admiration that she so much loved to obtain she even fancied that the venetian bells viewed her with an air of envy the idea was doubly pleasing and her animation increased but she did not for a moment suppose that this envy was excited on account of the companion who sat beside her berenza was indeed accounted the most accomplished cavalier in venice the very phoenix of grace and elegance his opinions his taste his approbation formed the standard of fashion for though no one knew or appreciated the dignity and delicacy of his mind yet was he considered the most graceful and fascinating of men his society was universally courted even by the women though they well knew his refined and superior judgment his was not the heart of a sensualist if indeed a sensualist hath a heart he could not gaze enraptured on the accurate formation of a limb waste his hours in contemplating incessantly a beautiful form or resign his independence while admiring some 
harmonious combination of feature or complexion. Even his most irrational hours were never spent at the feet of a simpering coquette. No, it was necessary that Berenza's beauties should be polished, that they should possess the talisman of mind. Well was this general trait in his character understood, yet his society and his notice were eagerly courted by females, since to attach him would indeed have been triumph. Who then could forbear the attempt? Victoria excited, therefore, universal envy in one sex, and she likewise excited universal admiration in the other. The notice she attracted filled her vain, ambitious heart with exultation, and it was with infinite regret she left the gay-covered lake to return to the palazzo of her lover. Flattered by the attention she had excited, the philosophic Berenza viewed her involuntarily with a feeling of increased approbation. For true it is, man is too apt to be guided in his estimate of things by the degree of estimation they may obtain from others, and to be influenced in his opinion by the standard, often depraved, of public taste. Supper being prepared for them, the Comte began wholly to relax from the restraint he had imposed upon his manner. He seated himself with a smiling air by the delighted Victoria, who instantly availed herself of the gaiety and unreserve of his manner to ask an explanation of what had more than once obtruded itself upon her mind. Looking somewhat archly in his countenance, she said, "'Tell me, Berenza, if the question be not improper, why, with so much caution and mystery, you first acknowledged your recognition of me, and conducted me hither, yet now carelessly exhibit yourself with me in public?' "'O oh, woman, curious woman,' said the Conte, laughing. "'But I will tell thee, Victoria. "'Frederick Alvarez, a friend of mine, and a Spanish nobleman of high rank, "'had a mistress called Magdalena Strozzi, by birth a Florentine. "'Of this mistress he was passionately fond, and often pressed me to be introduced to her. "'But having many other engagements, I always declined.' at length one day he succeeded in securing me and i was reluctantly dragged into the presence of his siren mark the untoward result on the honour of a venetian i solemnly assure you i paid her no extraordinary attention nor any whatever of a nature that could be considered dishonourable towards my friend yet she exerted her utmost artifice she used every blandishment to allure me megalina was beautiful she was beside elegant and accomplished. I am not, as I think, either a philosopher or a stoic, but a man refining on my own sensations. I yielded, I own, to the witcheries of Megalina, and felt no compunctious visitings from a consciousness of treacherous conduct toward my friend. I had not attempted to seduce his mistress. It was she, on the contrary, who had so powerfully addressed my feelings and my senses." that was in the fullest acceptation of the term the seductress. At length, however, the jealous Alvarez discovered the infidelity of her to whom he was devoted heart and soul. He sought me out, foaming with rage and outraged love, and gave me my choice to meet him in honorable combat or be passively run through the body. Breathing death and vengeance, it was vain to reason with him. I therefore preferred the former offer, and we met. Fury rendered his hand unsteady, and when I succeeded in drawing a little blood from his arm, some of our mutual friends, who were privy to the affair, endeavored to explain to Alvarez the folly of fighting for an abandoned wanton. He heard them with a gloomy air, but appeared convinced by their arguments. I offered him my hand, but he refused it with rage, and soon after left Venice. Since that period I have occasionally visited Megalina, but never could I prevail upon myself to consider her as a mistress, from the very obvious and unerring reflection that a female who could abandon a sincere and doting lover for me would as readily abandon me for any other who might attract her wandering eye. Still, however, the jealous, the alternate fits of love and resentment which she thought proper to exhibit, 
whenever I presented myself before her, have long been a source of extreme unpleasantness to me. She has frequently sworn, with a frantic air, that though she hears with my insulting indifference towards her, that should she ever have reason to attribute my coldness to regard for another, my death alone would satiate her vengeance. Thus, though I know the irregularity of her life, and that her undisciplined passions hurry her into the most abject excesses, I do not wish, insolent and unjustifiable as such conduct would be, to induce her frenzied attacks against my life or peace. I, therefore, in my research after you, used all possible precaution. Nor did I, though you saw me not, even for once lose sight of you. My reason for placing a fillet over your eyes was merely to enjoy your astonishment when it should be removed, for I introduced you by a private way into my house. I believe, fair Victoria, pursued the Conte, smiling and taking her hand, I have now explained all that may have appeared mysterious to you. You have, my lord, answered Victoria, but you still, still visit Megalina then? she pursued, while her jealous eyes wandered. I have, as I said, replied the Conte, smiling, been accustomed to visit her. And, and you still intend, my lord Berenza? My future intentions, replied Berenza seriously, will be considerably influenced by you. But, my lord, said the artful Victoria, with an air of innocence, unwilling to proceed too far, you love me too well, I hope, to think of another while I am with you? Sweet Victoria, exclaimed Berenza, that is spoken like yourself. The Signora Megalina must now be tranquil. She must, for she will see us together, and it will be beyond her power to separate us. Yesterday I had visited at her house. She knew the color of my habit for the carnival. Her eyes, no doubt, followed me everywhere, and had she perceived my attention attracted to you, she would either have had you entrapped and conveyed out of my reach, or have followed me even into my apartment like a vengeful fury. Therefore it was I conveyed you into the palazzo by a secret way, wholly unknown even to her. But let us dismiss this unworthy subject. Once for all, Victoria, be assured it is not in the power of a Magalina to attract me from thee. I have known her, tis true. She has been the companion of my looser hours, but she was never the mistress, the beloved, acknowledged friend of Berenza. No, it is not enough for me that my mistress should be admired by men. They must envy me in their hearts the possession of her. She whom Berenza can love must tower above her sex. She must have nothing of the tittering coquette, the fastidious prude, or the affected idiot she must abound in the graces of mind as well as of body for i prize not the woman who can yield only to my arms a lovely insipid form which the veriest boar in nature can enjoy in as much perfection as myself my mistress too must be mine exclusively heart and soul others may gaze and sigh for her but must not dare approach it is she too who while her beauty attracts must have dignity sufficient to repel them. If she forfeit for a moment her self-possession, I cast her for ever from my bosom. But if, he added, with increasing energy, it be within the verge of possibility that she forfeit her honor, then, oh, then, her blood alone can wash out her offense. Victoria, grasping her hand, dost thou mark me? Hast thou courage? Hast thou firmness? to become the friend, the mistress of Berenza? Victoria smiled with ineffable dignity. She laid her hand upon the arm of Berenza and said, Yes, I have courage to become everything to you. Why these doubts, these stipulations, Berenza? She pursued with a serious air. But thou must love me, Victoria, me alone, said Berenza, fixing his eyes upon her countenance. And do I not, my lord, love you alone, she said? Not certainly, not enough, he replied. Thou art a stranger to the turnings and windings of thine own heart, mentally added he. Then, rising hastily, he took the hand of Victoria. 
"'Retire,' he said, in a gentle voice. "'Retire to repose, and tomorrow we shall meet again.' He led her to the door, and saluted her hand. How few in character resemble Berenza! Yet in such perfection are some minds regulated, ultimately enhancing, by their forbearance, the pleasures they obtain. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Zofloya》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nila, Iowa City, Iowa.《Zofloya》by Charlotte Dacre。Chapter Ten。Some time passed on bus, and still Berenza, languishing for positive conviction of Victoria's love for him. Continued to treat her as a beloved and innocent sister, rather than as a destined mistress, for though his taste in female beauty led him to view that of Victoria with the eye of an enraptured amateur, still he was too scrupulously refined to accept the privilege fortune had thrown in his way, or anticipate by premature encroachment the smallest of pleasures he promised himself for the future when she should prove to him. Delightful idea that her heart was intrinsically his, charmed as he was by the boldness of her natural character, charmed as he was with the graces of her face and figure. Yet was Berenza a man of too proud a mind to be swayed to a conduct that his peculiar delicacy contemned. In vain would he sometimes seek for a trait of innocent tenderness in the countenance of Victoria. Something that should convince him he was beloved. No, hers was not the countenance of a Madonna. It was not of angelic mould. Yet, though there was a fierceness in it, it was not certainly a repelling, but a beautiful fierceness, dark, noble, strongly expressive. Every lineament bespoke the mind which animated it. True. No mild, no gentle, no endearing virtues were depicted there, but while you gazed upon her, you observed not the want of any charm. Her smile was fascination itself, and in her large dark eyes, which sparkled with incomparable radiance, you read the traces of a strong and resolute mind, capable of attempting anything undismayed by consequences, and well and truly did they speak. Her figure, though above the middling height, was symmetry itself. She was as the tall and graceful antelope. Her air was dignified and commanding, yet free from stiffness. She moved along with head erect and with step firm and majestic. Nor was her carriage ever degraded by levity or affectation. Living under his roof, almost perpetually in his company, she became daily a more dangerous object to the peace and to the forbearance of Berenza. Yet even in those times when his ideas and actions were least subject to the control of his reason, it was but for an instant to admit the tormenting reflection that perhaps she felt not for him a genuine and ardent affection, for a sudden gloom to take possession of him and overspread his countenance. The singularity of his conduct surprised Victoria. She endeavored to investigate the cause and to trace, if possible, the workings of his mind. To this end, she watched with scrutinizing eye every movement, every look. She listened to and weighed every word he spoke. Then, combining the whole, discovered ere long the secret which pressed upon his feelings. What then would she exclaim, confiding her reflections to her pillow? Berenza fears that I love him not. This idea, then, is the grand source of his constrained, mysterious conduct towards me. Then, reverting to herself, she examined the state of her heart respecting him. And do I not, then, love Baranza? she said. I know not, nor what may be the precise nature of love. But this I know, that I prefer him to all men, that I think him elegant and accomplished, and that if death snatched him from me, I should grieve. 
true, my sensations towards him have nothing ardent in them, nor do I feel that oppression of soul, that doubt, that uneasiness, respecting his attachment for me, that he seems to entertain of mine. Yes, I feel it is requisite to my future prospects, to those plans and views, yet vague and indefinite, which are floating in my brain, that he should not entertain any, not the smallest doubts of my regard for him. I must endeavor, then, to suit my conduct to the fastidious delicacy of his ideas. So reasoned, from combined inferences, the subtle Victoria. True indeed it was, she did not love the scrupulous, the refined Berenza. She was incapable of loving such a man. Nay, she was by nature unfitted to admit so soft, so pure a sentiment as real love. Victoria's heart was a stranger to every gentle, noble, or superior feeling. The ambitious, the selfish, the wild, and the turbulent were hers. Hers were the stormy passions of the soul, goading on to ruin and despair. Berenza's were mild, philosophic, though proudly tenacious. His were as the even stream, calm yet deep. Hers as the foaming cataract rushing headlong from the rocky steep, and raging in the abyss below. She was not susceptible of a single sentiment, vibrating from a tender movement of the heart. She could not feel gratitude. She could not, therefore, feel affection. She could inflict pain without remorse, and she could utterly revenge the slightest attempt to inflict it on herself. The wildest passions predominated in her bosom, to gratify them, she possessed an unshrinking, relentless soul that would not startle at the darkest crime. Unhappy girl, whom nature organized when offended with mankind, and whom education but might have corrected, tended only to confirm in depravity. Berenza, as before has been remarked, was the only man who had ever paid her particular attention. Consequently, it was natural that what feeling of preference she was capable of entertaining should be given to him. She voluntarily sought his protection, because she knew not whom else to solicit. She remained under his roof, for she knew not of another, and though any heart but hers would have been deeply and enthusiastically affected by the nobleness and delicacy of conduct he had, under all these circumstances, observed towards her, Yet did she remain wholly unimpressed, nor was a single idea awakened by it that did not revert to self. She saw only that it would be necessary and politic to answer his sincere and honorable love, at least with an appearance equally ardent and sincere. The peculiar cast of Berenza's disposition was in reality melancholy, somber, and reflective though in society seeming gay and careless. She then must become melancholy, retired, and abstracted. Berenza would hence be induced to scrutinize the cause. Artifice on her side, and natural self-love on his, would easily make him attribute it to the effects of a violent and concealed love. Thus would an explanation be the result, and the reserve, the doubts, the hesitations of Berenza at an end. Her plan arranged, she entered on it gradually. Her eyes, no longer full of the wild and beautiful animation, were taught to languish or to fix for hours with musing air upon the ground. Her gait, no longer firm and elevated, became hesitating and despondent. She no longer engrossed the conversation. She became silent, apparently absent, and plunged in thought. It was now Berenza who had to call her from a melancholy abstraction to inquire if any hidden uneasiness preyed upon her mind. Victoria saw, exultingly saw, the gradual operation of her plan. New and rapturous ideas, scarcely admitted even to himself, began to occupy the soul of Berenza, but as yet he spoke not. He hoped not. He was slow because he was fearful to believe. It was one night, after a day of well-acted gloom and oppression of spirits, that Victoria, having left the apartment occupied by the Comte, retired into the saloon 
and throwing herself upon a sofa near one of the windows, enjoyed the delicious fresco of the evening. She had not been long in this situation, before Baranza, unable to bear her absence, determined to seek her in the saloon, and perceiving her reclined upon a sofa, imagined she slept. Closing gently the door, therefore, he softly approached her. In an instant, an idea had glanced across the mind of Victoria. She determined to avail herself of this circumstance and of Berenza's mistake. Shutting her eyes, she affected in reality to be asleep. The Comte drew near, and gazing upon her for a few moments, he seated himself beside her. Oh, Victoria, in a low voice, he tenderly said, Why, why, my love, art thou unhappy? Oh, that I, that I might only hope I were the envied cause. Ah, oh, were it indeed so, Berenza would be too happy. He paused. Victoria, as if disturbed in her sleep, heaved a broken sigh, faintly giving utterance to the name of oh, Berenza. Berenza scarcely ventured to breathe. Why wilt thou not love me, Berenza? she murmured. Berenza's heart beat high. He drew his breath quick. Victoria was sensible of his emotion. One word more, thought she. Indeed, indeed, Berenza, I love thee, she articulated, starting up and stretching out her arms as if under the impression of her dream, attempting to embrace him, when opening her eyes and affecting surprise and shame at the sight of Berenza, she covered her face with her hands and turned aside. The violent emotion of Berenza was such that for some moments he was deprived of the power of speech. The blood rushed from his heart to his head. His senses became confused when, seizing wildly in his arms, the artful Victoria, he exclaimed in a hurried accent, Thou art mine. Yes, I know now that thou art mine. Proud of her achievement, it was Victoria's care that her lover should not recover from his delusion. Well did she support the character she had assumed, and the tender, refined Berenza became convinced that he possessed the first pure and genuine affections of an innocent and lovely girl. End of chapter 10《ハプター・レヴン・オブ・サフロイア》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa. Safloya by Charlotte Dacre. Chapter 11. Berenza became daily more attached to Victoria. His scrupulous doubts, his reserves, Wholly vanished, and fondly he flattered himself that he was as much the possessor of her dearest affections as she was the mistress over his. Still, though his love for her was carried in some respects to a romantic height, his pride forbade him to marry her. There was a certain stigma in his idea attached to her through the misconduct of her mother, which it was impossible for his delicate mind to overlook. Of this sentiment, however, the haughty Victoria was unconscious, and she simply imagined that her present union with the Comte was chosen by him expressly for the purpose of convincing her that his devotion towards her needed not the aid of artificial ties to rivet it. Under this impression, her vain spirit was flattered, and little did she ever suppose that while the proud Venetian deemed her worthy of becoming his mistress, He conceived her unfit for the high distinction of becoming his wife. It was one beautiful evening that, accompanied by the admired Victoria, Berenza and his splendid gondola mixed with the gay concourse upon the Laguna. Everyone appeared exhilarated, and Victoria, gazing around, felt in the moment that she excited the admiration so dear to her soul. That she required nothing more in the power of man to bestow. While her eyes still wandered, exacting attention from all, a gondola passed close by that of Berenza's. 
it contained only one female besides the gondoliere, who, in the moment of rapidly passing, fixed her eyes upon Victoria with a rage and malignity so exquisitely bitter that it was impossible, momentary as was the glance, that its expression could be mistaken. For an instant, Victoria was awakened from her dream of vanity. She looked at Berenza, but perceiving from the unaltered expression of his countenance that he had not observed the circumstance, she thought it too insignificant to advert to, and other objects soon made her forget it altogether. At length they returned home, and the evening was concluded with a convivial party and a dance, to which many were invited but had not been present during the early part of the evening. At a late hour the company separated, and Victoria and the Comte retired to repose. Victoria, however, felt no inclination to sleep. The festive scenes of the evening passed in mirthful review before her. The music sounded in her ears, and the dancers still figured in her sight. She skimmed over in her mind the adulation, the elegant and well-turned compliments she had received, and in idea again she enjoyed and smiled at them. Then she reverted to her evening's amusement on the Laguna, and, on reverting to that, she suddenly remembered the look she had received from the female who had passed so swiftly by. She was on the point of mentioning to the Comte this circumstance, but, perceiving that overcome by wine and the fatigue of the evening, he slept, she would not awaken him, and pursued the diversified current of her ideas. Still, however, she could not lose the remembrance of this malignant glance, and was embarrassing herself in vain conjectures as to the cause which should induce any one to view her with particular rancor, when a gentle rustling at the further end of the chamber caught her attention. This interrupted her thoughts and called them to external objects. The bed on which she lay was surmounted by a superb canopy, the curtains were drawn on each side, but remained open to the foot. The rustling increased. She fixed her eyes on the opposite side of the room, where a large window jutted out and opened into a balcony on the outside. The window itself was concealed by a thick curtain. By degrees, this curtain was moved a little on one side. Half the figure of a man became visible, and presently the whole. The chamber was faintly enlightened by a lamp and she observed as softly though with long strides the figure approached that his face was concealed by a mask at length he reached the side of the bed at which the conch slept and gently divided the curtains victoria firmly now believed some evil was intended yet feared to awaken berenza lest his surprise and alarm by depriving him of the requisite presence of mind should hasten any attempt against him, which she hoped herself, by being awake and remaining tranquil, to circumvent. The intruder now stood at the side of the bed and paused. Then, stooping down, he examined earnestly the face of the Count, the countenance of Victoria he could not see, for her arm was thrown over her head in such a manner that her hand concealed her eyes, though she could observe all that passed, and the lower part of her face was shaded by the covering. The stranger, however, appeared to imagine that she slept, appeared to imagine that she slept, for drawing a dagger from his bosom, he waved it to and fro near the closed eyes of the unconscious Berenza, then gently uncovering his bosom, approached the point of the dagger towards it, his hand appeared to tremble, he stifled a sigh, and retreated a few steps. Then again he drew nearer, with his left hand he held back the curtain, and raising his right, as if with sudden resolution, he prepared to strike. Just as the dagger was descending, the undaunted and watchful Victoria caught his wrist. The force of the intended blow being thus broken, the assassin, who was in an inclining attitude, lost his equilibrium, and falling across the bed, the point of the dagger entered the shoulder of Victoria. At this instant the Comte awakened. His first impulse was to seize the man, but he struggled violently 
and Baranza being unable to obtain a firm hold, shackled as he was by the weight of his body, which lay across him, he contrived swiftly to disengage himself. As he did so, he could not, however, prevent his mask from falling off. He sought to recover it and rush from the spot, but ere he could achieve his purpose, the eyes of the wounded and fainting Victoria were riveted upon a countenance that memory immediately identified for her brother, that brother who, on the desertion of his mother from her home, had fled the paternal roof and now was recognized as an intended murderer, monstrous assassin, she feebly exclaimed, while Leonardo, with horror depicted in his countenance, fled across the apartment, and, gaining the window, appeared to precipitate himself from it. Berenza, now released, started from the bed, but as he was flying after the assassin, a faint groan from Victoria arrested him. He turned and beheld the bedclothes dyed in blood. The sight distracted him. You are wounded, my life, he frantically exclaimed. Only slightly, my lord, murmured Victoria, but I do, I do not regret it. Berenza in agony vociferated for assistance he dispatched the servants fifty different ways for medical aid then taking victoria in his arms he examined the wound while the big tears of love and anguish fell upon her bosom ah oh, do not weep baranza faintly ejaculated victoria i would suffer ten thousand times more to prove my love to thee nay i rejoice to prove it and in fact victoria did rejoice for she felt that the wound obtained in defense of her lover's life and of which her firm mind entertained no apprehensions would bind him inseparably to her the triumph she experienced then when she beheld his violent anguish more than repaid her for the pain she felt she essayed to take his hand and press it to her bosom but all her firmness all her contempt of pain could not conquer the weakness of nature, and she fainted from loss of blood. The Count was half mad. The medical men arrived. They dressed the wound. They announced that it was not dangerous, and that repose and quiet would, in all probability, avert the appearance of fever. By degrees she recovered from her temporary insensibility. The Count seated himself by her bedside and gazed in agony upon her. She turned her eyes upon him, the brilliancy of which had given place to a seducing languor that penetrated Berenza's inmost soul. And in his mind he vowed that his whole life henceforth should be dedicated to her happiness. He now felt that she was dearer, far dearer to him than he had ever imagined. On the noble and enthusiastic soul of Berenza, the conduct of Victoria had wrought the most powerful effect. Such cool intrepidity, such contempt of her own life in the defense of his, the patience, nay the pleasure, with which she bore the unhappy consequences of her courage. What woman in existence, thought he, would have done thus much for me. These reflections swelled his heart with a love almost idolatrous, and his violent feeling sought relief in an irrepressible gush of tears. Victoria determined carefully to conceal from her lover her conviction that the intended assassin was her brother. A certain indefinable feeling prevented her from confessing her knowledge, and she was fain to rejoice in his escape. But of his motives for an attempt so heinous, she could not form the smallest idea. As for Berenza, he merely concluded that he was some daring and determined robber who might easily have obtained an entrance into the house during the careless festivity that had generally prevailed during the evening. But respecting a circumstance that he now deemed immaterial, he gave himself but little concern. His whole thoughts were concentrated in Victoria, and he looked forward with impatient anxiety to the much-desired period of her recovery. Scarcely could he be prevailed on to quit her bedside, even to obtain necessary repose. 
and what little food he could be induced to take was taken without stirring from her chamber. In a few days, however, to reward such unwearied anxiety, Victoria was enabled to leave her bed, and by marks of attachment, apparently more strong than ever, repaid the care and tenderness of her lover, raised by her seducing manners to a pitch of enthusiasm. But Remza sometimes wavered in his pride, and almost determined that he would make her his wife, the moment that her re-established health should permit him to do so. One day, while sitting with her in her apartment, a fortnight having nearly elapsed since the accident which had confined her there, a letter was delivered by a servant into his hands. Opening it, he read as follows. Wretch, by the time you receive this, I shall be far from pursuit, if such your meanness or your revenge should lead you to attempt. No, that it was I who directed to your faithless and unworthy breast that hand which failed in executing its office. It was I who intended and who hoped that the accursed stiletto which erred in its duty should have found a bloody sheath in the recesses of your heart. Yes, miscreant, it was Megalina who beheld on you. Yes, miscreant, it was Megalina who beheld you on the Laguna, accompanied by the minion whose temerity robbed her of your love. Oh, and if a look could kill, mine should have blasted her to the earth. What durst you openly exhibit your novelty and believe that your audacity should remain unpunished? Did you not know me? You should have carefully guarded your late-found gem. You should not have suffered her to sparkle in the light of day, in the eyes of Strozzi. But she, and even you, for the present have eluded my vengeance. Yet, ah, my heart beats. It revives in the faint hope that she perhaps may not have escaped. If it be not so, nothing shall bind me to life but the dearly cherished hope that the time will yet arrive when no barrier shall intercept the blow I would aim at your life. No, not even the hated form of your newly acquired love. Couldst thou indeed hope, fond fool, that with impunity thou mightest despise the passion and insult the feelings of Megalina Strozzi? Vile and abandoned wanton! exclaimed Berenza. Is it then even so? And is it to thee, and to thy absurd and insolent jealousy, that I am to attribute my present misfortune? But it is well, he continued, the worthless fury will molest us no more. She has left Venice. As he concluded, he gave the letter to Victoria, who, after hastily perusing it, exclaimed, That look! That look, then, which so strongly impressed my mind, is now accounted for. It was Megalina Strozzi, who would have blasted me to the earth. Then, turning towards Berenza, she explained to him the circumstance to which she alluded, and which, at the moment of its occurrence, so forcibly called her attention, nay, had even employed her thoughts just before the projected attempt upon his life took place. While she spoke, Berenza did indeed recognize the vindictive Florentine, but anxiously, though silently, did Victoria ransack her brain to discover what connection could possibly subsist between this female and her brother, a connection evidently of no slight nature, that could already so deeply have influenced his character and conduct as to drive him to the intended commission of murder to the very brink of destruction for her sake, recurring frequently to vain surmises upon the subject and rapidly recovering from the effects of her wound. For the present, let us leave her to explain certain events which will carry us back to an earlier period of this history. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Sefloya this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa. Sofloya by Charlotte Dacry. Chapter 12. 
It may be remembered that when detailing the misfortunes which befell the family of Lorandani, in consequence of the desertion of Lorena, from her husband and children to the arms of an adulterer, we related at that epoch the sudden flight of the young Leonardo from his paternal roof, to which he had never more returned. It is his progress from that time and the events which led him ultimately to determine on the commission of the most horrible of crimes that we are now going briefly to revert to. The high and susceptible feelings which actuated the bosom of this youth, when little more than sixteen years of age, caused him, under their uncontrollable influence, to rush from the house of his father as soon as he learned the unfortunate dereliction from the path of honor of his other parent. Scarcely to the youth himself were his sensations definable, but his naturally soaring spirit, unbroken by restraint, strengthened too by the high notions of family honor which the Marquez had delighted to inculcate in the heir of his house and fortunes, gave him a feeling confused and agonized, that to remain longer on the spot where his mother had heaped disgrace upon her ruined family would be vile and unworthy. Impressed with this idea, he took his rash determination. It was to fly from Venice, never perhaps to behold it more. In the shortest possible time, he endeavored to accelerate his distance from a city now grown hateful to him, and to lose by motion and change of scene the uneasy reflections that oppressed his proud but noble heart. Even to fly from Venice was not enough. To remain near it was death to his soul. Nor did he for an hour intermit the rapidity of his movements until, almost without knowing, certainly without designing it, he found himself in the delightful country of Tuscany, awakened to cooler recollection. Here, then, he energetically exclaimed, here, then, I may breathe without an oppression of the heart. And here, too, necessity compelled him to rest, for the enthusiastic youth, careless of the future, when he left his luxurious home, was but scantily supplied with money and all he had possessed was by this time expended. And what then, he cried, as sober reason suggested this reflection to his mind, better to die in exile in the furthest corner of the globe, better to die in poverty and want than live in a luxury which the soul despises. It was evening, and the young Leonardo reclined pensively on the bank of the majestic Arno. The sun had sunk in the west, and misty shadows were collecting upon the mountains. For the first time, he began to reflect upon his situation, whither he must now continue to bend his steps, and how he should support life, having thus cast himself upon a friendless world. His thoughts became painful and embarrassing. He sought again to lose them in activity and spring hastily from his recumbent posture. He had not proceeded far ere he beheld a large and elegant mansion, which from the extreme beauty of its architecture, standing too wholly by itself, riveted his attention. He continued to approach, and when he drew near, stopped involuntarily to contemplate it. While he was thus employed, a gentleman of a noble and superior appearance came from the house, and being attracted by the animated countenance and figure of Leonardo, he was induced to approach him and inquire by what chance he had wandered to this beautiful solitude. Leonardo replied firmly and without hesitation that he was a youth whom misfortunes not to be explained, had driven from his home, and that he was straying. He neither knew nor was solicitous whither. Struck by the singularity of this reply, in which there was something to interest an expanded mind, the stranger, 
who was called Signor Zoppi, felt impelled to increase, if possible, his acquaintance with the youth, whom chance had thus introduced to his attention. Well, my young friend, he said, if you will enter my mansion, which seems to have attracted your notice, we may have some conversation that perhaps may not prove unsatisfactory to either of us. Your appearance and manner please me, and I should feel happy to know more of you. To this frank invitation, the warm-hearted youth readily assented, and accepting with an ingenuous air the proffered hand of Signor Zoppi, they entered the house together. Leonardo was conducted into an elegant apartment, where, desiring him to be seated, Signor Zoppi inquired of him if he stood in need of refreshment. Leonardo replied in the negative. Some indifferent conversation then ensued, when, though with the utmost delicacy, his liberal host expressed a desire to be informed of his name. The youth blushed. My name, he replied, is Leonardo. That which is subjoined to it, I must be excused from revealing. Circumstances have impelled me to leave my home, and as I feel it impossible, Signor, utterly impossible, he added, rising hastily from his chair, to gratify a curiosity so proper and so natural for you to feel respecting one you have admitted beneath your roof. I will, with your permission, take my leave and no longer intrude upon your hospitality. That must not be indeed, my young friend, answered Signor Zoppi. There is that in your appearance and manner, as I have said, which interests me considerably. Keep then your secret, if you wish it, and since you are avowedly at present a child of fortune, indifferent and undecided whither you bend your course, remain for a short time where chance has directed you, and forbear, young and enthusiastic as you appear, to cast yourself upon the careless world. Leonardo's heart was penetrated with gratitude at the kind words of the benevolent stranger. His dreadful, and as he conceived it disgraceful, family secret, his pride shrunk from acknowledging. But feeling in an instant the good fortune he experienced in having met in the forlornness of his situation, one who appeared inclined to befriend him, he cast himself at the feet of Zoppi, unable to restrain his tears. This excellent being, whose philanthropic heart led him to seek every opportunity, not only of befriending his species, but, if possible, of preserving them from ill, was deeply affected. That the nature of the youth was noble, he easily conceived that some sentiment of a high and honorable, though perhaps misguided, tendency had induced him to fly his home, he likewise believed. Therefore, gently, raising him in his arms, he said, Come then, Leonardo, I desire to know you by no other name. Come, let us quit this room, and, as a son of a friend, I will introduce you to my wife and daughter. The wife of Zoppi, however, chanced to be, in every respect, the reverse of her husband, for she possessed an intriguing spirit and a profligate heart. But it is not intended to dwell minutely upon every progressive incident that befell the young Leonardo, to skim lightly, on the contrary, over all, excepting that, which led to his connection with Megalina Strozzi is the present purpose. The Signor Zoppi then daily grew more attached to the youth of his adoption. When absent, his conversation to his wife teemed with his praises. When present, he continually sought modes of drawing forth his character, and every trait he discovered added to the warm impression that his pristine ingenuousness had made upon his benevolent mind. It so happened, unfortunately, 
that Zoppy was not singular in his admiration of the youth, for he had not been very long an inmate in his house before the Signora Zoppy became a warmer eulogist in his favor than even her husband. She paid him beside the most pointed attentions. Yet it was not his ardent character, his talents, or his virtues which attracted her distinguished regard. No, it was the charms of his person, the beauty of his form and face, which had drawn towards him her attention. And true it is, they displayed a manliness and grace far above his years. Yet, not similarly disposed in her favor was the object of her growing passion. His admiration, his thoughts, and all he knew of love was bestowed upon Amamia, her lovely and more approximating daughter. This, to her dismay, the wife of Zoppi soon discovered, but bent upon carrying her point, she resorted to all the fascination of dress, to the allurements of softness, and the most tender attentions. But all this, too, might the more forcibly impress his mind, she, as much as possible, upon various pretexts, remove the fair Amamia from his view. Still, all was unavailing. The youth felt gratitude for the kindness shown him by the wife of his friend, but he felt no more. About a year had now elapsed since his first introduction to the house of Zoppi, yet still the secret of his alienation from home was locked in the recesses of his heart, guarded by an impenetrable aegis of punctilious pride and delicacy. The good Zoppi, indeed, had long ceased to hint at any desire for information upon the subject. He felt happy in the society of the youth, and he required no painful acknowledgments on his side for the friendship he had delighted to shew him. He had never yet, from any act or any conduct of Leonardo, had occasion to regret his intimacy in his family. No trait of vice, of meanness, or ingratitude had ever yet exhibited themselves in his character. Zoppi was a plain and pure professor of morality, as well as a benevolent being, and if he had had reason to suspect aught amiss in the heart of his young friend, painful as would have been the task, he would have felt it his duty to drive him from beneath his roof, lest, by appearing to protect and cherish vice, he should inculcate lessons of dangerous tendency into the mind of his daughter, and by an inevitable progression injure rather than benefit society. The passion of Zoppi's wife had by this time grown to such a height that she felt it utterly impossible longer to conceal it from the object that had inspired it. She determined, therefore, whatever the consequence, to make it known to him. For this purpose she seized an opportunity when her husband and the fair Amamia were absent to follow him into the garden, whither he had retired, to think without interruption, and with all the enthusiasm of an innocent first love upon his mistress. As he reclined upon a seat, he beheld coming towards him the mother of her he loved, and respectfully he would have risen, but as she drew near him, gently laying her hand upon his shoulder, she prevented him from doing so, and seated herself beside him. You were absorbed in thought, Leonardo said she. I was indeed, answered the youth, blushing. You were thinking of her you love, I wager, pursued the wanton wife of Zappi, and heaved a sigh, fixing upon him her eyes at the same time, in which were depicted the troubled emotions of her agitated soul. Leonardo, who was thinking of Amamia, re-echoed her sigh. The sigh was electric fluid through her breast and fanned the fires which were raging in her heart. She took his hand and, fervently pressing it, said, You are beloved in return. Yes, Leonardo, most charming of youths, 
You are indeed beloved. Are you certain? replied the transported boy, springing from his recumbent attitude. Oh, I am but too certain, frantically replied the degraded female, falling at his feet and thrown completely off her guard. You are beloved, oh, how madly, by me, by you, signora, cried the astonished youth. You jest, surely. Rise, rise, I beseech you, from your unbecoming posture, unbecoming towards me, he sternly added. Oh, Leonardo, I love, I adore you, cried the abandoned wife. Spurn me not, then, I conjure you, for I cannot, cannot conquer the fatal passion with which you have inspired me. Signora Zappi, you strike me with horror, exclaimed the youth. It is your daughter, it is your blooming daughter that I love. What? And will you never love me, boy? In an accent of rage and grief she cried. No, never while I have breath, never, emphatically replied Leonardo, disengaging himself from her wild embrace. Allow me, if possible, to respect you. Curses then seize thee, miscreant, shrieked the wife of Zoppi in an agony of rage and disappointment, and casting her from her with vehemence. I will live to blast thee for this. Most infamous of women, returned Leonardo passionately. Let me fly from thy loathed presence. Let me again in the wide world seek a refuge from infamy and shame. For infamy it is to be the object of thy love. So saying, with impetuosity, he rushed from the spot and would have fled from the house altogether. But that a thought of Amamia darting across his mind, he felt an irresistible desire to see her once more, ere he quitted forever a roof that had sheltered him so long. He therefore hastened to his chamber, where he determined to abide till the arrival of Zappi and his daughter. Meantime, his disappointed enamorata, rendered half frantic by the contempt and indignation with which her abandoned overtures had been received, resolved in the tumultuous vengeance of her soul to destroy and blacken the youth whose virtue she had failed to corrupt, or it was not virtue that actuated him, but merely that the temptation offered him was not sufficient to seduce it. Still, the reflection was, in either case, maddening and humiliating, and how she might most bitterly cause him to repent his conduct was now her sole consideration. At length, the demon of hate and revenge suggested to her a plan sufficiently diabolical. With eager and triumphant malice, she instantly began tearing her apparel to tatters. Then taking some gravel between her hands, careless of pain, in pursuance of her revenge, she rubbed it with violence over her face and hands till the blood flowed, and in this state determined to await the return of her husband. Presently she heard him arrive. She flew round the garden, and as he entered the house, met him at the door, and cast herself as if in an agony of shame and horror before him. Zappi, who tenderly loved his wife, was shocked and dismayed. He caused her to be carried into the house and laid upon a bed, and then tremblingly entreated to be informed what terrible event had befallen her. The false and unworthy wife then motioned for everyone to withdraw, and pressing with seeming love and agitation his hand to her lips, she replied thus to his anxious enquiries. Oh, my beloved husband, that scorpion we have nourished so long. Behold, what has been our reward? 
It is to that audacious, that hypocritical stripling you must attribute what you now behold. Finding me alone in the garden, he first presumed to insult me with professions of a dishonorable love. I rebuked the saucy boy and attempted to rise, when suddenly seizing me in his arms, I found my strength unequal to his. I shrieked aloud. He became, I suppose, apprehensive of discovery, and fled from the garden, leaving his infamous purpose unaccomplished. The wife of Zappi ceased, and bursting into tears, as if oppressed with a sense of shame, covered her face with her hands depraved, ungrateful viper, exclaimed the deluded Zoppy. Could I ever have imagined of thee this? But instantly shall he know. First he shall appear before us and be forced to reply whether sudden madness or deliberate villainy impelled to this criminal attempt. So saying, Zoppy, summoning a servant, bade him tell the young Leonardo that his presence was immediately desired. At this mandate, the infamous wife of Zoppi felt somewhat alarmed, but resolving to persevere in her plot, she offered no objection. In the course of a few moments, the youth entered the room. He started on beholding the maimed figure of his accuser, but his step was firm and unhesitating. His eye was open, and on his blooming cheek, Guilt had set no mark. Wretch, began Signor Zappi, unmindful of these appearances, tallying so little with imputed crime. Wretch, dare you to appear before me with that audacious front? See there your work, young but most infamous monster, so green in years, so old in the basest profligacy. What? Might not the wife of your benefactor have been held sacred by you? Durst you endeavor to break through the nearest and the dearest connections that are respected between man and man? Could you trample thus on every principle of honor and of gratitude? Attempt the subversion of moral order and trespass upon sacred social affinities? Worthless profligate and unfeeling boy! Quit instantly a roof which has sheltered you too long, and never let me more behold your face. During this bitter language, which was addressed to him, Leonardo made no attempt to speak. He folded his arms upon his bosom, and as the deluded Zoppi proceeded, he saw the depth of the plot which had been imagined against him by his depraved wife. The instinctive pride, however, of his nature spurned at the unmerited imputations which had been cast upon him and the poignant invective with which they were accompanied. He scorned, proudly scorned, to attempt a vindication, and perhaps a magnanimous sentiment of gratitude made him desire to spare his friend and benefactor too accurate information of his wife's depravity, if such his indignation would have allowed him to listen to. Therefore, when he perceived that he had concluded, in a gentle but firm voice, he thus replied, I am ready, Signor Zappi, to depart your house. I thank you for all the favors you have conferred on me, and wish you may never experience from others greater ingratitude than you have met for me. So saying, he bowed respectfully and moved towards the door, yet ere he quitted the room, turning his eyes full upon the wife of Zappi, he looked at her for a moment with such dignity and scorn blended that her soul trembled within her, and involuntarily she passed her hand over her eyes. With firm and majestic step, he retired. His first impulse led him to the chamber he had been taught to call his. There, with swelling heart but tearless eye, he placed with indignant eagerness upon a table every trinket he had about him, which his benefactor, in the plenitude of fond affection, had bestowed upon him. Of money 
he retained not a mervidi. Then, unlocking a drawer, where on first becoming an inmate in the house of Signor Zappi, he had deposited, from a certain feeling at the moment indefinable, the clothes which he had worn on entering it, and the only ones he possessed, he cast off hastily those in which he was now clad, and substituted for them such of his own as his increased height and bulk would allow him to make use of. Bitterly did it corrode the heart of the youth that he could not, in like manner, return every benefit he had received. Yet since that was impossible, he could only determine to retain nothing that might be resigned. Then surveying himself from head to foot, with a mingled feeling, he exclaimed, These are they own, all too, that I can well call mine. Oh, mother, mother, for this I thank thee. Becoming now more violently agitated from succeeding reflections, he rushed from the chamber and fled hastily through the house. Once he stopped with the fond wish to take a last leave of the fair Amamia, but on the recollection that he must either expose to her the infamy of his mother or himself appear culpable in her eyes, he conquered the impulse and pursued his way hastily across the garden. Anxious to lose sight of the house, he halted not till he found himself at a considerable distance from it, and had walked at a rapid pace for several hours. Actual weariness at length compelled him for a moment to rest. The energy of his mind had till now supported him. He became conscious that he had walked many miles. Nature felt overpowered, and reluctantly he seated himself at the foot of a tree. Uneasy recollections began to enter his mind, with his head reclining on his hand, and voluntarily he suffered a deep gloom to take possession of him. It was past noon when he quitted the abode of Zappi. He now strained his tearful eyes and beheld the east beginning to be obscured by the shades of evening. His oppression increased, but his strength of mind shewed him the necessity of combating it. He started on his feet and turned his face to the west. There he beheld the glorious sun, declining indeed, but declining in a blaze of radiance. The sky around represented a thousand brilliant figures. The tops of the mountains, catching the last rays, reflected many different degrees of light and shade. The youth felt no longer overcome by melancholy. His heart cheated, painful ideas gave place to indefinite hopes, and he determined that he would no more indulge in the weakness of useless regret. Pursuing a path that chance alone directed, he soon found himself winding among those beautiful mountains whose beautiful bosoms are covered with olive and the luxurious vine. Wherever a beautiful villa met his eye, instinctively he turned aside. The shades of evening began to thicken, and the young exile from home was still, unsheltered for the night. At length, wandering onwards, he beheld, situated in a glen, a small and low-roofed cottage. To perceive it fully, it was even necessary to ascend a considerable way the mountain at the foot of which it humbly rose. It was embosomed by trees and surrounded by a garden, seeming the abode of industrious poverty rather than the seclusion of romantic whim. At all events, Leonardo shunned it not, but resolved to investigate it nearer and ascertained by whom it was inhabited. As he continued to approach, the voice of moaning and distress sounded on his ear. This hastened his steps, and he speedily gained the little narrow path which led to the cottage. There, seated outside of the door, he beheld an aged female, weeping and wringing her hands. Sorrow was in unison with the heart of the youth, and in a gentle voice he asked if her grief might admit of consolation and assistance. Alas, no, she answered, redoubling her tears. 
death admits no remedy. It has deprived me of my only hope and comfort in this world, of my poor Hugo, my darling son. Oh, Signor, that he should go before me. Who now will support my tottering limbs? Who provide for the short remnant of my days? Who work for, who befriend, the poor, forsaken Nina? But weep not so bitterly, good mother, said Leonardo. Admit me into your cottage, and if you will be kind enough to give me a draught of milk, we will talk further upon the subject of your sorrow. Perhaps things may not prove so bad as you at this moment apprehend. The voice of consolation is always sweet, but doubly sweet when coming from buoyant youth to age. The poor Nina rose with the utmost alacrity she possessed from her seat, and hobbling into her cottage, she sat in silence before him, while her tears continued, though more slowly, to flow, the best that her cottage afforded. When Leonardo had a little satisfied his hunger, for the almost unremitting fatigue he had undergone for the last seven or eight hours had completely exhausted him. He took the hand of his aged hostess, who involuntarily had seated herself beside him, and said, Tell me, my good mother, how old was your son Hugo? He was twenty, signor, on the blessed day of San Gaubert. And tell me, Nina. But Nina would not allow him to proceed. Oh, Santo Pedro! Was he not everything to poor Nina? Signor, I have a little garden, and Hugo it was who turned it to account. I have a vineyard too, and Hugo looked to it. But he would seldom leave his aged mother, Signor, for, Mother, he would say, it is better to give this or that or a little upon what we dispose of to Pietro or Varro, and let them manage for us than for me to leave you, Mother, who can't well help yourself. Signor, I have lately got a little the better of a terrible pain in my poor limbs, and now, oh, Mr. Ricordo, to lose my staff, my dear boy. Oh, Signor, I vex my heart, and think he works beyond his strength, for he was always weak and sickly from a dear child. Here, poor Nina was interrupted by her tears at the recollection of what her son had been to her. An idea had entered the mind of Leonardo while she spoke, which every moment acquired fresh force from a view of its eligibility. A garden to cultivate, a vineyard to attend, no occasion for public exposition in the market or even the town, her son in a declining state too, and yet capable of doing all that was necessary to be done. Surely I... He turned towards Nina, who was still bitterly lamenting. Come, worthy Nina, dry up your tears. What if I could supply to you the place of your son? Would you allow me to remain under your roof and accept of my best endeavors? Oh, Cielo, be praised, be adored for this, joyfully exclaimed the aged Nina, dropping on her knees and fervently kissing the ground. Oh, as I live, my heart began to feel lighter the, the instant I set my eyes upon you, and though I did continue to weep, Signor, weeping again, for my dear lost son Hugo, yet I vow and protest by the blessed Maria. I felt as if a ray of light shot through my breast. Well, rise now, my good Nina, and let us talk further. Nina, trembling, arose. You must give me some instructions, my good Nina, for though I understand sufficient of gardening, there are many things I shall require you to explain to me. This Nina, her heart almost bursting with conflicting joy and regret. Joy that she had found a protector, and regret that she had lost one. Readily promised. Some necessary conversation then ensued, and Leonardo, feeling within himself no doubt of success in his new situation, consented 
at an early hour to retire to repose, sensible of intense fatigue from the exertion of the day. The aged Nina conducted him to a little chamber which had appertained to her deceased son, and, with a heart infinitely lightened, Leonardo took possession of the homely bed which it contained. As he reclined his head upon the pillow, "'This is the second time,' he exclaimed, "'that the heir of Lorandani has been indebted to the benevolence of strangers for shelter.' that the humanity of strangers has compassionated his forlornness, and that the bounty of strangers has cherished and protected him. Oh, mother, mother, unkind, to thee and thee alone do I owe all this. With this bitter, though just reflection, burning at his heart, he fell asleep. And had the son of Lorena expired in that sleep, he would have appeared at the bar of heaven with an accusation against his mother registered in his heart. Let other mothers tremble at this reflection and pause on mediated guilt. End of chapter 12「while in the mansion of Zappi, he had obtained considerable knowledge with respect to gardening, from having, at leisure hours, resorted to it as an amusement. Signor Zappi, likewise, felt pleasure in giving him instructions, because he himself passed much of his time in botanizing, in planting, and trying various experiments upon the fecund earth. The young Leonardo had additional motives to strengthen his perseverance, for he felt, though he should in reality reap the benefits of his own exertions, that he laid himself under no obligations to be again, pitter reflection, reproached with them. He repaid by the service he rendered, the benefit he received. His proud heart was therefore at rest, and his spirit became even buoyant with pleasing anticipations that banished for a time the recollection of his real woes. Woes no less real, because his peculiar sentiments, whether romantic or otherwise, induced him to prefer their pressure to the ease and splendor which he would have deemed disgrace and infamy. Nothing assuredly calms the mind like a settled purpose. Leonardo had determined to persevere, while circumstances should render it expedient, in a course of labor and activity. Each successive day brought with it lighter, because more, habitual toil, with an increase of pleasure to his heart, in the conviction of being no idle member of society. In his knowledge superior to that of Hugo, the poor Nina soon discerned a multiplied advantage. Everything flourished beneath his fostering hand and excellent arrangement. His mind, warm and enthusiastic, slackened not in the pursuit of his object. He became gradually enamored of his peaceful, innocent, and industrious life, his humble retirement and total seclusion from the world. He felt no want. He'd received no favor. He beheld the little store of the aged Nina daily increasing, and— while he experienced the sweet reward of constant employ, his heart bounded for the first time with the exalting consciousness of being useful to a fellow creature. He anticipated the future, however, with a feeling of melancholy. His uncertain destination occasionally employed his thoughts. Can I always remain thus, he would exclaim? Alas, no. Yet surely these are halcyon days, but still I have an unquenched sentiment in my soul that tells me this forever though in itself laudable, would be an inglorious life for the heir of Lordani. What, said I, the heir of Lordani is disgraced. He may be happy, he may be honored in the shade, but despised, condemned if he offers to emerge in the betraying light of day. No, no, Lordani, the world is no place for thee in thine own character. Never mayest thou appear among men. These reflections sometimes overwhelmed his mind with gloom. He had then no refuge but in redoubled activity, resolving to allow himself no leisure for useless anticipation of future fate. It happened, however, one morning, that the aged Nina complained of an unwanted sensation. 
Towards noon it amounted to indisposition, and Leonardo, whom she had ever called her son, assisted her to her bed, from which she was doomed never more to arise. Of this, in a few hours, the worthy creature became conscious. She felt undeniable symptoms of approaching disillusion, and knew them for what they were. "'Alas!' said she feebly to the youth Leonardo. "'I feel, my beloved, my second son, that I have not long to survive, my dear Hugo. Let me behold thy sweet face in the moment of death, and let me bless thee with my last breath.' Leonardo was deeply affected. He beheld on the point of departing for ever, her who had admitted him unhesitatingly beneath her humble roof, to share of her little comforts, to the disposition of her trifling all. True, the event had rewarded her kindness, but that was not the consideration of the moment, of her genuine hospitality. Could he then forsake her lonely pillow? No longer than to procure every assistance, every necessary that might contribute to her ease, or tend, perhaps, to revive the feeble embers, yet lingering of life. But vain were his attentions, vain his endeavors, ere long extinct became every hope. After some hours of painful watching by her bedside, during which she had not spoken, and her breath had been heard to fluctuate, she, in a low, almost inarticulate voice, desired Leonardo to raise her in his arms. He obeyed with tender anxiety. "'All I have is thine,' she murmured making an effort to open her eyes and fix upon him her last look. No sooner had she beheld that ingenuous countenance than her wishes seemed fulfilled. Her head sunk heavy on his bosom, and she expired in his arms with the serenity of a child. Great was the grief of Leonardo. He summoned her few friends and neighbors who occupied here and there a cottage on the mountain to perform the last sad offices for his humble but affectionate friend. And feeling now the inutility of remaining on the spot, he resolved to defer his departure only till he had seen her decently consigned to the earth. In a few days, therefore, Leonardo, dividing her slight possessions among those who had obeyed his call at her decease, and reserving to himself only a trifling sum of money, the produce of his own labor since he had resided beneath her roof, he left the simple cottage where he had passed some happy hours, and, furnished with a small stock of provisions, once more renewed his wanderings. Of shelter for the night he was no longer solicitous, for his late toil and regular healthful habits had so far increased his hardihood and vigor that he no longer shrunk at reposing in the open air. Nor would he, he resolved, while possessed of sufficient for half a meal, attempt to enter the habitation of a man. Night at length overtook him. He threw himself carelessly upon the earth and began to reflect. The vagueness of his own intentions, the desultoriousness of his mode of life, forcibly struck him. It is now two years and three months, thought he, since I left my native city of Venice, since I left the disgraced abode of my father, that dear, that tender father who so much loved me. Since that, I have been once accused of the most dreadful crimes, and driven with ignominy from the shelter to which I had no claim. Then have I been inured to poverty and toil, and earned my bread like the meanest peasant, by the sweat of my brow. Now am I again an outcast on the wide expanse of creation, no friend, no home, nor a prospect of attaining bread for tomorrow's substance. Oh, mother, and all this for thee, he exclaimed, clasping his hands fervently together. Through thee I have endured all this. Now the probable fate of that mother, how his father had supported her loss, and the situation of his sister, with a thousand dear and tender recollections, pressed upon his mind. The fond wish of revisiting his home flashed across his mind, but scarcely at first would he admit the idea. Irresistibly, however, it hung around his heart. "'And why not, then?' said he at length, in an eager voice. "'Why not?' as he contemplated the alteration of his appearance. "'Who in the present hardy Leonardo, robust by toil, and browned by the fierce rays of the midday sun, and habited, too, in the coarse costume of the humble peasant, shall trace the once luxurious heir of Lordani. Yes, I am determined, he pursued, starting on his feet. I may with safety, without danger of being known, once more revisit my home. I can satisfy my mind respecting my unfortunate family, and then take of it an eternal adieu. 
He walked rapidly a few steps, forgetting in the enthusiasm of the moment that it was night. At length he grew calm. Early in the morning, then, said he mentally. Meantime, here is my bed. Once more he cast himself upon the earth, and sleep stealing over him soon calmed the agitation of his mind. Prompt was the decision, and prompt ever the execution of Leonardo. Leaving, at early dawn, the mountains of Tuscany behind him, he pursued his journey with the most eager rapidity that his humble means would allow, ever cautious that no one should suspect him for other than he appeared. Who can describe his sensations when he found himself even near the city of Venice? Yet he resolved not to enter it during the day, and when he arrived at Padua, determined to proceed as far as he could on foot, thinking by this means that it would be impossible for him to reach Venice before nightfall. Curbing his impatience, therefore, after taking some slight refreshment, he deliberately set out on his allotted task. But, notwithstanding that he walked, as he conceived, at a moderate pace, by the time he reached the extremity of the terra firma, he perceived the sun still far above the western hemisphere. He continued, therefore, slowly to wander along the borders of the lake, idly stopping to remark whatever villa or splendid domain attracted his eye, of which the Venetian nobility have many on the terra firma. At length, however, feeling somewhat weary, he threw himself upon the bed of the earth, to him no longer unfamiliar as such, and fell as usual into a train of thought. Tears involuntarily filled his eyes and coursed each other down his cheeks. He closed those eyes, filled as they were with tears, and ruminated over the sorrows of his youth. Ah, tears, painful as you were, as yet rising from an unpolluted heart, from a heart though bursting with grief, yet unstained by guilt. Why, why must it so soon become changed, destroyed, and plunged into an abyss of shame and infamy? Why art there doomed, Leonardo, to add another blot to the page which registers Lorena's crimes? Nature will often become exhausted by the intenseness of its own sensations. Leonardo sunk by degrees from keen feeling into a temporary insensibility. A soft sleep stole over his faculties, and he forgot for a time the unhappiness of his situation. While unconsciously he thus reposed, a female chanced to wander near the spot. She had quitted her house for the purpose of enjoying more fully the fresco of the evening, and to stroll along the banks of the lake. The young Leonardo, however, arrested her attention, and she softly approached to contemplate him. His hands were clasped over his head, and on his cheek where the hand of health had planted her brown-red rose, the pearly gems of his tears still hung. His auburn hair sported in graceful curls about his forehead and temples, agitated by the passing breeze. His vermeil lips were half open and disclosed his polished teeth. His bosom, which he had uncovered to admit the refreshing air, remained disclosed and contrasted by its snowy whiteness the animated hue of his complexion. Beautiful and fascinating, though in the simple garb of a peasant, did the wondering female consider the youth before her. Struck with lively admiration, she knew not how to quit the spot. When an insect suddenly alighting on his cheek, he started and awaked. Somewhat confused, he hastily arose, for the female that met his eyes appeared to him supremely beautiful. Approaching him gently, and with a smile, she laid her hand upon his arm, and in a gentle voice said, "'You appear a stranger here, and though your dress bespeaks inferiority of situation,' Pardon me if I distrust what it seems meant to convey. Without therefore deeming me impertinently curious, allow me to inquire whither you intend to bend your course, as the evening is already far advanced, and I know not of any house near this that could yield you accommodation for the night. This was the first beautiful and attractive female, save the innocent Amamia, whose attraction too was of a nature wholly different to that of hers before him who had ever addressed herself to the warm imagination of Leonardo. His cheeks became suffused with deepening blushes, and his eyes, which he longed to gaze upon her, were yet cast bashfully towards the earth. In a faltering voice he replied, while every consideration but of the object before him vanished from his mind. I have... No, I have not any particular destination for this night, signora, but I have... I have it in contemplation where to bend my course soon. At least I am solicitous. He stopped, unable to proceed from a confusion of idea. Well, but then, in a voice of tender anxiety, answered Megalina Strozzi, for her it was who addressed the youth, if you are not absolutely decided, 
if you are not particularly desirous of proceeding further to-night, perhaps you will for the present dine to enter my villa, and allow me the happiness of offering you a dwelling for the night. Leonardo raised his eyes and was about to reply, Come, I perceive you will not deny me, gaily resumed the fair Florentine, taking him lightly by the arm and leading him onwards. My house is but a small distance from hence. Look, you may behold it as you stand, she added, painting with her finger to a small and beautiful edifice built in the form of a pavilion. "'Impossible, lovely signora, to refuse you anything,' said the youth, enthusiastic at her charms and the gracefulness of her manner. "'Impossible to refuse you anything.' The fair Florentine only smiled and proceeded with alacrity, as though apprehensive that the youth should retract. They soon reached the villa, and a smothered sigh as he entered it was the last tribute paid to the memory of his neglected home. The character of Megalina Strozzi has already been so far revealed that to amplify upon it here, or to the excesses into which it perpetually hurried her, would be vain. Suffice to say that, enraptured with the novel graces of the young Leonardo, she spared no artifice or allurement to induce him to protract his stay beneath her roof. She devoted herself to fascinate and seduce him, and day after day contrived fresh causes to prevent his departure. By degrees these artifices, as Megalina had hoped they would, became unnecessary. It was now him who forbore to press up the subject, who sought excuses to remain, and who constantly trembled, lest the necessity of departing should be pointed out to him. It was not with the beautiful Megalina, as with the profligate wife of Zappi, for though equally depraved herself, she knew better how to disguise, beneath an artificial delicacy and refinement, the tumultuous wishes of her heart. It was not vainly, then, that she sought to seduce the imagination and lure the senses of the youth. No, he had in his own high-wrought feelings, in his susceptible soul, powerful and treacherous advocates in her cause. He beheld her with a mixed sentiment of admiration and passion, far different to the sentiments with which he had regarded the young Amamia. Those he had entertained for her were innocent, peaceful, and refined. For Megalina, turbulent, painful, wild, her charms kindled his soul. Amamias had filled it with a halcyon tenderness. His sensations for the one were like the burning heat of a fierce meridian sun, for the other like the gentle calmness of a summer eve. Megalina, who had only retired to the villa which she sat at presently occupied, with the intent to remain there for a few days, and that nearly on the account of a slight quarrel she had had with the Conte Berenza, wherein she had bitterly reproached him for the infrequency of his visits to her, now forgetting the cause of chagrin that induced her to leave Venice, found herself, from the delightful chance that had introduced Leonardo to her, inclined to protract her stay far beyond what she had originally intended. It so happened that about this time Barenza had recovered his beloved Victoria. The absence, therefore, of the fair Megalina remained not only unnoticed, but unknown. While she secretly congratulated herself upon the revenge she believed herself to be taking upon the indifference of Barenza towards her, Yet, indifferent as he was, the Florentine could not forget that she had loved him once with a passion almost equal to that which she now felt for Leonardo, and whether or not he still continued to repay her diminished regards with all the ardent gratitude she had the vanity to conceive her due for having once preferred him to all other men. She vowed in her heart that the hour in which she should discover in him a preference to another should be the last of his existence." Yet for her own conduct, she had no standard but her wishes. Inconstancy and duplicity towards him, from whom she presumed to require such implicit devotion, were esteemed as nothing. Her excesses, her irregularities, if she had ingenuity enough to conceal them from his knowledge, she considered perfectly allowable, and far from affording to Berenza a sufficient excuse for attaching himself elsewhere. With these sentiments, she gave unbounded latitude for her passion, for Leonardo, and to such an excess did it speedily arrive that she almost felt as if for him she could resign every other man. End of chapter 13 Read by Teresa Mayer of Shrewsbury Township, New Jersey Chapter 14 of Zafloya this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Sefloya by Charlotte Dacry. Chapter 14. 
Three months had now elapsed since Leonardo, fatally for himself, had become known to the siren Megalina. He was not yet nineteen, Megalina was his senior by several years, yet so far had her full-blown but unfaded charms, her playful yet elegant manners, her various seductive blandishments obtained the ascendancy over his imagination, that the bare idea of separating from her became to him at length distraction. She had bewitched and enslaved his heart. She had awakened his soul to new existence. The image of the delicate Amamiya faded from his mind, and a more wild, a more unbounded passion took possession of it in the form of Megalina. With a novel delight, superior to aught she had ever felt at any former conquest, did the artful Florentine behold her triumph. She had sown, as she believed, the first germs of love and passion in a pure, youthful breast. She had seen those germs shoot forth and expand beneath the fervid rays of her influence, and she enjoyed the fruits with a voluptuous pleasure. At length, however, the vanity of her sex became predominant. Assured of the perfect regard of Leonardo, enamored of his beauty, and proud of her conquest, she had yet another feeling to gratify she longed to exhibit him at venice to the females of her acquaintance to excite their envy and their admiration for of their attraction she entertained no fear no dread of rivalry with herself had the haughty florentine but how to conceal from berenza her new and highly prized lover she resolved then to let her return eye to venice remain a secret to him and in order to maintain it such go but little from home this point determined on, she expressed to Leonardo her desire to revisit Venice. At the mention of Venice, he became visibly agitated. The color forsook his cheeks and returned to them again with deepened dye. That very event, which he had a little time before so eagerly desired, he now contemplated with mingled sensations of terror and reluctance. But could he refuse aught to his seducing mistress? Impossible! For her he forgot the firmest purpose of his soul. To her he laid open the painful secret, which till now with scrupulous care, a high-mindedness that shrunk from the idea of divulgement he had undeviatingly guarded, the secret of his name and family. Throwing himself into the arms of Megalina, he acknowledged himself for what he was, and hesitatingly expressed his unwillingness openly to revisit Venice, at least in his proper character. "'Are you, then?' exclaimed Megalina, the fire of increased exultation sparkling in her eyes. "'Are you, then, the son of Loredani?' "'I am beautiful, Strozzi,' he answered. "'But, dropping on his knees and fervently clasping his hands together, "'Guard, guard, I beseech you, the secret which your charms have extracted from me. "'Respect my honour, my happiness, and my life, "'and never, by any chance, oh, never let it transpire from your lips "'that I am the disgraced, the wandering offspring of that unhappy house, "'or that to the name of Leonardo, I add,' his voice faltered. "'I add that of Loredani.' "'Never, never,' solemnly answered the Florentine. "'Swear it, lovely woman, swear it ere I rise,' passionately added Leonardo, "'I swear, solemnly swear,' answered Megalina, laying one hand upon his shoulder and raising the other to heaven. "'I swear never to divulge thy secret to mortal being, and in the moment I forget my oath, may the lightning of heaven blast me!' "'Megalina, I thank thee,' cried Leonardo fervently, rising from his knees and embracing her with a tender solemnity, while tears trembled in his eyes. I earnestly thank thee for the discovery of my secret. I would never survive. But you will go to Venice, then, Leonardo? Oh, Megalina, does not my father dwell there? How, going with thee, might I remain concealed from his knowledge? Know you not, then, dear youth, that the Marchess is no more? That event and those which followed are sufficiently known in Venice, and none of your family at present reside there. Leonardo heard only the words, The Marchese is no more. His hands were raised in mute anguish to heaven. The eloquent tears rolled slowly down his cheeks, and emphatically he exclaimed, Merciful God, I thank thee. Then turning towards Megalina, he said in a voice of assumed calmness, Inform me of what you know. I can bear to listen. 
the florentine appearing deeply affected at the visible emotion of leonardo stated and certainly with all possible regard to those high and susceptible feelings which she perceived in him whatever had come to her knowledge respecting the occurrences in the family of loredani she concluded her detail which she had rendered as concise and as little painful as possible by again observing as she believed justly that no part of that family resided now in the city of venice o oh, lost o oh, miserable mother silently ejaculated the youth thou hast completed then the measures of thy crimes adieu for ever to the honour to the happiness of thy children thou hast now blasted them irretrievably to megalina however his smarting pride his anguished feelings suffered him to make no remark his heart was too full it was too towering even in its humility to ask a sharer in such griefs and wilt thou not then accompany me to the city interrogated megalina again taking his hand and looking fondly in his face yes yes fair megalina he replied passing his hand hastily across his forehead as if to chase away every uneasy thought yes i can now do anything but remember i am only leonardo delighted to have gained her point the florentine promised obedience to his smallest desire anticipated and entered warmly into his every wish arranging with eager facility a plan for his remaining concealed and unknown leonardo yielding to all she proposed hastened from her presence to wander a while in gloomy retrospection for his mind incapable of recovering immediately from the shock it had sustained required in solitude to wear off its effect and conquer the gloom that oppressed it megalina however determined that her lover should not retract resumed as soon as she again beheld him the subject nearest her heart and fixed the following day for their departure from the villa aguadolque to whose friendly seclusion she considered herself indebted for pleasure beyond any she had ever enjoyed accordingly in the cool of the evening on the following day they embarked for venice and began to get dusk as they arrived they soon reached her luxurious residence but nothing could remove the oppression which momentarily had been growing upon leonardo increasing at every step that brought him nearer to the place of his nativity megalina perceiving this exerted herself by every tender assiduity and insinuating art to lighten and disperse she welcomed the youthful lover to her home and cast a splendid supper to be prepared at length her powerful influence began to prevail the melancholy of leonardo gave way before it potent goblets of wine assisted her efforts the uselessness of regret became manifest to his mind it was displaced by a vivacity resulting rather from the animation imparted to the spirits by wine and luxurious viands than the sober reasoning of philosophy the bland seductress megalina possessed over him an unlimited power she had caused a new world to open on his view even yet he was not awakened from the dream of pleasure with which she had bewitched his soul feelings and ideas unknown before swelled in his bosom and his heart was rapidly becoming immersed in an infatuating sea of voluptuousness megalina to his heated enthusiastic fancy appeared an angel at once beneficent and beautiful jealous of every idea that was not directed to herself she sedulously endeavoured to banish from his mind all painful recurrence to the past to this end she thought it expedient to seek for him amusement and recreation but of a nature that should not involve publicity for in his determination of concealment leonardo continued firm and tremblingly alive to the remotest idea of discovery accordingly at her own house megalina assembled most of her female friends and such of her male acquaintance who while from vacancy they affected to admire her professed not to be lovers to all these she presented her cherished lover as a young florentine and distant relation of her own for even megalina bold and unprincipled as she was did not desire to have known the real circumstances of her acquaintance with leonardo among the visitors that frequented this abode of levity and ignoble pleasure it was not probable that any should be found who had formerly visited at the marchese loredani's yet had such an accident occurred nearly three years of absence from venice joined to the life which he had led amid the mountains of tuscany had so far changed his originally delicate appearance that it would have been almost impossible for any but a near relative to recognize the pampered boy leonardo and the hardy and robust-looking florentine increased to the most elegant stature of the full-grown man 
But yet, although unknown and undiscovered, Megalina vainly flattered herself in believing that the tale of his relationship to herself was credited. Enamored as she appeared of the imminent beauty of his person, and evidently incapable of remaining at ease if for a moment he quitted her presence, it required no singular degree of penetration to discern that ties more tender and more animated than those resulting from consanguinity attracted her towards him. It so happened that among the females to which the vanity of the Florentine incited her to introduce her lover was one by name Teresa. This girl was of exquisite beauty, but deeply immersed in a stream of vice and dissipation. To the further disgrace of Megalina, it must he acknowledged that she was in a high degree accessory to her fall from virtue. The unfortunate girl, though she appeared to court her society and to entertain towards her friendship and affection, was in her heart deeply sensible of this, and when reflection transiently pervaded her wretched mind and the bitterness of an abhorrent, half-repentant spirit, she silently cursed the enemy that had betrayed her. Soon her penetrating and observant eye remarked the fond expression of regard with which Megalina Strozzi so frequently regarded her lover. The concealed exultation with which she viewed him was discovered by the watchful Teresa. She felt convinced in her mind that he bore no relationship to her excepting that of love, if love it might be termed, and rejoiced at a prospect of obtaining revenge for the misery that an envying and fallen female had induced her to partake of inspired too by something of passion for the attractive leonardo she resolved if possible to detach him wholly from her hated associate by courting him to herself eager in the prosecution of this plan she left untried no artifices that could facilitate it she invited megalina frequently to her house and spite of her watchfulness and care contrived to have her attention engaged that she might steal leonardo from her side and hold private conferences with him she appealed as the florentine had done to his imagination and his senses and by younger therefore more blooming charms sought to reduce his heart from its alliance to her but while Teresa angled, as she thought, thus securely and unsuspected, the demon of jealousy had taken possession of the Florentine soul, and raged to madness at what she saw, yet wily and apparently cool, with vengeance burning in her breast, she resolved still to appear unconscious, and to see how far the daring treachery of Teresa would carry her. To this end she forbore to circumvent her various plans to inveigle her lover, and while Teresa believed herself wholly unobserved, she only fell the readier into the snare which was laid for her. At length her incessant and evident assiduities began to attract and return the attentions of Leonardo. Now, no longer diffident, no longer retiring, he sought not to repress the sensations she excited, sensations not so ardent indeed, because no longer new, as though he had experienced for Megalina, but yet gradually acquiring strength and, from the novelty of the object, at least increasing in allurement. His eyes and his language began to assure Teresa that she had in some measure achieved her anxiously desired object. Desirous, if possible, to rivet him at once her own, she, with eager and ill-concealed delight, appointed an evening when, by a plan of her own suggestion, he might, unsuspected, steal to her house. The sentiments of Leonardo, though high and tremblingly alive to whatever regarded his pride or dignity of birth, were not yet so punctilious as may shrink from the idea of infringing on the fidelity of love unused even from childhood to curb the slightest of his wishes and his self-love flattered by the early acquired regard of so young and lovely a female he hesitated not in accepting her invitation though his native delicacy taught him to consider it as somewhat premature but what then? Megalina herself had first inspired him with a taste for ignoble pleasures, and it could scarcely be dishonorable to pursue with another the path her fascinations had pointed out. The evening then was mutually agreed on, and even the very hour fixed. To this length did the secure and artful Strozzi permit everything to advance. Leonardo was suffered to make his escape, to enter the house, and even the apartment where his impatient fair one awaited to receive him. But then so well, so accurately had the Florentine arranged her plan, she burst upon them like a thundercloud. For a few moments she even surveyed them, but with that kind of horrible tranquillity that betokens an approaching storm. 
Teresa had greeted Leonardo with a fervent embrace, and such was still their attitude, with a look wherein was depicted the blackest rage, the deepest vengeance, and the bitterest scorn. Without advancing a step, she continued to contemplate them. Then, firmly and deliberately approaching Leonardo, she seized him by the arm. So unimpaired was her power over his soul, such was the awe, almost the terror, which he involuntarily felt, while sinking abashed beneath the powerful glance of her eye, that he had no power to resist the decisiveness of her action. There was a something at this juncture in their relative situations that made her, even in his own eyes, appear the injured person, and himself the worthless aggressor. Without a single rebellious struggle, therefore, on his side, the Florentine retained his arm, which he grasped with the violence of smothered rage, then casting on the trembling and foiled Teresa a look, which spoke volumes to her trembling soul, she led, with step haughty and indignant, her recovered captive from the room. Returning homewards, Megalina preserved a gloomy silence. Leonardo essayed twice or thrice to speak, but his tongue refused its office, and accents half-formed quivered on his lips. Shocked and repentant, his mind suggested nothing that could allay the resentment he knew was boiling in the breast of his mistress. At length they reached home and entered an apartment. The Florentine, still preserving an uninterrupted silence, threw herself upon a sofa, and, covering her face with her hands, remained apparently absorbed in thought. Leonardo could bear no longer this terrible demeanor. He became agonized. The remembrance of the happiness he had till now enjoyed with his still-adored Megalina rushed impetuously over his ardent soul. Of Teresa he knew little or nothing. He felt an emotion bordering on rage and disgust, rising in his bosom against her, for having, even momentarily, alienated his thoughts from her to whom he fondly conceived that he owed so much. No longer master of himself, he rushed towards her. He threw himself with violence at her feet, kissed them, and bedewed them with his tears. This was only what the artful Florentine had expected, knowing well the haughtiness of his nature, yet knowing likewise well the susceptibility of his feelings. She had forborne to irritate by reproach him, who was to be conquered by an appeal to the heart. "'Oh, lovely, oh, adored Megalina, cried the repentant lover, Forgive, forgive me. I feel, yes, I feel that tis you alone I love. Pardon then in this conviction your unhappy, guilty slave. The Florentine answered not. What? Not a word? Not a word, O Megalina? Resumed he, almost distracted and snatching his stiletto forth. I have lived too long then, and thus let in forth existence from my worthless, though agonized heart. As he spoke, he tore open his vest and frantically made an attempt to plunge it in his bosom. Megalina, starting up, wrenched it from his furious grasp and threw it far. Still the devoted youth remained at her feet. She cast her eyes downward upon his graceful form, and tenfold love assailed her softened soul. She stretched forth her hand and bade him rise. Her voice reanimated him, and springing up, he folded her with ardor to his breast. The artful Strozzi returned his embrace, but suddenly pushing him from her, she exclaimed, "'Go! Bring me that stiletto!' He felt surprised, but obeyed her imperious command. She took it hastily from his hand, then said in a solemn, serious voice, "'Leonardo, do you love me?' "'Love you,' he eagerly repeated. "'Then mark me,' she resumed. By this stiletto and by your hand, Teresa dies. The youth shuddered and recoiled a few steps, for human nature shrinks instinctively at murder. Ah, false wretch, do you hesitate? fiercely exclaimed the Florentine. Go then, go to your Teresa and quit my sight forever. And will nothing less than appease the Omega Lina? faltered out the enslaved Leonardo. "'Tis plain he loves her,' gloomily muttered the vindictive Strazzi. "'Oh, no, by heaven I do not,' eagerly replied Leonardo. "'Prove it, then, by plunging the stiletto in her heart. "'Not else can or shall convince me that you do not.' "'Oh, Megalina, my first, my only mistress, "'you will not, you cannot surely require proof so dreadful?' "'And imploringly he looked in her countenance.' 
That fierce countenance still retained its unchanging expression. In it, he read, Consent, or leave me. This dreadful fiat made her appear, from the apprehension and excited of losing her, more beautiful than ever in his eyes. Her symmetrical form shone forth with redoubled loveliness to his heated fancy, and while he gazed, his struggles died away, or were displaced by sensations which overpowered them. He stretched forth his burning hand, it trembled with the consciousness of intended murder, and in faint, faltering voice he said, Give me the dagger. You consent, then, said the seductress Megalina, to let it shed the blood of the insolent Venetian. I do, I do, and to bring it me again. Stained and dripping with her gore? Oh, all you require, groaned the miserable Leonardo. I love you, cruel Megalina, oh, how much! When to prove it, I would murder. The Florentine cast the stiletto with violence away and opened her fair arms wide. The bewildered Leonardo rushed into their embrace and sunk overpowered on her bosom. I forgive thee, she cried. I now forgive thee, Leonardo. I wanted after thy cruel dereliction from thee some proof that I was still loved. That proof I have obtained, and thou art mine again. Oh, I was thine ever replied the infatuated youth, tears gushing from his eyes. "'I now believe that thou wert,' answered the Florentine, gazing exultingly upon her victim, and then gently seating him beside her with a smile. Such was the fatal empire that a worthless wanton had acquired over young and susceptible heart, left to its wild energies ere reason could preponderate, and thus darkly colored became the future character of one, yielding progressively to the most horrible crimes, which, if differently directed in early youth, might have become an honor and an ornament to human nature. End of chapter 14 Recording by Elsie Selwyn Chapter 15 of Zofloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zofloya by Charlotte Dacra. Chapter 15. Megalina Strozzi, from this instance of the envy and treachery of female acquaintance, became disgusted with Venice and resolved to retire again to her villa near the banks of the lake, that she might retain her captive in solitary safety. Having but rarely quitted her house during her stay in Venice, and even then avoiding the most public resorts, she had, as she desired, escaped the observation of Count Berenza, who indeed, had he chanced to have espied her, would have been more anxious to shun than recognize her. Venice, however, she, with Leonardo, hastily quitted, and repaired to Aqua Dolce, secretly happy that she had borne away her lover from all further temptation, and exclusively appropriated him to herself. For a time she remained tranquil and satisfied. She found means to diversify the scene, and amuse the youthful taste of Leonardo, by rambling about the beautiful walks that environed her dwelling, or sometimes, in her gondola, taking the fresco upon the lake. Yet, spite of all this, Spite of being unceasingly in the society of him she preferred, her restless spirit could not be restrained, and again she panted for the gay pleasures of the city. Ennui began to take possession of her ill-organized and resourceless mind, for it is the pure, intellectual soul alone that can receive delight from solitude. Venice, with all its dangers, became preferable in her eye to the gloomy sameness, though security, of the country. And after a residence of a few weeks there, she again resolved to brave the allurements of the city. Leonardo was equally desirous with her to emerge from seclusion, but having now acquired artifice, he affected indifference to the proposed change. Magalina, pleased at this appearance, and flattering herself that he was now too firmly riveted to allow himself to be again seduced by the charms or incitements of others, with as great eagerness as she had flown to it, now hastened from her weary solitude. Arrived once more in Venice, she boldly resolved that she would no more, as formerly, debar herself from going, as she had been wont to do, to the most public resort of the gay Venetians, and she even decided in her mind that should Barenza, 
as fully she expected he would, questioned her with respect to the nature of her intimacy with the youthful Leonardo, to impose upon him, if possible, the same story that she had attempted to pass upon others. In consequence of these arrangements, it was that she no longer withheld herself from figuring in St. Mark's Place, or on the Laguna. Leonardo, however, constantly declined accompanying her in these public expeditions, and the artful Florentine procured him such amusements at home, as should inform her on her return how he had employed his time. Thus it was that, on a certain evening, during one of her excursions on the lake, she encountered Morenza, whom so long she had feared to meet, but encountered him under circumstances that she had little expected. Bitter and offensive to her jealous soul was the situation in which she beheld him, with a young and lovely rival seated by his side, in gay and amorous converse, with a basilisk's eye she gazed upon her, breathing destruction and revenge. "'And is it for this, then?' she exclaimed. "'That I have till now so anxiously concealed myself? "'Well might the wretch be incurious respecting me. "'Well he might leave me unmolested by his visits. "'But why? "'Ah, little could I guess, "'and clearly shall he pay for the short-lived raptures "'his inconstancy has procured him.' "'Thus, bursting with rage, swore the vengeful Magdalena, "'and rushing immediately as she entered her abode "'to the apartment where she had left Leonardo "'employed in finishing a drawing.' she threw herself upon a chair beside him, and exclaimed, "'Throw, throw aside your pencil, Leonardo, and seize your dagger, for, by heaven, this night he dies!' "'What sayest thou, Magdalena? inquired the youth, with evident surprise, fixing his eyes upon her countenance. "'Who is it dies to-night, and what dost thou mean?' By the rage which flamed on her cheek and sparkled in her eye, Leonardo easily discerned that something unusual had occurred." Taking her hand and tenderly kissing it, he pursued, Tell me, Magdalena, what has befallen thee? Yes, he shall, by all my hopes of salvation, he shall die, frantically cried the vindictive Florentine. And thou, Leonardo, yes, thou shalt execute my vengeance on him. Murder again. The theme was still horrible to Leonardo, and again he shuddered and recoiled. Wilt thou not consent, Leonardo? she said in a hollow voice, fixing upon him her large and fiercely gleaming eyes. "'But say, who must die?' cried the youth. "'And what is the offence against thee?' "'The treacherous, the ungrateful betrayer! "'But you know him not, Leonardo. "'Yet mark me, my resolution is taken, "'and it devolves on you to execute it. "'The time is at length come "'wherein you must prove the strength, "'the devotedness of your attachment to me. "'Now then, hear me. Il Conte Berenza is a noble Venetian. He was the betrayer, the deceiver of my youth. To him do I owe, yes, to him, added the artful Florentine, that first my soul wandered from the paths of virtue, that I am now unworthy, hiding her countenance upon the bosom of her agitated lover, to become ever more than the mistress of my Leonardo. The heart of Leonardo became infinitely affected. Magdalena proceeded. This day I encountered him on the Laguna, accompanied by a female. He passed me by. He uttered words the most gross, the most insulting. I regarded him with horror and surprise painted in my looks, when, fearful I suppose that the mere sight of me should contaminate the purity of his present love, he rudely waved his hand, and with an air of scorn and indignation, as if to say, impure wretch, how darest thou appear to recognize me in the presence of a superior female? Leonardo, she pursued, furiously starting from her chair, strung with new rage by the revelation of the falsehood she had invented. Leonardo, shall I tamely submit to this? Canst thou submit to it? This, to thy mistress. It is for this he dies. Thy love has ennobled me, and I will not now suffer degradation tamely. The highly susceptible feelings of Leonardo thus artfully played upon, became enkindled. He participated in her well-feigned outraged delicacy, so flattering to his own self-love. But still the revenge was dreadful to his mind, proportioned, too, far beyond the offence. Perceiving that, though his cheek glowed with indignation, and his eyes with ardent love, that still he spoke not, determined then to work him to the pitch she required, she resumed. Oh, Leonardo! If, in love for thee, I have outstepped the bounds of decency and decorum. Oh, let me not, therefore, with faltering voice she pursued, 
let me not be with impunity outraged or trampled on by others no 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 cried the overpowered leonardo raising her in his arms no never sweet mistress of my soul while i have life he who offends thee dies thou art then thou art my own cried the delighted florentine that assurance reanimates my sinking soul secure now of my cherished revenge i will discuss with thee further the steps to be pursued come my beloved leonardo let us go to the supper-room obedient to her will leonardo accompanied her seated now at supper with the machinating florentine she fearful that his enthusiastic ardor might relax pledged him repeatedly in goblets of the most potent wine taking sufficient care however to elude swallowing more herself than would permit her to preserve her empire over him as it fatally happened for leonardo megalina never appeared more beautiful to him than at those times when she was urging him to the commission of some horrible evil so that deeds however repugnant to his nature and the loss of her love bore in his deluded eyes no comparison magalina well aware of this by appearing in her conduct and by her language as though she considered herself to have received his promise of avenging her took from him in fact the power of refusing to do so how to acknowledge to her that his soul shuddering recoiled from the idea of murder he knew not from his knowledge of her disposition he shrunk at encountering her direful rage, her bitter reproaches and resentful looks. But more, he shrunk even in thought from the possibility of her abandoning him, and with a violent but expiring struggle, he decided in his mind to acquiesce and give up every attempt to alter the current of events. As the fumes of the wine mounted to his brain, the reasoning of principle subsided and the delusions of fancy increased. The Florentine became every moment more beautiful in his sight, and he began to think that, in her cause, crime itself must become a virtue. She who, as she had persuaded him, seduced by her wild unconquerable love toward him, to forego and cast aside every principle of delicacy, she who had braved for him the scorn and contumely of the world, who had even this day, through him, as he conceived, endured gross insult, no, it was no longer the representations of his lovely mistress which aroused him, but honor justice, and gratitude. So wild and erring in the increasing heat of intoxication, reasoned and believed the deluded Leonardo. It was now him who led to, and followed up the subject, while the exalting Megalina, by our refinement of artifice, added fuel to the fire she had excited, without appearing to do so. At length, unable to contain the burning rage she inspired him with, he started suddenly up, and drinking down an overflowing goblet of La Crima Christi, he prepared to rush from the house, without even taking the necessary precaution of a cloak and a mask, as enforced by Magdalena. For a moment she succeeded in calming him, but only to direct his fervor to unerring and surer destruction. Covering his face with a mask, she armed him with a stiletto, which she took from her girdle, and covered his figure with a cloak. Then, straining him in her arms, she cried, Success attend thee! Strung anew by her seductive embrace, stiletto in hand, he flew from the house, to plunge the deadly weapon in the heart of a man who had never injured him, whom even he did not know. Such is the influence to be obtained by female prolificacy over the warm feelings of unaided youth. Directed by the subtle enchanter, Leonardo quickly gained the palazzo of Varenza. As it had been a night of festivity, he found an easy access to the home, and unobserved into the chamber, where he concealed himself behind a wide curtain that covered a window, which, as has been said, opened into a balcony. On hearing Berenza and Victoria enter, he had stepped into it for greater security, and perceived, with no indifferent feeling, that it would, in case of necessity, afford him an opportunity of escape. There, in a state of mind bewildered, yet dreading to be reasonable, he remained till occasion seemed favorable for the execution of his purpose. The success it met with has been already related. To a hand rendered unsteady by a confused consciousness of the meditated crime was added the intense and overpowering horror of at once recognizing a sister, and burying in the same moment, as he believed, his dagger in her heart. Wild and dismayed, precipitately he had fled, a murderer in thought, at least, if not in deed, and sought, in a state of mind inexpressible, the vile Sorzi, who, like sin, sat expecting to hear tidings of death. Well, exclaimed she, starting from the restless couch where she had thrown herself, as, pale and disordered, the unhappy Leonardo rushed into the room, his mask in his hand, and his vest torn open to admit the air to his burning bosom. Well, 
Is it done? Yes, yes. Vengeance is executed upon one of your enemies, he cried in hurried accents. Upon the false, the infamous Berenza, I hope, eagerly returned Magdalena, approaching and gazing in his pallid face. No, no. Upon my sister, gloomily answered Leonardo. Your sister? You rave young coward, cried Magdalena, shaking him by the arm. I do not. I have mortally wounded Victoria de Loredani, my sister. Wounded her mortally in the arms of him for whom my dagger was intended. Thy sister! Thy sister! In a voice of fiend-like exultation cried the infamous Strozzi, yet secretly enraged that Berenza had not perished, and thrown by the furor of disappointment off her guard. Then Magdalena Strozzi is not the only fallen female upon earth. No longer need she bow her head with shame to the ground. For Lorina, mother to the heir of Loriadani and Victoria, his sister, both high and noble ladies, raise her to their level by sinking to hers. Oh, this is a bomb to my soul, she continued, clapping her hands with a wild laugh. Marenza, proud and accomplished seducer, the woman who loves thee may sacrifice to thee her innocence and her fame, but thou wilt never sacrifice to her thy liberty, or grant her thy harmable love. Thus continued the unfeeling Florentine, wreaking upon the wretched Leonardo the avenging scorpions of her tongue, for having failed in the precise purport of his dreadful mission. This was the first time, since her ill-advised union, that she had ventured to breathe aught concerning, much less taunt him with the agonizing secret of his family misfortunes. His high soul sickened and shrunk within him at illusions so barbarous. For an instant he regarded with horror the infamous Strozzi. He essayed to speak, but could not, and overpowered with violent and conflicting emotions, he fell prostrate on the floor. It was then Magdalena began to think, and even admitted the conviction, that she had proceeded too far. She almost feared that, by the inhuman stab she had given to the high feelings of the youth, she had destroyed forever in his heart every particle of love for herself. This reflection served in an instant to change the tenor of her conduct. From the malice of rage and disappointment, she softened to the suggestions of her interest, which whispered to her that in losing now the regards and future devotement of Leonardo, upon which she calculated much, she should lose her all. Throwing herself beside him, therefore, she passionately implored his forgiveness, and sought, by the repetition of every well-tried artifice, to soothe and alleviate the agonizing tumult she had excited. By degrees her blandishments began to prevail over the infatuated youth, and even the horrible recollection she had awakened in his mind, of his being in reality a disgraced and wandering outcast, drew him but more closely to her, who, knowing him for what he was, still loved and took an interest in his fate. He adored her, though she had wounded him to the soul, and, when to her caresses and ardent professions of eternal attachment she solicited some reply, he raised her in his arms, as kneeling she bent over him, and pressing her with violent emotions to his bosom, passionately cried, Magdalena, I am thine! Yes, I feel that I am, and shall be safer! Oh, lovely and seducing woman, eternal must thy empire be over me! And if I forsake thee, may the curse of heaven light upon my head! Then, cried the Florentine, delighted at the strength and solemnity of this assurance, let us from this moment be eternally devoted to each other. Let us swear that not time, accident, nor circumstance shall ever disunite us. I swear, answered Leonardo ardently, I swear it again, and kissed with rapture the extended hand of Magdalena. Receive, too, my oath of perpetual allegiance to thee, loved youth, with ardor exclaimed the Florentine for I solemnly swear to be ever true and devoted to thee. Now then, she added more calmly, let all past differences be buried in oblivion, and the more material circumstances of the moment obtain our consideration. Seating herself beside Leonardo, she then desired a minuter detail of the occurrences of the night, when suddenly, in the midst of his relation, she missed the dagger which she had given to him. Her high-flushed cheek became immediately blanched by terror and eagerly she interrupted him to ask him concerning it. In an instant the recollection flashed upon his mind that, in endeavouring to recover his mask, he had never thought of retrieving his dagger likewise, which he did not even remember to have drawn from the bosom of Victoria, where fully he believed himself to have plunged it. Such had been the horror and agitation of his mind, he could retrace nothing distinctly, yet the dagger unquestionably was left behind, and this was enough to distract the Florentine. Gasping for breath, we are undone, 
she cried. We are betrayed, for on the hilt of that dagger is engraved, at full length, the name of Magdalena Strozzi. Leonardo was silent, for he dreaded the reproaches which he almost felt he merited. Suddenly recovering, however, her presence of mind, she exclaimed, We must fly! We must fly instantly! The night is not yet spent. Before daybreak we may be far from this detested city. To some future period must I defer the completion of my just revenge. You tremble, young man, but let us hope, she added with a horrible smile, that you will not always be thus dismayed at the thought of blood. Why, Leonardo, thou art not half a Venetian. Am I not, Magdalena? When occasion calls, I can prove myself one. But I feel that, were I even abject by blood, and in my heart, that thou couldst render me equal to anything. Still, as he spoke, his eyes refused to meet the unshrinking gaze of the Florentine. We shall fly then together, beloved Leonardo, said she, and I shall not so much regret our enforced departure from this gay city, for, now to be frank with thee, my love, my resources diminish daily. This place affords me no longer the exhaustless mind I once imagined it would. The Venetians have become wary, or can it be that I am changed from beauty to deformity? Be it as it may, we will quit it unreluctantly, and let us hope that elsewhere better fortune may be ours. Though some parts of Magdalena's speech had surprised Leonardo, he forbore, unwilling to diminish her fascinations in his own eyes, to require more ample explanations. He took her hand hastily, and said, I will follow thee, fair Magdalena, wheresoever thou wilt, even unto the end of my life, as we have mutually sworn. Smiles of pleasure chased from the brow of the Florentine to the gloomy traces of rage and unsatisfied revenge. She looked upon her lover with eyes of gratitude and ardent affection. He was indeed become her all, her sole dependence in the plans of her future life, for, vicious, profligate, and unsteady, though still not past the zenith of her charms, they were deemed so far from counterbalancing the violent passions which deformed her mind that she had but few admirers among the jealous and suspicious Venetians. She now hastened from the room to make every preparation for an immediate flight. In less than two hours she had gathered together all the valuables she possessed, and which were capable of being taken with them. Every requisite was arranged, and the grey eye of the morning beheld them far from Venice. Unhappy Lorina, whose criminal desertion of thine offspring entailed upon them such misery and degradation. In this early career of their lives, behold the guilt and unworthiness for which they are amenable. Yet, darker still, and disfigured by greater crimes, will be the days which are to come. Faultless example would have shunted into efforts of virtue the proud and violent nature of thy daughter. Yet, behold her now, without even a remorseful struggle, abandoning its precepts. Thy son, the dark hue, of his character decided, the slave of an artless, worthless wanton, who presumes, and justly presumes, to call herself thy equal, while, through a terrible and unforeseen combination of events, he has been on the eve of becoming the murderer of his sister. Tremble, unfortunate and guilty mother, for longer and more gloomy becomes the register of thy crimes. End of chapter 15 Recording by Todd Chapter 16 of Zafloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Zafloya by Charlotte Dacker. Chapter 16. The letter which was written by Megalana Strozzi, and which, from an obscure spot in the island of Capri, she had caused to be conveyed to Berenza, has been already given at full in a preceding part of this history, and was received, as stated, about a fortnight after the mutual flight of Leonardo and herself. Well knowing that pursuit must be in vain, and from the precautions they had taken, to trace their route impossible. Still undetermined where eventually to fix, but resolving to be guided by circumstances respecting their future plans, we must now, for a considerable length of time, leave them and return to the thread of our narrative. Youth and that strength of mind which precluded hypochondriac malady did not permit Victoria to languish long under the effects of her wound. She grew rapidly convalescent, but during her inevitable confinement, external objects not intervening much to distract her regards by flattering her vanity, she had full leisure to concentrate her great and varied powers into one point, that of rendering herself an object of such moment to her lover that he should consider with horror the bare possibility of losing her, and be anxious to bind her more completely to his, 
by ties esteemed indissoluble. But such had already been the effect produced upon Berenza, by conduct which he could not help considering proof of the most heroic love, as well as courage, that he no longer viewed her with tender passion only, but with the strongest sentiments of gratitude and enthusiastic admiration. What could woman more than voluntarily, nay eagerly, oppose her own life in defense of his? Who but Victoria could possess at once such tender and such exalted sentiments towards a lover? Longer to doubt the truth, the romantic ardor of her attachment would, he esteemed, be sacrilege. His ideas underwent a wonderful but natural revolution. No more the haughty Berenza, proud of his noble, his unsullied blood, fearing to dash it with a tincture of disgrace. No more looking down, with protecting air, a high and superior being, upon a mistress beloved indeed, but not considered as an equal. Because, though innocent in reality, in his eyes she was a scion of infamy and shame. No, his heart now throbbed with excessive tenderness, and now ached with compunctious pangs, that he could ever have deemed unworthy of his honorable love the creature before him. Shining superior in a glory emanating from herself, the creature to whom he now thought himself inferior, so complete and powerful a dominion had the act of Victoria obtained over his mind that his proud and dignified attachment softened into a doting and idolatrous love. He was no longer the refined, the calculating philosopher, but the yielding devoted lover, devoted to the excess of his passion. In short, he felt that now to be happy, to conciliate his conscience, and to atone to Victoria for his past injustice, he must make her his wife. No sooner had he formed this resolution than he believed himself to have discovered a balm for everything, and to experience a pun, sensation of delight till now unknown. Unable long to contend against the strong impulse of his heart, he waited only for the re-establishment of Victoria's health, to pour out his feelings at her feet, and to offer to her the unworthy gift of himself. When, therefore, he thought her sufficiently recovered to permit him to touch upon the subject that must, as he supposed, occasion some emotion, he no longer withheld himself from giving utterance to what had of late so often risen from an overflowing heart to his lips. Victoria heard him with a look of complacency and all that softness she knew so well how to assume, but pride having always kept her from surmising the struggles of Berenza upon her subject, and that he had not till this period offered to become her husband, because till this period he had deemed her unworthy to become his wife, having never surmised this, she betrayed no immediate emotion or unspeakable delight, no overpowering transport or surprise, but listened to him in silence with an acquiescent smile. This being considered by Berenza as a coolness of demeanor, uncongenial to the subject, he mentally attributed it to a wounded pride in Victoria that he had not sooner made her an offer of his hand. His own noble delicacy caught the alarm, and his liberal soul acknowledged the justice of her feeling. Anxious then to remove from her mind every uneasy impression, the ardor of his manner increased, and he prayed to Victoria to pardon the unworthiness of his past scruples. Here Berenza erred. Had he stopped at the simple intention of offering his hand to Victoria, he had done right. But his last insinuation, though broken and obscure, darted like lightning through her brain, and struck to her proud heart as a three-edged dagger. That proud heart had now indeed taken an alarm far beyond any Berenza's imagination could have conceived. Her brow lowered, she turned of an ashy paleness, as sudden hatred and desire of revenge took possession of her vindictive soul. The conveyance flashed upon her that she had till this moment been deemed by Berenza unworthy of becoming his wife. The secret then is betrayed, thought she. The sort of union into which he entered with me, and which plainly I preferred as a proof of his love for me, was desired by him only as being least offensive to his dignity and pride. Tis well. Rapidly these ideas passed through the mind of Victoria, and, while secretly vowing the offence should never be forgotten, she again harmonized her features, and clothed them with smiles, since such had been the sentiments of Berenza, and now became unquestionably a desirable point to become at once his wife. To have triumphed by any means over his stern and detested pride was something, but it could not obliterate the crime of having ever dared to view her in an inferior light. Unhappy Berenza, all thy delicacy, thy forbearance, and nobleness of mind will not save thee from the consequences of having proceeded thus far. The changes of Victoria's countenance were only attributed by her lover to an unconquerable emotion, which she struggled to conceal, at this undeniable proof of the strength of his attachment to her. Delicately solicitous to raise her in her own eyes, he, with pressing earnestness, entreated of her a prompt compliance to their union. Victoria fixed him her eyes, pregnant with an unusual expression, for busy were her evil thoughts against him. "'Why is that look, my love?' inquired Berenza. "'I look upon thee as I love thee,' answered Victoria. "'And thou wilt be mine, honorably and solemnly mine, then?' said Berenza with eagerness. 
I will, answered Victoria. I most ardently desire to become thy wife. Berenza, who understood nothing by these expressions but simply what met the ear, viewed her with an increase of tenderness and admiration. For it is a principle in human nature to exalt in our minds those objects we are determined to favor and elevate. A very short period from this beheld Victoria de Loredani, the wife of Il Conte Berenza, and becoming so, her faults in the eyes of an admiring husband were wholly obliterated, and her better qualities appeared to shine forth with redoubled effect. With what a difference and far more refined feeling did he now walk with her in St. Mark's Place, or exhibit her on the Laguna amid thousands of gay Venetians in their gondolas. With what pleasure, with what delight, with an air how unembarrassed did he now introduce as his wife to an elegant and respectable society, her whom he could have felt but a vain and inconsiderable triumph in introducing as his mistress to the gay and the dissolute. In having made his Victoria an honorable wife, he experienced a noble and benevolent satisfaction, which had for its basis the reflection of having raised to a level with the higher class of society, her who he might have been instrumental in sinking to that of the lowest. But though the conduct of the refined Berenza was such as to claim and to deserve the highest gratitude and love, the vindictive spirit of Victoria could not forget that he had deemed her unworthy of ranking on an equality with himself. For this, in her moments of solitude, her heart swelled with unforgiving hate. She despised and undervalued the advantages she possessed, and fed the discontented repinings of her mind by recalling to memory the moment when he unfortunately betrayed the slate of his sentiments respecting her. Sometimes she even regretted that, under circumstances so humiliating, she had consented to become his wife, and almost determined to shew her contempt of his fancied condescension by abandoning him. If at these times her unconscious husband by chance obtruded, he was received with a gloomy and discontented air, which when he pressed her to explain, she attributed either to indisposition or an involuntary depression of spirits. When the mind is dissatisfied, whether upon grounds just or unjust, it ever views objects through an exaggerated medium. Trifles which, when in the same state, would have passed unnoticed, are twisted from their proper insignificance to aid the conceptions of a disturbed imagination. Thus was it with Victoria. She knew and felt that Berenza was her superior, and she imagined that he must feel it likewise. Every word, every look, every action, she thought reproached her with her former degradation and the abjectness from which it had pleased him to raise her. Her fits of gloom and abstraction increased. She forbore to cultivate any society, from a sentiment of most unpardonable pride. Pride which, like a worm in the heart, the more it was cherished, the more corroded, and the luckless Berenza was sometimes, in the momentary sting of disappointed hope, compelled to acknowledge that though the situation of a wife might have rendered more respectable the object of his love, it had forever destroyed the charms and fascinations of the mistress. Yet still he loved with the tenderest, the truest affection. Five years now rolled on since a union but little productive of real happiness to either party, when one evening a violent ringing at the gate of the palazzo bespoke the approach of an impatient visitor. Soon a stranger was announced, and almost in the same moment entered the saloon. Berenza rose from his chair, but scarcely did he cast a glance toward him ere he flew into the arms that opened to receive him, exclaiming, "'Welcome to Venice! Welcome home, my beloved Henrique!' Then, turning towards Victoria, as surprise and delight permitted him to recover himself, "'Behold a beloved brother, my Victoria,' he said." And you, my brother, behold an adored wife, now, now, indeed may I expect to be truly happy. Henrique pressed the hand of his brother and paid some graceful compliments to Victoria, who, gazing upon him with admiration, in an instant drew ungrateful comparisons between their persons, to the disadvantage of him in whom her soul should have discerned no fault. But that benevolent and unsuspicious being seated himself between them and felt, as he deserved to be, truly happy. Hitherto it has not been thought requisite to enlarge materially upon the cause that induced the departure and stay of Berenza's brother from Venice. It has been hinted, however, that it was to divert, if possible, by activity and change of scene, the ardor and impetuosity of a passion that he had conceived for a young lady, whose father had, on the plea of their mutual youth, opposed their union, but who in reality was desirous only of obtaining a higher match for the blooming Lila, his daughter, at that period little more than thirteen years of age. For although he could not bestow upon her the smallest dowry, he conceived that the nobility of her birth entitled her to the first ducca in Venice. The circumstance of his having lately become deceased, which event Lila, in corresponding with, had imparted to her lover, was the means of bringing him thus in anxious eagerness to Venice, fondly hoping that now every obstacle to their union was removed, which still remained the first fond wish of his bosom, undiminished by time or an absence of years, for where, as with impassioned earnestness he demanded of himself, could he ever hope to find in another that purity and innocence, which his heart told him still dwelt incorruptible in the bosom of his young and lovely mistress? 
Berenza, to whom, during supper, he related the delightful cause of his sudden return, and dwelt with all the ardor of a lover upon the fond hope he entertained of being soon enabled to call Leela his, fondly took pleasure in flattering him that nothing indeed was now likely to disappoint the desires of his heart. Victoria listened in silence to the conversation, and an indefinite sentiment resembling regret glanced through her bosom when she thereby discovered that the affections of the young Enrique were so deeply engaged. At length they separated for the night, the lover to dream of the fair creature that in the morning he hoped to embrace, and the disturbed Victoria to arrange, if possible, the confusion of idea that floated in her mind. Scarcely had the first beams of morning enlightened the east ere Enrique awakened, ardent and impatient to visit the object of his love. Soon as propriety might in the least admit, he flew to her residence. The fair Leela received him indeed with all the warmth, with all the affection he could have wished, but his buoyant hopes were quelled by what she said in reply to his eager solicitations to become immediately his. Her father was indeed dead, but still impediments existed. She was under the protection of an ancient female relative, who with herself had remained with him in his last moments. It was the dying request, nay command of that father, cruel and relentless even in death, that she should not marry till the expiration of a whole year from the time that he should be consigned to the earth. To this she had solemnly and implicitly promised obedience. And to this requisition, hard as it was, she professed to Henrique her fixed resolution to adhere. Educated in sentiments of the severest piety, it was in her idea a sacred and religious obligation to her to fulfill a promise to the dying. Nay, she would have deemed it horrible sacrilege even to hesitate or waver respecting its performance, and all the entreaties of her lover to make her forego adherence to what he considered an arbitrary and most unjust command were not only vain, but tended almost to shake him in her long and deep-rooted sentiments of esteem, by giving her doubts of his moral character. Little more than one month had as yet elapsed since the interment of the tyrannical parent. Nearly a whole year even now must roll over their heads, ere they could become united. Yet even against this grievous representation on the side of Enrique, the pious Lila was proof, and, with a heart nearly as agonized as if he had been compelled to resign forever his hopes, the unhappy lover returned to his brother's palazzo. His first impulse was to seek him in private, and relate to him the disappointment of his wishes with Lila. The kind Berenza listened with attentive sympathy, and it occurred to him that since Lila would not immediately become the wife of Enrique, the pains of delay might be infinitely alleviated by prevailing on her to become a constant visitor at the palazzo, which, as Berenza was now married, and she herself under the protection of a female relative who would always accompany her, could not certainly be in the least unobjectionable alternative. This was indeed pouring balm into the wounds of Enrique. Scarcely would the eager and impassioned youth permit his brother to conclude, ere he rushed from his presence and appeared again before his beloved Leela, to impart to her the proposition of Berenza, and to implore her to accede to it. This the scrupulous and innocent girl offered no objection to, and the heart of her lover was once more rendered comparatively light. On the evening of the same day she consented, accompanied by her relation to visit Victoria. It was under that shape alone that Henrique had ventured to propose her seeing him at the palazzo of his brother. He then once more departed and related to Varenza his second attempt with the success it had met upon the conscientiousness and delicacy of his mistress. In the evening, according to promise, the fair girl made her appearance and was by Enrique introduced to the Conte and to Victoria as his destined wife. But never, ah, surely never, was unconscious guest received with feelings and with thoughts so hostile as was the innocent Leela by Victoria. Yet still the smile played upon the disciplined features of the accomplished hypocrite, and the hand was extended to bid her welcome. Throughout the evening, her conduct was such as to excite a timid gratitude and respect in the breast of her lovely visitor, and to make her appear admirable in the eyes of the delighted Enrique. Why were unreal appearances that shed around such pure, expansive satisfaction? Dark and dreadful are the intricacies of the human heart, when debased as was Victoria's. Almost unknowing to herself, she conceived immediate hatred for the orphan Leela, because she was dear, because she was beloved by Enrique, and Enrique had appeared charming in her eyes. It was the early influence of this newborn sentiment that generated one so base, and Victoria's was not a noble and an honorable mind, that would combat in itself feelings that were improper to be indulged, rather would she have sought their gratification, unminded of the misery that might be produced to others. End of chapter 16, recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Chapter 17 of Zafloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Zafloya by Charlotte Dacre. 
Chapter 17 As though the curse of Lorena were entailed upon her daughter, that of becoming absorbed by a guilty and devouring flame, with the single exception that, in the case of the former, the heart and mind had been involuntarily seduced by a designing betrayer, while the other cherished and encouraged an increasing passion for one who attempted her not, and which common honor should have taught her to repel. Victoria dwelt with unrestrained delight upon the attractions of the object that had presented itself to her fickle and ill-regulated mind. From her infancy untaught, therefore unaccustomed to subdue herself, she had no conception of that refined species of virtue which consists in self-denial, the proud triumph of mind over the weakness of the heart she had ever been unconscious of. Education had never corrected the evil propensities that were by nature hers. Hence pride, stubbornness, and the gratification of self, contempt and ignorance of the nobler properties of the mind, with a strong tincture of the darker passions. Revenge, hate, and cruelty made up the sum of her early character. Example. A mother's example had more than corroborated every tendency to, and the unhappy Victoria was destitute of a single actuating principle that might, in consideration of its guilt, deter her from the pursuit of a favorite object. Her mind, alas, was an eternal night, which the broad beam of virtue never illumined. Henrique was the subject of her thoughts by day. He employed her fancy by night. His form presented itself if she awoke. He figured in her dreams if she slumbered. Daily, nay, momentarily, her unchecked passions acquired strength. Already she viewed with disgust, heightened by unfading remembrance of the sentiments he had once entertained respecting her, the being who had claimed so strong upon her gratitude and affection. For the young Leela she cherished the most unprovoked and bitterest hate. The hot breath she respired was charged with wishes for her destruction. Yet each and all of these beings were unconscious of the feelings they inspired. For the Honorable Berenza, whose mild philosophy taught him, it was only just to conclude that love induced love, and proofs of esteemed gratitude, regarding his wife with an unvarying tenderness, the innocent Leela placed confidence in her smiles and courteous demeanor while Henrique, absorbed in the contemplation of an adored mistress, remarked not the impassioned glances of another directed towards him, nor the pointed attention by which they were at times accompanied. Eminently indeed calculated to excite an ardent love in youth was the mind and person of the orphan Leela. Pure, innocent, free even from the smallest taint of a corrupt thought was her mind. Delicate, symmetrical, and of fairy-like beauty, her person so small, yet of so just proportion, sweet expressing a seraphic serenity of soul, seemed her angelic countenance, slightly suffused with the palest hue of the virgin rose. Long flaxen hair floated over her shoulders. She might have personified, were the idea allowable, innocence in the days of her childhood. Her very situation had a powerful claim upon the heart of sensibility, for the blooming Leela was an orphan. No ostensible protector had she under the face of heaven since an old and feeble relative whose very existence from day to day appeared precarious, could not justly be deemed so. This very circumstance it was that drew most powerfully towards her the benevolent soul of Berenza, and ardently he longed for the expiration of the allotted year that she might obtain, in the arms of his brother, a safe and honorable refuge. Time rolled on, and the effervescence of Victoria's mind increased almost to madness. Nothing but the consideration of the proposed marriage between Henrique and Leela being, in conformance with the religious scruples of the latter, protracted, kept her within the bounds of discretion, necessary even for the accomplishment of her own purpose. But as she beheld time passing away, and that still Henrique, the idol of her thoughts, remained wholly insensible to the most open insinuations, almost avowals of the feelings he had excited, she became nearly frantic with desperation, and resolved to risk everything to obtain her point. The most wild and horrible ideas took possession of her brain. Crimes of the deepest dye her imagination could conceive appeared as nothing opposed to the possibility of obtaining a return of love from Henrique. And to see him bestowing upon the envied Leela marks of the tenderest attachment made her wild with the furor of conflicting passions. Now it was that she truly felt she had never loved the injured Berenza, but that circumstances, the situation of the moment, and a combination of events alone, had first induced her to attend, and ultimately to fly to him as the only being who would afford her protection. She now viewed him as a philosophic sensualist alone, whose conduct towards her had been solely accentuated by selfish motives. Was he not considerably her superior in years? It was plain, then, that his regard for her had been of the most unworthy kind, 
and his anxiety to ascertain her love for him, ere he took advantage of the situation into which she had thrown herself, a refinement of the grossest artifice. But Henrique, the lovely Henrique, was more upon an equality with her, and it was for him that the selfish Berenza should have reserved her. Thus it was that she ungratefully reflected upon the delicate and noble conduct of the Conte towards her, forgotten all of his honorable forbearance, despised his refined and disinterested attachment, and thus it is, that in the pursuance of some favorite object, the wicked depreciate the benefits they have received. Retiring one night to her chamber, more gloomy, more repining than ever, she threw herself upon her bed, secretly wishing that Berenza, that Leila, nay, even the whole world, if it stood between her and the attainment of her object, could become instantly annihilated. Her bosom ached with the exhausting conflict of the most violent passions. Death and destruction entered her thoughts, and twice she started up, as impelled to execute some dreadful purpose, she knew not what. Horrible images possessed her brain, and her heart seemed burning with an intense and unquenchable fire. She became even herself astonished at the violence of the sensations which shook her, and for an instant believed herself under the influence of some superior and unknown power. Transported nearly beyond the bounds of reason, almost expecting, in the wilderness of her distempered fancy, to behold somewhat that should corroborate her idea, perhaps even to soothe the agony of her bosom, she started up again from her thorn-strewed pillow. But no, all was peaceful without. The rage and the confusion was in her breast. A dim light at the furthest end of the chamber, emitting a few solitary rays, revealed the surrounding loneliness and gloom. She pressed her hand on her throbbing temples. Her heart beat with violence, and once more overpowered, she laid her head upon her pillow. At length, she fell into a disturbed slumber. Dreams of mysterious tendency began to flit in the disordered eye of sleep. First, she beheld, in a beautiful and luxurious garden, Lila and Henrique. His arm encircled her waist, and her head reclined upon his shoulder, while he contemplated her angelic countenance with looks of ineffable love. At this vision, a deep groan broke in sleep from the miserable Victoria. She endeavored to turn her eyes from them, but could not, and, while the most horrible and raging pain shot through her heart, they suddenly disappeared from before her, and she found herself alone in a remote part of the garden. Presently she beheld, approaching towards her, a group of shadowy figures. They appeared to hover in mid-air, but at no great distance from the earth, and, as they came nearer, she discerned, that though of a deadly paleness, their features were beautiful and serene. These passed gradually, when, as if from the midst of them, she beheld advancing a moor, of a noble and majestic form. He was clad in a habit of white and gold. On his head he wore a white turban, which sparkled with emeralds, and was surmounted by a waving feather of green. His arms and legs, which were bare, were encircled with the finest oriental pearl. He wore a collar of gold round his throat, and his ears were decorated with gold rings of an enormous size. Victoria contemplated this figure with an inexplicable awe, and, as she gazed, he bent his knee and extended his arms towards her. While in this attitude, her mind filled with terror, she looked upon him with dread, and essaying to fly, she stumbled and awoke. Reflecting on her dream, she could attribute it only to the disturbed state of her mind, and, desirous if possible to forget for a few moments her pain, she again endeavored to sleep. Scarcely had thought become again suspended, ere fancy took the lead, she now saw herself in a church brilliantly illuminated. When, horrible to her eyes, approaching the altar near which she stood, appeared Lila, led by Enrique and attired as a bride, in the instant that their hands were about to be joined, the moor she had beheld in her preceding dream appeared to start between them, and beckoned her towards him. Involuntarily she drew near him, and touched his hand, when Berenza stood at her side and, seizing her arm, endeavored to pull her away. "'Wilt thou be mine?' in a hurried voice whispered the moor in her ear. "'And none then shall oppose thee.' But Victoria hesitated, and cast her eyes upon Henrique. The moor stepped back, and again the hand of Enrique became joined with Leela's. "'Wilt thou be mine?' exclaimed the moor in a loud voice. "'And the marriage shall not be.' "'Oh, yes, yes,' eagerly cried Victoria, overcome by intense horror at the thoughts of their union. In an instant she occupied the place of Leela, and Leela, no longer the blooming maid, but a pallid spectre, fled shrieking through the aisles of the church. 
while Berenza, suddenly wounded by an invisible hand, sunk covered in blood at the foot of the altar. Exultation filled the bosom of Victoria. She attempted to take the hand of Enrique, but casting her eyes upon him, she beheld him change to a frightful skeleton, and in terror awoke. Her mind was now in a chaos of agitation and horror, from which she found it difficult to recover, endeavoring, however, by a violent effort to recall her scattered ideas and to resume her usual firmness, she became collected enough to review the leading features of her dream. The image which, upon this review, presented itself most forcibly to her mental vision was that of the Moor, whose person she had a confused idea of having seen frequently before. After a minute's reflection, she identified him for Zofloya, the servant of Henrique. Why he should be connected with her dreams, who never entered her mind when waking, she could not divine. But certain it was that his exact resemblance, though as it were of polished and superior appearance, had figured chiefly in her troubled sight. She next reverted to the terrible moment in which she beheld joined the hands of Lila and Enrique, but that Zafloya had offered to prevent the marriage. On this incident she pondered with a sensation of pleasure, and Berenza, bleeding and dying at her feet, she contemplated as a blissful omen of her success. The more she considered, the more she inferred, the less reason she perceived for interpreting ill the visions of the night, and the conclusion which, at length, she drew was this, that every barrier to the gratification of her wishes would ultimately be destroyed, and that she should at length obtain Henrique. All else she considered irrelevant to the true purport of her dream, and the fantastic ebullitions of a disturbed mind. The frequent introduction of Zafloya she judged to be merely in consequence of her beholding him daily, sometimes attending behind the chair of his master at mealtimes, and on other occasions, while Enrique, changing to a skeleton when she obtained his hand, was emblematic only, she conceived, that he would be hers till death. The following day, when, at a late hour, she entered the apartment where they usually dined, the first object that caught her attention was the tall, commanding figure of the Moor, standing near the chair of his master. She almost started as she beheld him, and, the image in her dreams flashing upon her mind, she marked how exact was the similitude in form, in features, and in dress. She seated herself, however, at the table, but voluntarily stole frequent glances towards him. Once or twice she imagined that he looked upon her with a peculiar expression of countenance, and strange, incongruous ideas shot through her brain, ideas which even to herself were indefinable. She became at length gloomy and abstracted from mere incapacity to develop her own sensations. But to be gloomy and abstracted had of late ceased in air to become remarkable, and, while the excellent Berenza in secret deplored this change in his beloved Victoria, he forbore the slightest reproach, endeavoring only, by the kindest and most delicate attentions, to disperse her frequent melancholy. The innocent Leela, too, with sweet gentleness, would sometimes approach and seek, by endearment or lively converse, to remove what was so evident to all. But the efforts of the lovely girl appeared rather to injure than to benefit Victoria. They roused her from her dejection indeed, but elicited strong irritability and feelings of the bitterest nature. Solitude in general seemed to delight her mast, and as she had denied to Berenza that she possessed any definable cause of melancholy, in that he permitted her to indulge hoping, unsuspicious of the evil in her heart, that her mind, by its own efforts, would recover its tone. As for Henrique, though he treated her with friendship and respect as the wife of his brother, he did no more. First, because he was absorbed in Leela, and secondly, because being so completely, both in mind and person, the reverse of that pure and delicate being, he not only failed to view them as two creatures of the same class, but almost thought of Victoria with a tincture of dislike, from the very circumstance of being so opposite to his lovely mistress. End of chapter 17. Recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Chapter 18 of Zafloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Zafloya by Charlotte Dacre. Chapter 18. The more Zafloya was beloved by all save one in the Palazzo of Berenza. This single exception of the general sentiment was discernible in a man called Latoni, a domestic who had resided for some years in the service of the Conte, 
Envy and hatred filled his heart in contemplating the superior qualities of Zofloya, whose elegant person was his least recommendation. He could dance with inimitable grace, and his skill in music was such that in excursions on the Laguna, he frequently, at the request of his master, occupied one end of the gondola to charm the company with the exquisiteness of his harmony. These are distinctions, and the estimation in which the Moor was held by his superiors, so preyed upon the mind of Latoni that he abhorred to look upon him, and sought every occasion to irritate him, that, in some quarrel or fight, he might do him a mortal injury. The Moor, however, disdaining Latoni, treated him with sovereign contempt, and no bitterness of language could extort from him other reply than a smile of most expressive scorn. This behavior would enrage Latoni to a pitch of madness, but not daring to wreak his vengeance upon so universal a favorite, he had no alternative but to rush from the spot and vent in curses the malignant fury of his breast. It happened that, some few days after the singular dreams of Victoria, while their impression and their tendency still occupied her mind, that the more Zofloya became suddenly missing, as he was so highly prized by Enrique and admired by all, this circumstance caused infinite consternation throughout the palazzo, and none indeed did it affect more strongly, most inconceivably to herself, than Victoria. Every place that he had ever been in the habit of frequenting, where even there was the remotest probability of his having been, was scrupulously sought and referred to. People were sent different ways throughout Venice to gain, if possible, some intelligence respecting him. But all in vain. Several days elapsed, and not the smallest tidings could be obtained. Conjecture at length became weary, and hope began to fail. All further attempts to learn the fate of Zofloya were considered to be vain, and time alone was expected to develop the mysterious circumstances of his sudden disappearance. In the midst of this, the domestic Latoni was seized with sickness and confined to his bed. Berenza, who regarded him as an old and faithful servant, used every endeavor to promote his recovery, but his disorder rapidly gaining ground, the physicians confessed the inability of medicine to save him from approaching death. This final opinion being conveyed to Latoni, he was seized with the most terrible pangs, from which he only recovered to entreat the presence of a confessor, his master, and Signor Enrique, ere he resigned his breath. This request of a dying man, the benevolent Berenza rapidly complied with. Enrique likewise consented to accompany him, and Victoria, she knew not why, begged permission to be present. Altogether, then, entering the chamber of the expiring Latoni, who, soon as he beheld them, raising himself in his bed, spoke as follows. My lord Berenza, and you, Signor Enrique, execrate not a dying penitent, but listen with mercy and forgiveness to his confession. It is I, Latoni, who all concerning the disappearance of the Moors of Floya, I envied his beauty, his accomplishments, and hated him for the admiration which they obtained him. I sought many opportunities of provoking him to quarrel with me, but he treated me with contempt, and this increasing rage against him determined me to take his life. Wretch! exclaimed Victoria. Signora, peace, I beseech you, for I must be brief, and the pangs I now endure may almost expiate my crime. One evening, the evening he was missing, I followed him from the palazzo. I watched his footsteps, but kept at a distance. I observed him on St. Mark's. My heart panted with uncontrollable fury and desire of vengeance for the bitter moments he had given me. I saw him raise his eyes to heaven and contemplate the spangled sky. He stood almost close to the brink over the canal, and I longed to push him in headlong, but the idea that this might not affect completely his destruction and that he might save himself by expert swimming, stayed my eager hand, and I softly approached him from behind. He heard me not. I took, trembling with fear of failure, my dagger from my belt, and plunged it repeatedly into his back, ere he could even attempt to defend himself. I then, satisfied that he must perish, tumbled him into the water from which he never rose, and hastily fled the spot. The avenging conscience pursued me, however, and prevented me from enjoying the fruits of my crime. Death approaches, and torments of hell are open to my view. 
As Latoni concluded, strong convulsions seized him, and he fell back upon his pillow. His confession had eased his conscience, but could not prolong his life. He lingered a few hours, then, praying for mercy, although most despairing to obtain it, he breathed his last. Great was the grief of Victoria on hearing, thus circumstantially detailed, the loss and destruction of one who had began so deeply to interest her thoughts. She found it impossible to account for the degree of feeling which affected her. She had never been conscious of the slightest predilection in favor of the Moor, until the circumstance of his impressing her mind from appearing in her dreams had never even cast a thought more than common upon him. From that period, indeed, she had been most inexplicably interested about him, nor could she for any length of time banish his idea from her mind. It was vain, therefore, that she essayed to feel indifferent to the reflection of his unhappy fate. She found it impossible, and experienced a weight at her heart, as if under the impression of having sustained a heavy loss. Zafloya, though a Moor, and by a combination of events and the chance of war, in the victory of the Spaniards over the Moors of Granada, reduced to a menial situation, was yet of noble birth, of the race of the Abdul Rahmans. He had, after several vicissitudes, when still young, fallen into the hands of a Spanish nobleman, who, pitying his misfortunes, considered him rather as a friend than an inferior, and bestowed high polish upon the education he had received. Henrique, having become acquainted with this nobleman during his travels, to divert the sorrows of his love, he formed with him a strict friendship, founded, in some degree, upon similarity of situation as well as sentiment. Unfortunately, however, in the height of their friendship, the Spaniard became involved in a quarrel, which terminated in bloodshed. He received a wound which was pronounced to be mortal, and Henrique had the melancholy office of attending a friend in his dying moments. At this awful period it was that he, among other changes, recommended to his future protection the Moor Zafloya. Henrique promised implicit observance to all his wishes, and Zafloya was in consequence taken immediately, after the death of his first master and protector, into the service and guardianship of Henrique. These peculiar circumstances, besides his excellent and ingenious nature, considerably endeared the Moor to him, and he loved him not only for the sake of his departed friend, but for his intrinsic worth as well. His loss, therefore, by Enrique, was most sensibly and deeply regretted, and the confirmation of his frightful death received with sentiments of acute grief. Nine days had now elapsed since the death of Latoni. Nothing had as yet been heard to contradict his dying account of the end of Zafloya, when, to the surprise of every one, on the evening of the tenth, he entered the apartment where the family of Baranza were assembled. All started from their seats, and Victoria, overcome with mixed emotions, sunk into hers again. An explanation of his astonishing and unlooked-for return was hastily demanded by his master. When gracefully bowing, the Moor gave of himself the following account. Of the cause of Latoni's hatred towards me I am wholly unconscious. He frequently sought my life, and on the night that he followed me with murderous intent, and wounded me repeatedly with his stiletto, I discerned whose hands aimed the blows but was not empowered to make effectual resistance, being, as it happened, wholly unarmed. I struggled with the base assassin, however, but not aware of his intentions, he pushed me, faint as I was with loss of blood, over the edge of the steps on which I was standing, when he first attacked me, into the canal below. Here undoubtedly I must have perished, but that an honest fisherman returning to Padua was the means of my preservation by extricating me from the water assisted by the feeble struggles for life that I was yet enabled to make. Fortunately, none of my wounds proved to be serious, and being in possession of a secret transmitted to me by my ancestors, for speedily healing even the most dangerous ones, I remained at the hut of the fisherman till I was perfectly recovered, and enabled once more to present myself before the honorable family to whom I owe my highest gratitude and respect. Here ended the narration of Zafloya, who, when he had received the congratulations of every one upon his miraculous escape from destruction, appeared to learn with evident surprise the death of Latoni. He demonstrated, however, visible joy at the intelligence, and returning thanks, submissively yet dignified, for the kindness manifested towards him, respectfully withdrew from the apartment, casting as he went a look of the most animated gratitude upon Victoria, as though his heart thanked her for the interest she had appeared to take in his story beyond what his respect would permit him to express. 
As for Victoria, in proportion as she had been miserable at the disappearance of the moor, in so much was she rejoiced to behold him again. Her heart dilated with an unaccountable delight, with which the image of Henrique was deeply connected, for she thought of him with less of jealous agony and more of confidence and hope, as though, strange as it appeared, the mere presence of Zofloya possessed a secret charm to facilitate her wishes. This idea gave an animation to her countenance and a flow to her spirits that for some time had not been perceptible in her. The change delighted the unsuspicious Berenza, who flattered himself that it was the dawning triumph of vigorous reason over the morbid refinements of a sickly fancy. The innocent Leela, too, caressed her with heartfelt pleasure, and Victoria, returning her caresses with a gloomy eagerness, as the murderer might be tempted to fondle the beauty of the babe whose life he intended to take, Henrique, always participating in the pleasures and sorrows of his mistress, paid, too, a more than usual attention to Victoria, but it was an attention and compliment to Leela, to a brother whom he loved, and not the spontaneous effusions of his heart to her. On this night, Victoria retired to bed with feelings of delight that teemed with woe to others. Hers was not that innocent vivacity which springs at once from the purity and sanity of the heart. It was the wild and frightful mirth of a tyrant, who condemns his subjects to the torture, that he may laugh at their agonies. It was the brilliant glare of the terrible volcano, pregnant even in its beauty with destruction. Scarcely had her head reclined upon her pillow, ere the image of Zofloya swam in her sight. She slumbered, and he haunted her dreams. Sometimes she wandered with him over beds of flowers, sometimes over craggy rocks, sometimes in fields of the brightest verdure, sometimes over burning sands, tottering on the ridge of some huge precipice, while the angry waters waved in the abyss below. Often the circumstances were so strong that the bounds of fancy contained them no longer, and, hastily awaking, scarcely could she assure herself that Zofloya stood not at the side of her bed. At one time the delusion was so strong that she even fancied, after gazing for a minute at least, that he was a few paces from her bed, and that she saw him turn and walk slowly and majestically towards the door. At this, being no longer able to resist, she started up and called him by his name. But as she did so, he seemed to vanish through the door, which still remained shut. Surprised, she passed her hand over her eyes and looked round the chamber. All was lonely, she beheld no further traces of his figure, and, difficult as was the persuasion, she endeavored to believe the whole a delusive dream. At length she laid down and closed her eyes again. The weariness of sleep oppressed her to such a degree as to deprive her wholly of motion, but, notwithstanding this, her eyes half opened involuntarily. A gray silvery mist filled the chamber, shedding a sort of twilight. The curtains at the foot of her bed opened wide, and in the same spot again stood the figure of Zofloya. With one hand he seemed to hold Berenza, whose countenance, of pallid hue, seemed convulsed in the agonies of death. On his bare bosom appeared large marks of livid blue, and his eyes stretched wide, gazed mournfully upon the oppressed Victoria. In his other hand, the more held, by her beautiful and flaxen tresses, the orphan Leela. Her thin and spectral form seemed arrayed in transparent shade. Her lovely head drooped, and on one side of it was a deep wound, from which the blood had streamed down her aerial robes. While still incapable of volition, Victoria gazed. Berenza and Leela vanished, and she beheld instead her own likeness and that of Henrique, standing on either side of the moor. She seemed to stretch forth her arms, into which Henrique appeared impelled. But hastily retreating, she saw that his bosom was disfigured by a dreadful wound. Suddenly, Berenza and Leela again drew nigh. Resplendent wings, which dazzled her eyes, came from the shoulders of Leela. With a seraphic smile, she extended her hands to Berenza and Enrique, and rising with them from the ground, Victoria beheld them no longer. Her heart beat violently, her brain throbbed, and essaying to rise, she found herself no longer incapable of motion. End of chapter 18. Recording by DJ in Chatham, Ontario, Canada. Chapter 19 of Zofloya. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Zofloya by Charlotte Dacry. Chapter 19. 
Victoria, having passed a night of restlessness and agitation, fell into a slumber towards morning, from which she did not awaken till late in the afternoon. When she entered the saloon to join the family at dinner, her eyes irresistibly fixed upon the figure of Zefloya, who flew with alacrity to procure her a seat. During dinner she was silent and abstracted, and her regard continued involuntarily to turn towards him. In one of those hasty glances which pride would alone permit her to steal, it occurred to her that the figure of the moor possessed a grace and majesty which she had never before remarked. His face, too, seemed animated with charms till now unnoticed, and his very dress to have acquired a more splendid, tasteful, and elegant appearance. True it was that great was the beauty of Zefloya, to a form the most attractive and symmetrical, though of superior height, deriving every advantage, too, from the graceful costume of his dress, was added a countenance, spite of its color, endowed with the finest possible expression. His eyes, brilliant and large, sparkled with inexpressible fire. His nose and mouth were elegantly formed, and when he smiled, the assemblage of his features displayed a beauty that delighted and surprised. But still, to the present period, all this had been unnoticed by Victoria. The oftener she looked towards him, the more her astonishment increased that it should have been so, and she could not help thinking that Zofloya, before his sudden disappearance, and Zofloya, since his return, were widely different of each other. Whenever she cast her eyes upon the moor, she could perceive that he observed her, and not observed her only, but regarded her with a tender, serious interest, that filled her soul with a troubled sort of delight. At times she even thought he looked at her with a peculiar earnestness and animation. Yet her pride felt no alarm, but on the contrary she took pleasure in knowing that he gazed upon her. His place was near the chair of Enriquez, yet was he assiduous in attending to her. In every motion he displayed some new grace, and in the eyes of the vain Victoria his beauty increased every moment. For this once, though Enriquez was in her mind and in her soul, another occupied her attention and in spite of every attempt to divert it to other objects on that one as if by the irresistible force of magnetic attraction it perpetually turned to relieve herself from an indefinable oppression she soon rose from the table and wandered into the garden there throwing herself on a seat she began to brood over her criminal passion and the wildest thoughts rioted from preeminence in her brain detestable brenza she suddenly exclaimed, inspired by the basest hatred and ingratitude towards him. Detestable Berenza, selfish and unworthy wretch, that played upon my youth and deluded me into the misfortune of becoming thy wife. Had it not been for thee, and thy cursed arts, Enrique's heir now would have been mine. The baby Lilia, I would have banished from his heart. I would have rooted her thence, or from the earth. But that my energies are enslaved, my powers fettered by the hated name of wife, and Riquez should have yielded to my love. He should not have yielded only, but have gloried in it. Who is this minion, Lilia, a friendless upstart? She was no obstacle. I think not of her. Detestable Berenza, I say again, mean, calculating philosopher, it is thou, thou that I should wish annihilated. As she concluded, a faint echo seemed to repeat her last words in a low, hollow tone, as if sounding at a distance and borne by the wind. "'What was that?' said Victoria mentally, but sounds returned not. "'Ah, it was some mockery,' she pursued, with a steep sigh burst from her guilty bosom. She drew her hand mechanically across her eyes for a moment, and as she removed it she beheld Zefloya standing, though at a respectful distance before her, Surprise, accompanied by an emotion of anger, lightened through her mind that an inferior should thus presume to intrude upon her retirement. This latter sentiment, however, faded in an instant before the majestic presence of the moor. She looked upon him with an anxious air, but did not speak, and observed that in his hand he carried a bouquet of roses. "'Beautiful signora,' he said in a gentle voice and gracefully inclining his body. Pardon me that I thus venture to appear uncalled before you, but these roses I gathered for you, suffer me to strew them at your feet. So saying, he attempted to scatter them before her. Zefloya, cried Victoria while her eyes wandered with admiration over the beauty of his form. No, you shall not strew them at my feet. Give them to me, and let me place them in my bosom. There are too many for your bosom, sweet signora, 
but I will select you one, and of the rest I will form you a carpet. He took the choicest rose from the bouquet and strewed the remainder at the feet of Victoria. Then, extending his hand, he presented to her the rose which he had selected. Victoria stretched forth her hand to receive it, when as she did so a thorn ran deep into one of her fingers, and the blood issued in a large drop. Zafloya, apparent consternation, opened his vest and tearing some linen from his bosom, cast himself upon his knees and applied it with trembling eagerness to the wound. Victoria felt too surprised, almost gratified to repulse him, and the more continued unchecked to press the blood from her finger and absorb it with the linen as it flowed. At length it ceased to do so. Zafloya pressed the crimsoned linen to his heart, and tearing from it every particle that remained unstained, he folded it up as a sacred relic and placed it in his bosom. Then, seeming suddenly to recollect himself, he appeared struck with confusion at his own audacity. He dared not raise his eyes to Victoria, and a dark red blush animated with lurid color his expressive countenance. Victoria, feeling irresistibly impelled, laid her hand upon his shoulder, and in a gentle voice said, "'Rias, Zafloya, be not ashamed, for you have not done aught amiss. "'Say you so, signora? I rise then with confidence.' And rising as he spoke, he humbly retreated a few paces from her. "'But why, Zafloya?' inquired Victoria with a smile. "'Have you deemed that piece of linen worthy preservation?' "'Worthy, lovely signora,' answered the moor, raising his fine eyes to her countenance and crossing his arms upon his bosom. "'It is of more worth to me than language can describe. It is of equal value to me with yourself, for it is a part of you, your precious blood.' Jerry will I, of course, and safely placed upon my bosom, no earthly power shall tempt me to resign it. As he concluded, his countenance glowed with a brilliant fire, and increased animation spread itself over his graceful form. The vanity of Victoria was flattered, and no guise did she disdain flattery, but was astonished at herself, however, that with such disparity of situation it should be sweet to her. She desired to banish all hostile reflection, and gazing upon the attractive moor, she saw such unconquerable fascination that her eyes sought the ground, as fearful to express the conscious emotion of her bosom. "'Wherefore, Zafloya? she involuntarily said in a tremulous voice. "'Do you remain at such a distance?' "'I may then approach, Signora?' "'You may.' The moor drew nigh, but as Victoria still remained in a recumbent attitude, he seated himself upon the earth at her feet. An oppressive gloom now took possession of the mind of Victoria. A weight of misery seemed pressing on her heart, and covering her face with her hand, she heaved a deep sigh. "'You sigh, sweet signora,' said the moor in a sympathizing accent. "'May Zafloya venture to demand the cause?' "'The cause, Zafloya, ah!' It is a cause which you cannot remove. It is a wound for which there is no balm. Not so, perhaps, Signora. There was little in the words of Zafloya to excite hope in the bosom of Victoria, yet enlivening hope shot through her bosom and she half rose from her reclining attitude. Zafloya, she said in a doubting accent, finding that he did not proceed, what hope could you offer me? Some, perhaps, signora, name your grief. She started wildly from her seat. More, she exclaimed. Your words are big with meaning. They contain more than meets the ear. Quick, and tell me boldly all you would say. Zafloya rose from the ground. He presumed to take the hand of Victoria and led her again to her seat. In a moment she was calm. No, signora, deign to acknowledge to me what secret oppresses and has for long oppressed your soul. The moors of Loya may repay you for your confidence. The secret of Victoria hovered on her lips, hitherto it had remained unknown to mortal soul, and the gloomy solitude of her own perturbed bosom had she till now preserved it where like a poisonous worm it had continued to corrode. She was now on the point of betraying her inmost thoughts, her dearest wishes, her dark repinings and hopeless desires, of betraying them too to an inferior and an infidel. The idea was scarcely endurable, and she scorned it, but in the next instant she cast her eyes upon the noble presence of the moor. He appeared not only the superior of his race, but of a superior order of beings. Her struggles died away, and in hurried accents she involuntarily exclaimed, "'Oh, Enriquez, Enriquez!' 
The moor smiled. Why does thou smile, Zofloya? cried Victoria with momentary indignation. You love Enrique, Signora. Yes, yes, to madness, to distraction. How canst thou smile and feeling more? Are you not a holy Catholic, Signora, yet to love so much an earthly being? Mock not at me, Zofloya, for that being I would forfeit my hopes of heaven. You smile again. I perceive I have condescended too far. You dare to make sport of my miseries? No, no, beautiful Signora. I only smile at your innocence. My innocence? She repeated with surprise, for conscience whispered that long since had fled. Yes, Signora, at your innocence, that in the midst of wishes so consuming could not instruct you to obtain them. Oh, say, can you instruct me? Can you arrange? Can you direct the confused suggestions of my brain? I think I could assist you, fair Signora. Oh, Zofloya, you would bind me forever to you, eagerly exclaimed Victoria. Enough, lovely Signora. Tomorrow, at the dusk of the evening, deign to meet me here again. I see approaching towards us Il Conte Berenza and Signor Enriquez. Ah, I see them too. The hated Berenza, she said, while stronger loathing against him took possession of her heart. Farewell, Signora, till tomorrow said Zofloya, and precipitately leaving the arbor, he took a contrary path to that in which Berenza and Enriquez were advancing. Victoria continued with indescribable sensations to gaze after his graceful figure as it disappeared from her view, then, reluctantly leaving the arbor, she joined the Conte and Enriquez. With tremulous delight and with feelings of diminished pain, she stole frequent glances at the unconscious possessor of her soul. He observed her not, for the blooming Lila was hastening towards them, and in an instant he quitted the side of Victoria and flew towards her. At this sight, hate kindled fiercer than ever in the bosom of Victoria. She regarded the lovely orphan with the eyes of a basilisk, and wished that, like them, they possessed the power to destroy. Vain this evening were the mild endearments of Lila. She repulsed them with haughtiness, for the feelings in her bosom raged too strong to permit the assumption of kindness and she experienced that, however her conversation with Zofloya might have imparted hope and have soothed in a degree the anguish of her mind, still it had increased, to the highest point of irritability, every violent and bitter sensation. End of chapter 19「ーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーー
not the beauty which may be freely admired but acknowledged with sensations awful and indescribable signora he began in an harmonious voice while every uneasy feeling of victoria's bosom vanished as he spoke i am not to learn that dreadful oppression of soul weighs you to the earth but the cause of your unhappiness i desire to hear from your own lips more explicitly than you have yet acknowledged it think not beautiful victoria that in the spirit of idle curiosity merely i would dive into the recesses of your bosom no it is from a hope i entertain that i possess a power equal almost to my wishes of alleviating the sorrows you endure but even should i not possess that power even then there is a delight of which you will speedily become sensible in confiding them to a sympathizing breast victoria hesitated the moor proceeded does the signora believe then that the moor zephlia hath a heart dark as his countenance ah signora judge ye not by appearance but if you desire relief make me at once the depositary of your soul's conflicts and trust to the event scarce had zephlia opened his lips ere uneasiness as we have said vanished from the mind of victoria as he proceeded the most agreeable sensations fluttered through her frame and in her brain floated fascinating visions of future bliss that passed too rapidly to be identified scarce had his silver tones sunk on her ear in thrilling cadence than she felt even eager to express to the more her innermost her inmost thoughts excessive yet confused pleasure filled her heart she looked upon his still discernible though darkened figure upon his countenance where like two diamonds revealed by the force of their own casual rays his eyes emitted sparks of lambent flame involuntarily softened towards him she said whether or not thou canst assist me zophia is unknown to me but feeling strongly impelled to reveal to thee every moment of my soul the fatal i almost fear the remediless cause of my misery i hasten to acknowledge to thee all i have already hinted to thee concerning my love although the wife of conte bresna my inmost soul dotes frantically upon the young henrique to complete my hopeless distraction the orphan lilia that presumptuous and dependent intruder hath for long been in possession of his heart and heart of which she knows not the value for her person is not more puerile than her mind but it is not the artful insignificant ascendancy this girl has acquired over him that bids me despair it is it is that i am wedded to a wretch whom i abhor who stands between me and happiness and who was only sent upon this earth to seal the fiat of my miseries were i but once freed free from those hated fetters that bind me to Beresna, i would soon drive from the superior mind of henrique the silly question which now occupies it i would make him feel that he was destined to noble fate to confer and to receive the highest happiness not merely to yield himself a sacrifice to the undiscriminating fancy of his boyish days o oh, zophia 
this would i do were opportunity allowed me but never oh never will such bliss be mine she leaned her head upon her hand and paused then quickly resuming i have now told thee of the agony which racks my breast i have even revealed my wishes my despair say say quickly what consolation canst thou offer in return i would bid you signora not despair and is this all thou canst say zoflia are you of a firm and persevering spirit signora this heart knows not to shrink she answered forcibly striking her bosom while her eyes flashed fire and in its purpose would persevere even to destruction are such the attributes of your character signora then what earthly wishes are not to be achieved by the united force of firmness and perseverance i see not how firmness and perseverance can avail me here however valuable in themselves may be those qualities not so beautiful victoria your words are ambiguous zoflia deign to be explicit said victoria hastily will you consider me so when i assert that if you determine not to up to what you have just said no accidental combinations can prevent you from attaining your utmost wishes ha say you so enchanting moor exclaimed victoria half frantic with joy at the meaning contained in his words and breathless with contending emotions of hope and doubt seizing his hand she pressed it to her bosom signora be calm be composed cried zofloya and honour not thus unworthy the lowest of your slaves speak on then zofloya your words are magic they soothe my soul and i feel hope and if i speak on you will not bid me cease you will not shrink signora victoria's only answer was an expressive smile and gesture so flya then resumed before signora by the unhappy defeat of my countrymen in granada by ferdinand of aragon i became the property of the spaniard who dying recommended me to signor henriquez i had from early youth been addicted to the study of arts as well as arms botany chemistry and astrology were my favorite pursuits and this turn of mine was further encouraged and improved by an ancient moor of granada who took pleasure in cultivating my taste and eventually increased considerably my information on various points and to a surprising extent while in the kingdom of aragon resident with the spaniard my late master i continued to have full leisure for the pursuit of my favorite branches of study for he treated me as a friend and an equal rather than a miserable captive and domestic o oh, zoflia zoflia impatiently cried victoria this is irrelevant suffer me to proceed however signora gravely observed the moor with an air that repressed the violence and commanded the attention of his auditor in consequence of the liberty i enjoyed i devoted myself as i have said to my favorite pursuits i obtained a perfect knowledge of simples and earths and how drugs are compounded from them no one could go beyond the infallibility of my calculations as to their effect to chemistry then i became particularly attached without however resigning my astrological pursuits 
close application favored too as perseverance usually is by the deductions of accidental observation taught me in time amidst a vast variety of chemical science to compound poisons with such infinite art that from the most speedy and subtle i could vary their degrees to the slowest and most imperceptible i tried them experimentally as it were first upon animals and then upon those who had offended me victoria started but the more appearing not to notice it proceeded upon these i tried alternately my speedy and lingering poisons i have seen the little greyhound one moment frisking at my feet and the next without a struggle sink motionless beside them i have seen the man i hated who had forgotten he had ever offended me smiling in my face and lingering under the imperceptible but certain influence of the poison that had been administered to him and which circulated in his blood gently leading him to the gates of death for the female who had dared to prefer mother to me i have first wrecked my vengeance on her lover and then on herself by the power of the drugs i have given them their love for each other has been alternately changed to hate and they have only recovered from the delirium to be separately destroyed by the effect in no instance have i ever failed in my calculations of the event that which i willed came to pass and came to pass in the manner that i willed it many other surprising secrets of art and nature became revealed to me but to expatiate upon then now would be as you have said irrelevant to the subject therefore to the point i now demand of you senora whether you would choose the slow portion or the swift victoria was for a moment staggered at this unexpected question which again the more seeming not to observe took from his pocket a small gold box which opening victoria perceived to contain several divisions from one of these he drew a little folded paper and thus proceeded this paper contains one of the most subtle and delicate poisons that ever by the hand of art could be composed it deals unerring death but deals it slowly it may be administered in wine in food it may even be completely introduced into the system by the puncture of the smallest pin it is this which i should recommend to you senora for a beginning take it and use it as opportunity shall present should opportunities but unfrequently occur you will yourself know how to make them violet stretched forth her hand and took the paper for a moment she was silent and then said this then is for brenza the moor smiled expressively and waved his hand as if to say that surely requires no answer then assuming a more serious air he coolly observed when barriers oppose the attainment of a favorite object the barriers must either be laid low or the object remain unattained to remedy an evil it is necessary to strike at the root nothing is to be gained by lopping the branches which arise therefrom thus should you resolve to overstep common boundaries and that which is termed female delicacy by openly declaring your passion to henriquez and he even setting delance to consequence should return it how do you imagine 
that while the wife of another you could enjoy unrestrained delight with the choice of your soul do you want resolution then fair signora to effect by means so trifling your highest wishes and did i err he added ironically in the different estimate i had formed of your character it is not that i want resolution returned victoria somewhat piqued i desire oh how ardently desire the death the annihilation of bresna but by these means to take his life it is not that i hesitate however and ashamed confused at what she deemed her cowardice she stopped it is not that you hesitate in an accent half serious half disdainful returned the moor and why should you hesitate he had no hesitation in sacrificing to himself your young and beautiful person for his gratification and why should you hesitate now at sacrificing him for yours you hate him yet you receive with dissembled pleasure these endearments which he lavishes upon you in depriving him of life you would do him far less wrong surely the conscience of victoria is not subjugated to to a confessor from whence then arises this unexpected demure is not self predominant throughout animal nature and what is the boasted supremacy of man if eternally he must yield his happiness to the paltry suggestions of scholastic terms or the pompous definitions of right and wrong his reasoning mind then is given him only for his torment and to wage war against his happiness yet what cause can be adduced why another must be permitted to stand between him and his fair prospects overshadowing them with hopeless gloom what argument can be adduced against his removal for him of whom we are speaking he has enjoyed already many years of existent pleasure he must now yield his place to another for he has not a right to monopolize to his share the pleasures of others besides were he to live a thousand years longer each day must be but a tasteless repetition of the past for in length of time even the zest of pleasure wears off and when we come to reflect after this long disquisition into which we have been drawn what is the momentous consideration whether the breath of a man be hastened a few moments sooner from his body than sickness accident or a thousand chances might have propelled it and in the common course of things have befriended you yet if none of these happen to arise a mind of enterprise endowed with the strength and power of right reason steps with unshrinking foot a little from the beaten track zoflia paused the cool deliberateness of his manner in expressing his sentiments induced victoria to believe that they were the result of conviction deduced from accurate reflection and the having given to the subject the rational consideration of a towering and superior mind rather than the cruel or forced constructions of the moment under this impression she could not avoid saying zoflia you possess strong powers of reflection and you are eloquent charming signora in a softened voice answered the moor i am not naturally eloquent but the wish of promoting your happiness renders me so 
pride filled the heart of victoria and she smiled ah pursued the moor that beauteous form was never made to pine by hopeless level no it was not made to sink to the earth a victim to ungratified sensations to yield to fall a sacrifice to imperious circumstances ah victoria beautiful victoria zophia must fly you in despair should you disdain his proffered services o oh, flattery like heaven do upon earth gratefully dost thou descend upon the ear of woman indescribable pleasure dilated the bosom of victoria as she listened to the honeyed accents of the delicate moor she put forth her hand towards him and when he softly seized and pressed it to his lips the haughty venetian was not offended tell me then zofloya she said with slight hesitation how must i use this bland and dangerous enemy at night in wine senora in morning beverage when and how you can ere long its effects will become discernible the conti at a certain hour of the day drinks lemonade observed victoria which i was once in the habit of administering to him he used to say it tasted sweeter from my hand renew your tender offices said zofia with a meaning smile and increase your opportunities the powder i have given you is of the minute particles the smallest atom is sufficient at a time using it at the rate of twice a day it will not be exhausted for ten days at the end of that period the perceptible effect that shall have been produced upon bresna will direct us to proceed now senora allow me to conduct you hence so saying zofia gently taking victoria by the arm led her with a kind of respectful freedom from the spot end of chapter twenty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty one of zoflia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c zoflia by charlotte dacker chapter twenty one with unshrinking soul and i abashed by the consciousness of guilt victoria joined at supper the innocent family circle the high blush of animation flushed her dark cheek with more than usual fire her eyes sparkled but it was with a fiend-like exultation and her nerves seemed new strung for the execution of her dreadful purpose Berenza rejoiced at her appearance and little surmising the cause approached in the fullness of his heart to embrace her she returned it impatiently and pushing him from her surveyed him with a kind of half smile from head to foot the unconscious Berenza mistook it for the embrace of eager love repent and past coldness and the accompanying action for supportive gaiety only but it was not so victoria hastily embraced him from the cruel reflection that he would not long have the power of soliciting these marks of an affection that she felt not nor had the hated task of granting them in pushing him from her but she yielded to an overpowering impulse of the hatred which possessed her bosom while gazing on him with a smile 
she consoled herself with the thought how soon he would cease to be at supper she could not forbear sometimes casting her ardent eyes upon henrique anticipating future delight while his were fixed as usual upon the blooming fairy lilia but her victoria now regarded only with contempt from the suggestion that she was an atom too easily bed to cause a moment's painful thought yet she failed not to pay attention to all and the vivacity of her manner the brilliance of her wit attracted as it was wont to do the pleased admiration of all towards her come my life cried the enraptured berniza raising the glass to his lips here's to thy happiness and the success of thy every wish drink all of you the same he added looking round the table every one obeyed and drank to the happiness of her who in that moment meditated their destruction and now she cried playfully it is my turn and taking two goblets off the table she flew to a recess at the end of the saloon where wines and ices set out upon a small marble table l them to the brim with vino crete and infusing into the glass that had been hers is small quantity of the poison which instantly incorporated itself with the wine and disappeared she returned to the supper table with well dissembled innocent supportiveness and exclaimed fill your glasses all round all obeyed again and held their glasses in their hands here bernza is my glass she cried drink from it as i will drink from yours to the speedy fulfilment of our wishes the fatal toast was drunk and to the speedy fulfilment of our wishes echoed round the table while the devoted rerun whose only wish was the gratification of victoria drank eagerly to promote it the first draught of death and looking tenderly upon her exclaimed to the speedy fulfilment of thy wishes thus emphatically calling on his own destruction victoria smiling fixed her eyes upon him in a few moments she imagined he turned pale he passed his hand hastily across his eyes as if sensible of a slight sudden pain in his head she became apprehensive she had given him more than was prudent for a first dose and that she would be betrayed presently however her fear subsided the colour returned to the cheeks of bernenza and the pain passed away uninterrupted gaiety then reigned to the end of supper until the lateness of the hour warned them separate from this eventful period victoria omitted no opportunity of administering insidious death to the unsuspicious berniza sometimes with the point of a small fruit knife which she retained about her for the purpose she introduced the baleful poison within the fruit while offering it to him on the point of her knife thus remorselessly rendering him to himself the dealer of his own death after once or twice the poison no longer took an immediately perceptible effect upon him the stomach becoming habituated no longer invents resistless loathing as it received the gradual destruction which blending its baleful influence with its other juices was conveyed into the system at the expiration of eight or ten days a change scarcely marked by others but fully perceived by victoria became apparent in the hapless berniza the blood of his cheeks which on first taking the poison vanished back for a few moments seemed as by repeated checks 
to have become more languid in its circulation and tinge them no longer as formerly with the vermilion hue of health a kind of tremendousness began to possess his nerves and a dry but faint cough gave frequent symptoms that the mischief had begun to work satisfied with these appearances on the evening of the tenth day for the eagerness of victoria now that she had commenced her dreadful plan had not suffered an atom of the poison to remain beyond she sought as previously agreed zofloya in the appointed spot when she arrived she perceived him not already her dark mind became suspicious of the delay zofloya zofloya she cried in an under voice where art thou here replied a voice like the sweet murmuring sound of an aeolian harp swept by the breath of the zephyr and turning she beheld at her side the towering figure of the moor she had not seen neither had she heard his approach and ashamed of the doubts she had felt and the impatience she had evinced she could not as his commanding eyes looked down upon her for the moment speak well beautiful victoria he said behold me here and suffer me now to ask does hope begin to cheer your long benighted bosom oh answered victoria i entertain hope the fond hope zofloya that i shall have good cause to mark the day when irresistibly impelled by the kind of sympathy of thy manner i confided to thee the cause of my sorrows and i too signora shall have proud cause to mark that day for it gave to the unworthy slave zofloya the most beautiful and enterprising of her sex it gave thee my friendship indeed zofloya said victoria slightly surprised it gave thee my gratitude not myself for i am irrevocably as thou knowest devoted to another be not offended beautiful victoria nor let us waste the precious moments in defining terms for the signor enriquez to whom i am obedient for your sweet sake alone requires my presence were it not for you zofloya would no longer appear in a character unfitting his state the character of a menial and what would you then generous zofloya for sure you were the attendant of henriquez ere i became known to you were you otherwise than you are fair victoria i should not now be here is it even so then i am indeed indebted to you most excellent moor for the sacrifices which you make to my service and never never can i sufficiently repay you you will you do repay me kind signora but time wastes let me now give what you require the second powder for he concluded his meaning with a smile then taking the box from his pocket he drew forth a second powder but from a different division and presenting it to victoria he said this powder is a degree more powerful than the last you will administer it the same and the effects will be proportionately increased this likewise will last you ten days and in that time you will observe in berniza the flame of life become fainter and fainter to all around his illness will wear the appearance of languor and gentle decay no one will suspect death to be at hand by you some cold caught and unnoticed at the time must be fondly alluded to 
and suggested as the cause by tenderness and unlimited attention by soothing and consolation you must shut his eyes on the danger of his situation and administer with your poison the fallious hope that his constitution will triumph over the cureless malady so that no advice and if possible not any medicines may be resorted to lest they should counteract or retard the workings of his delicate enemy you will thus behold him perishing away like the rose which carries the canker worm hidden in its heart or the tree that blasted by the lightning can never more recover its verdure the moor paused but victoria appearing violently agitated as if overcome by some sudden thought or recollection remained silent her uneasiness was not unobserved by zophia but he only gazed upon her without inquiring the cause leaving it to herself to reveal the workings of her mind at length fixing her eyes upon his countenance she said in a hurried voice Sophia, venice will never do for the seat of action it will be folly it will be madness to make the attempt such an undertaking as ours if crowned by success will prove ultimate destruction know you not know you not zophia that nothing can remain concealed from il consigo de dici but you commit no crime against the state signora you are no heretic true but the pretend accusation for these crimes are frequently the vehicles of punishment for other offences hatred suspicion or malice conveys an anonymous line into the lion's mouth the familiars of the holy inquisition are everywhere and though summoned before its awful tribunal upon false grounds the torture soon wrests from you a confession of these offences of those offences of which you have been really guilty no sophia the attainment of my object avails me nothing if destruction follows the momentary triumph well signora though i think that your fears magnify the danger yet the alternative which occurs is easy persuade the comte to quit venice but whither to go she said with an embarrassed air all italy is equally dangerous zophia made an impatient gesture as if to reprove the hesitation of victoria after a moment she resumed i have heard berniza speak of torre alto it is the name of a castle appertaining to him which is situated among the apennines a retirement there would at least suit your purpose the prying steps of curiosity will not follow you and discovery cannot reach you but should berniza object as i have hitherto done to a temporary removal thither then can you adduce a thousand reasons a desire for solitude a wish to visit a eighty one thirty you have never yet seen or lastly a suggestion that change of air and situation might speedily restore his health it shall be so zophia pity the distraction of a wretch whose mind is rendered imbecile by misery and who of herself is incapable of an effort towards her own happiness aided and advised by thee i may command success the moor smiled your fate your fortune fair signora will be of your own making i am but the humble tool the slave of your wishes 
your cooperation with me can alone render me powerful but fly me disdain my assistance and despise my friendship i sink abashed into myself and am powerless farewell signora i have already stayed too long for the present you need me no more abruptly then zofia turned away and quitted the presence of victoria who took her steps musingly towards the house at supper soon as with wine and conversation the spirits of berniza became joyous and elevated she artfully seized an opportunity of introducing the subject nearest her heart she spoke of terra alto and expressed a desire to visit its sublime solitudes professing herself to be still further influenced from the flattering presumption looking tenderly at berniza as she made the assertion that change of atmosphere and a more elevated situation might be a means of bracing his nerves and restoring him to his pristine health whatever the tender and unsuspicious berniza believed it was enough for him that victoria expressed the wish for him unhesitatingly to comply with it while the welcome but fallacious hope pressed upon his heart that devoted to love and him and desirous to prove to him that she was so she abandoned without regret the vain pleasures and amusements of the voluptuous city for a solitude no longer unpleasing to her charmed at this return to reason and rationality he fondly pursued himself that the evening of his days would close like the brilliant beauty of a western sky declining into the shadows of night fearful even that her purpose might change he expatiated on the beauty the situation of his castella and desirous to offer every possible allurement to her perseverance he entreated that henrique his fair mistress and her ancient protectress would be of the intended party to this henrique who fondly loved his brother readily acquiesced and ventured to promise for lilla and the signora as with a smile he looked towards them to depreciate to deprecate the possibility of a refusal victoria perceiving in the hapless berniza such unhoped-for eagerness in coincidence with her plan artfully forbore to press the subject further but her alarm being awakened lest the relation of lilla should object to the journey and thereby an idea that was not endurable detain henrique in venice she exerted the fascination of her kindness towards her and observed with seeming pleasure as if the point of her acquiescence had settled what infinite benefit would in all probability result to her own health in consequence of the salubrious change the poor old signora did not exactly think so but it was enough that victoria condescended to say it and to direct towards her unusual attention for her not to hesitate besides as self-love is no less inherent in age than youth she felt no little gratification in being deemed of sufficient consequence for solicitation all preliminaries being speedily arranged it was agreed ere they rose from table that the following day should only intervene for the conclusion of some necessary preparations and that on the subsequent morning they would take their departure from the gay city of venice 
for the castella del toro alto among the apennines end of chapter 21 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc